so what is cloud computing cloud computing first understand the word cloud at least as of today is just a metaphor for the internet if you are using internet you are using cloud if you are using any application any website on internet which provides some kind of functionality you are actually already using some cloud today see every organization builds web applications and these web applications have to be deployed somewhere in the infrastructure of my, uh, in the infrastructure of that organization so that these applications are accessible world over so in the past the organizations used to build data centers where they would put lot of hardware the hardware which includes memory processor disks network facilities and lot of other stuff they would create racks of hardware like Ar almaras they create racks of hardware wherein all these things are going to be assembled so majorly the hardware would be compute hardware which is nothing but your processor and memory networking hardware all your network cards the cables connecting the computers with each other and storage is all your desks huge volume of disk you may want to store at the organization level so all these things earlier were provided in the form of data centers which were built by the organization themselves and definitely they are going to have lot of maintenance of these data centers the applications are hosted in the same organization where they are probably developed and deployed and then the consumers would be across the globe from different parts of the world then we have got to understand now with this what is cloud computing it's all about moving this infrastructure from on premise into a data center which is hosted somewhere else in a different location but accessible over the internet so cloud computing is the delivery of computing services over the internet delivery of computing services what are these computing services compute networking storage everything over the internet enabling fast innovation flexible resources and economics at, at uh, of scale so how do we achieve economics how do we get flexible resources what is the innovation benefit all that we are going to see one by one by one you can see here as per google this is the screenshot i have taken from google the practice of using network or remote servers hosted on internet to store manage and process data rather than local server or personal computer that's what they call it as cloud computing so basically we are moving the computing power from our local computer to another computer in a data center which is remotely located and that data center the computing power is being accessed over internet so in simplest terms cloud computing means storing and accessing data and programs over the internet instead of the local computer hard drive precisely that is what is cloud computing compute who is going to provide compute machines which can be windows machines which can be linux machines all these machines are going to provide us with the compute power and this compute power is remotely hosted why the applications which are going to execute see every application in this world needs two things to run or rather i would put it another way every application we execute on computer has two aspects one the instructions to 
the data it is the data which flows through the instructions and eventually it becomes information raw data might be processed and some information can be extracted from that data something meaningful can be extracted from that data so what i'm saying here is to execute the programs we need to execute the instructions and to execute the instructions we need the processor so that is one aspect and the data which is flowing through these instructions somewhere needs to be persisted saved before processing and after processing everything has to be saved and that is saved on the storage certain applications are supposed to run on just one machine and certain applications can run on a network of computers basically distributed applications we call them as they just don't have one process they have multiple processes running and all these processors will be part of multiple machines on the network so for that networking will be required computers have to be connected to each other you might use a firewall sorry you might use a hardware connection through cables or you would probably use nowadays wifi connection also but computers have to be connected with each other so compute for execution of the instructions storing of data in the ram storage for persisting the data for long term and networking for the applications to be distributed all these things will have to be moved on to internet now what are these things which are provided by the service provider who is going to give this cloud microsoft microsoft azure amazon amazon aws and google provided gcp like that there are many service providers these three have become really very popular so let it be azure let it be aws let it be gcp they have already set up the infrastructure in different parts of the world they have already created data centers in different parts of the world so what is that they provide through these data centers the first and most important thing they give us compute power i told you every application needs the compute power which can be virtual machines in the form of windows operating system or linux operating system they give us storage where we can store different types of data let it be structured data unstructured data partially structured data all that is in the form of storage not only that they also give us certain ready made applications so that we are saved from dip, de, from explicitly building them deploying them and managing them all that is taken care of by the service provider themselves so it can be no sql databases it can be sql databases it can be ready made web servers lot of these things are provided ready made networking they take care of they let us create virtual networks so that we can have our own network created in which the applications can be deployed maybe in distributed fashion and then made accessible to people across the globe and most important of all these service providers also have to take care of analytics how are applications performing from where is the load when is the load more how can we improve the performance of the application if there is any error or at least if there is a forecast of error that should be automatically detected these things we can achieve through analytics
So let us understand before we proceed further, what are the different deployment models in cloud computing. Now that you understand what is cloud computing, what are the different deployment models? When I say deployment models, we basically mean how are we going to make use of the cloud? The first and most important option which is available to everybody is private cloud. That means they create the entire setup within their organization. Within the organization data center, on top of the physical hardware, some kind of virtualization will be implemented. And on top of that virtualization of hardware, various cloud services will be provided. And these would be used only by the users within that particular organization for deploying their applications and it cannot be used by people outside. So yes, it is the organization's responsibility to buy the entire hardware required, assemble all that hardware, maintain the incomplete hardware, replace the hardware as and when probably it is needed. Every hardware has some end of life. If you take a disk, we may not run disk for 100 years. A disk has to be replaced maybe in 3 years and in certain cases 5 years and then worst case 7 years. A disk cannot have a life beyond it. How much ever maintenance you do? So you will have to replace the disk with a new disk, copy the entire data from the old disk into new disk and this you have to do at a very high volume. As an organization, you will have to do it. But the advantage is everything is local. Everything is in your control if you are going for something like a private cloud. Then the other type of cloud which we are actually more talking about is public cloud. I would say private cloud and public cloud. The basic difference is if you have a garden in your home, maybe in front of your house, within your house only, within your house boundary, you might construct a garden. And that garden obviously is pretty private to you. Or public cloud is like a public garden which is shared by many people in the society or maybe in the city. And everybody can use the resources which are available in the public garden. So public cloud is precisely like that. These are data centers built by different service providers where anyone can actually create their account and start hosting these services. So there are service providers, AWS, GCP, Azure are the most popular ones. In these data centers, which are provided by the respective service provider, we are going to create our resources. We will create virtual networks. We will create virtual machines. Everything is going to be virtual. Rather, everything here will be used as a service. Remember, there are only two things which you can buy and sell across the globe in this universe. Everything comes under these two categories. If you are able to buy something or if you are able to sell something, definitely it is either a product or a service. You go to a shop and buy a physical product and bring it to your home. That's a product. Maybe a laptop, maybe a washing machine, maybe a TV. Maybe a car. These are all product. You will either buy or you will either sell. You become the complete owner of the product. And once you buy, it is your responsibility to maintain it. Just because you own it, you misuse it and blame it on the manufacturer. No, that's not possible. The other thing is a service. 
most of the time it is intangible you buy a service you hire something as a service so in the past it was always intangible but nowadays even the hardware we are using it like a service rather i have a house which i have built for myself is a product and if i go to a particular city use a hotel is a service services are always or most of the time temporary i go to the city i take for one day or maybe for two days the hotel room and i only pay for those one or two days i don't have to pay for the entire maintenance of the hotel so in cloud a similar model of services is used we are going to use network virtual machines and everything as a service it can be called as infrastructure as a service it can be called as platform as a service or it can be a software as a service but everything comes under service category important thing to note is the service provider is going to share that infrastructure with multiple organizations actually definitely they do take care of security my resources will be isolated from your resources though they are on the same hardware the isolation is pretty well maintained and of course to access them you need to authenticate yourself over internet we have to connect to those resources configure those resources after provisioning them and to do all these things we need to have some identity and some kind of permission not everybody would be able to manage everybody's else resources isolation is pretty well maintained so what we are talking about now in these sessions is all about public cloud but a lot of organizations have a concern if i put something on public cloud it is being shared by many so what about my privacy maybe the house owner wants to spend some kind of time with his or her spouse in the private garden he will not be able to go to the public garden and spend the time privately they want privacy so for that purpose they are going to make a private garden at home but there are lot of things which we can easily make use of from the public garden the shared equipments which are installed there for the morning exercise or a walking track which is there i would don't i would not mind using it for from the public garden so nowadays the organizations who, who have already invested huge amount in building their private data centers would want to implement this hybrid cloud model in the implementation of this hybrid cloud model they would like to have certain things hosted in their on premise data center maybe the database they will keep it in the on premise data center and certain things they would put it in the cloud public cloud something like the application can be hosted on a server which is in public cloud so people across the globe would be able to access the public cloud the web application hosted on the web server and this public cloud via vpn connection virtual private network connection will have access to the data which is stored in the private cloud so basically we are connecting the private cloud and public cloud together certain things we put in private cloud certain things we put in public cloud and this kind of setup is what we call it as hybrid cloud 
So if you are an organization which has got legacy for quite some time, you have been there, you are hosting multiple services in your own on-premise data centers and you want to gradually move into public. You cannot shut down your data center on day one and say now onwards everything is in public cloud. That's not possible. You want to have a gradual transition from the on-premise data center to the cloud data center, the public cloud data centers. You want to keep certain things private, certain things on the public cloud. Based on your privacy rules of the organization, you want to split. So in these kind of cases, yes, you would still have to go for a hybrid cloud. And this is one of the most powerful approach which Microsoft Azure supports. Using Microsoft Stack, you can bring a private cloud to life and Microsoft Azure is already there as public cloud. So in your on-premise, you have used Microsoft Stack, public cloud. They become very similar, connecting to them, connecting them with each other becomes much easy. So these are the three deployment models. What are they? Public cloud private cloud and a combination of public and private we call it as hybrid cloud in exam you can expect question given a scenario which type of cloud is most apt most suitable so public cloud does not have capital expenditures to scale up what is this capital expenditure i'll talk more about it very soon we have something called as capex and uh, opex applications can quickly provision and deprovision in public cloud public cloud is most of it pay as you go model you have to only enable the services you have to provision the services and from the time you have provisioned it your billing starts and only for the time you have used that service and then when you deprovision it your billing stops so basically organizations only pay for what they use pay as you go model it is called as then we have got private cloud here you have to purchase the entire hardware and set up in your own data center that means you need not only the hardware, but you need space for the data center also. You need to maintain the backup. UPS power backup you will have to take care of. You have to ensure entire maintenance of the hardware is the responsibility of organization. But you get advantage of privacy. You get complete control on that hardware and then the combination as I told you provides the most flexible of both public private certain things you keep in the organization private network certain things you keep it on the public network and make a combination of these two so organizations determine where to run their applications organization control security compliance and legal requirements so what are the cloud benefits i was talking about capex and opex capital expenditure and operational expenditure see capital expenditure is something which i will pay and buy as a product most of the time I buy a car to travel for my office purpose. I do a sales and to do the sales I need to travel to different parts. I buy a car. Car is a capital expenditure. But to make the car run, I need fuel. I need the gas. And that I put it on need basis that is operational expenditure 
in my organization i buy an ac that is a capital expenditure to run that ac i need electricity that is operational expenditure so lot of these expenses every organization has are under capital expenditure or under operational expenditure capital expenditure are always upfront expenditure you have to pay a big about upfront and then own it and then the execution of that would require some continuous expenditure that's what we are calling it as operational expenditure from the taxation point of view almost every country does not consider capital expenditure as 100% expenditure up front so if i buy a car of let's say 100% value first year i may take that as a expense only for 20% i can write car 20% as my expense not entire 100% then the car value remains 80% next year in the financial year when i am filing my returns filing my income tax i would probably claim 20% on top of that 80% as expenditure so with time we will have to divide the expense on the capital expenditure a buy a laptop i cannot write entire amount of laptop as cost to the organization and take that as an expense no because it's a product we are going to keep it for longer period we might get again 30% 40% expenses in the first year and then thereafter on the remaining amount for every subsequent year so from the taxation point also capital expenditure is not very good operational expenditure something like electricity fuel in your car the services most of the time are written as 100% expenditure i build a table furniture the material used for the furniture would not be counted as 100% expenditure but these charges paid to the person who is making the furniture the carpenter the service that is going to be counted as the operational expenditure so when we have our own data center we are actually investing on capital expenditure and to make that data center run we are investing on the operational expenditure organizations want to move away from the capital expenditure and implement an operational expenditure rather if you are a startup you would definitely prefer to have capital uh, lesser of capital expenditure and more of operational expenditure because you do not know what is your existence how long you are going to exist so in these kind of scenarios every startup would prefer having operational expenditure and write that as expenses from his earning to reduce the tax to the organ to the organization also tax to be paid to the government by the organization as well so public cloud is operational expenditure private cloud is capital expenditure keep this point in mind public cloud comes under operational expenditure and private cloud comes under capital expenditure so sometimes you might have both but as far as possible every organization today is trying to reduce the capital expenditure and move into operational expenditure also in cloud what we have is consumption based model whatever we use 
we pay for it. We don't use something, we don't pay for it. I create a virtual machine. Once I create a virtual machine, I have used some hardware from the data center of the service provider. The moment the virtual machine is provisioned, that hardware is reserved for me. So the billing starts. The billing is on the basis of how much computing power I have reserved, how much RAM I have used, how much processor I have used. Based on these, the billing is going to start. And the billing is going to continue as long as I keep using that virtual machine. At one point of time, I realize, no, I don't need this virtual machine. So I would stop that virtual machine and deprovision it. The moment I deprovision it, for that, the hardware which was reserved is returned back to Microsoft so that they can use it probably for another customer. And the billing is going to permanently stop on it. So in cloud, it is very common that you provision the resources, use it and deprovision it when you don't need it anymore. That's what precisely is consumption based model. You pay as you go. You only pay for the resources which you are using. You don't have to pay upfront anything. So your billing is precisely on the basis of actual usage. So now let's get into describing certain important terms which a cloud is going to provide us. Specifically, the public cloud is going to provide us. We can call these also as characteristics of cloud service provider. High availability. If your application is hosted in cloud, you can implement high availability. What does it mean? See, if I deploy my application on just one virtual machine and if that particular virtual machine crashes, what will happen? My application becomes unavailable to its consumers. Let's say I have a website where I am selling some product. And you are already on my website and suddenly you see a blank screen. You see the site is not available. Will it give a good experience? Definitely not. You would immediately lose trust on my website and you would just go away from there. So we want to ensure high availability of our website. So for that purpose, we would probably deploy the same application on multiple machines and put something like a load balancer in between to distribute the load between them. Not only that, we would want to even deploy our application in multiple data centers. So even by chance if one data center goes down, our application should still become available from another data center. That means we need multiple data centers, cloud service providers have multiple data centers implemented across the globe in different regions in different geographies at certain distances the cloud service providers have given the data centers in which we can deploy our application and store our data just imagine right all my data data is stored in one data center and Suddenly that data center itself collapsed. Maybe that became a war zone and the other country has put a nuclear bomb and that entire region is collapsed, including my data center. What will happen to the data? Everything is lost. So to ensure high availability of data, we will replicate the data across multiple regions in different data centers. So every cloud service provider ensures that they make the applications highly available and also the data is replicated 
so that in the event of failure at one place it becomes available at from the other place high availability then you have got reliability even if the data is stored in one data center there are multiple copies of the data saved we write into the data center one time but the same data will get saved three times in the data centers of microsoft in three different disks the data is saved so in the event of failure one disk will be gone but we still have data available and made automatically available from the other other disks so we can rely on these data centers much more than would we would probably implement it in our own on premise data centers where we may not replicate it three times so we get high reliability on the data centers implemented by the cloud service providers then we have got scalability see every application has got some consistent load most of the time but there can be certain times where suddenly there is a surge in the traffic increase in the traffic because probably i am again a e-commerce website and i come up with a sale for two days three days we come up with a sale so at this point of time we will see there is a sudden surge in the traffic sudden increase in the traffic our existing infrastructure probably may not be able to sustain it would crash so what we should be able to do is increase the amount of computing power or we should be able to provide more servers to handle that extra load so we need to achieve scalability we, we want our application to be able to scale to the requirement of the users and not only that we want something like a elastic behavior it should be able to scale out it should be able to scale in increase the capacity and should be able to decrease the capacity in either direction we want it to be like an elastic we should be able to stretch it and when we leave it should go back to normal so scalability is one very important characteristics of every cloud data center predictability yes i should be able to predict lot of situations suddenly i see through monitoring tools that i have reached 80 90% of cpu usage or memory usage i should be able to get an alert saying that i am trying to probably reach the extreme and after some time my application would crash or there should be some automation where automatically it should be able to scale when it is reaching the threshold predictability we should be able to predict a situation we should be able to predict how much is going to be the cost of provisioning the resources if i create 10 virtual machines and if i run for so many hours in a particular month what is the total cost i am going to incur predictability we should be able to predict situations ahead of time so there are tools and services provided in the cloud for achieving that also security we say public cloud is not secured that's why we are not hosting our applications in public cloud very irresponsible statement that is keeping some cash at home is safe or keeping the cash in bank is safe what is safe quite obvious keeping the cash in bank is any time safer keeping the cash in bank is any time safer for the reason that they implement more security protocols than i can implement in my home similarly these service providers have taken lot of effort 
in ensuring that your data is secured and not easily accessible even to the hackers definitely it has implemented more security protocols than we would be able to implement in our own data centers there are multiple levels of security so that advantage you are going to get here so it's very responsible when i hear people saying cloud is not secured no definitely cloud is highly secured then we have got governance every organization has certain rules and restrictions for creation of various resources certain laws of the land have to be implemented for example if a resource like virtual machine is created for this organization it should be only in these regions not anywhere outside or if a virtual machine is created compulsory the backup for that virtual machine also must be enabled or if a database is used only so and so versions of the database can be used the older versions cannot be used if the resources are created they should be properly tagged so the implementation of these governance rules are also quite easy and supported by this cloud service provider manageability cloud service provider gives us different ways to manage our resources definitely the low level management is taken care by them but at a higher level we have the control so these are different cloud characteristics and benefits we can say we are going to look at cloud computing service models there are three service models infrastructure as a service platform as a service and software as a service i would once again remind you everything in this world is either a product or a service when i buy something or if i sell something it's always either a product or a service and the world is moving from product to a service so infrastructure when it was in my data center it was product capital investment when i'm using now from a service provider infrastructure a remote data center it has now become a service operational expenditure so what aspects come under infrastructure as a service what comes under platform as a service what comes as a software as a service see every organization which already has data centers of their own they have to definitely take care of the power in addition of course to the hardware the power the electricity the networking storage right backup all these things now are delegated to the cloud service providers so basically the compute power of your applications the machines which are needed for execution of your application specifically the hardware aspect of it is entirely dedicated delegated to the cloud service providers and that's what we call it as infrastructure as a service we don't have to purchase servers or disks or ram or processor anymore for our usage we can simply create our account in something like microsoft azure 
maybe you can start with a free account and start provisioning the hardware start creating the virtual machines and you only pay for what you use what resources you create and for the time you make use of them you only pay for them so your entire infrastructure which was required for setting up your application deployment is now delegated is now being moved into cloud service providers infrastructure and that's why we say they are offering infrastructure as a service good but what is most important infrastructure as a service offering would be used by most organizations for lift and shift of their applications i have applications already running in my organization maybe they are on a single pc or maybe they are distributed on a network and i want to have a similar kind of setup in cloud also i don't want to make any changes i don't want to make any tweaks into these particular applications probably they are pretty old and i don't even have developers who can execute them so what is my primary application and all its dependencies as it is i would like to deploy in a cloud application then i would use the service providers infrastructure as a service the best example in aws is the ec2 virtual machines ec2 me ec2 instances they call it elastic compute instances likewise azure virtual machines or gcp compute in <coughs> gcp compute engine these are all nothing but virtual machines which we can create in the different platforms mind you almost everything we are discussing since yesterday and of course today and everything is implemented in all the three aws azure gcp names are different like azure calls it as virtual machine aws calls it as ec2 instances gcp calls it as compute engine but ultimately all are nothing but the virtual machines which we have created on top of the physical hardware in the data center of microsoft or respective service providers so when do we use infrastructure as a service lift and shift of legacy applications applications which we don't want to change and we just want to move into cloud we would use the infrastructure where we are going to create windows virtual machines or linux virtual machines and deploy our applications onto them then comes the platform as a service see many types of applications we want to do things and we don't want to do it from scratch a simple example if i take i want to build a web based application let's say in dotnet so if i want to build a web based application in dotnet on my machine i would need dotnet studio visual studio dotnet i'll need i'll need dotnet framework i'll need obviously the web server software where i'm going to test and run the application and of course all this is going to sit on top of the operating system so for moving this application from my machine into some production server i have to again ensure that i choose the same operating system if i was using windows i would have to use the windows there also on top of windows i have to take care of the runtime software required for execution of my application i need to take care of something like the web server and then i have to deploy my application and not just the application but i have to also take care of the maintenance of these layers if there are any patches which are released i have to ensure those patches are applied onto the bottom layers maybe in run time or maybe in the web server software or maybe in the operating system if there are certain security patches released we will have to take care of all of them 
all these things now can be delegated microsoft provides in azure platform something called as azure app services so if i provision an azure app service i can simply create an app service instance and only take care of putting my software and at the time of deploying my software i just need to choose i want dotnet 6 i want on windows or linux platform and this is the configuration of the resource the virtual machines in background which are going to be created is my requirement and the entire platform is created for us by microsoft we are not going to directly work with the virtual machines anymore rather we will not even be able to do an rdp into those virtual machines remote desktop access we are not going to get into those virtual machines we just work with the in azure portal and do all the required configuration let it be size let it be backup configuration let it be scaling let it be load balancing let it be security everything is simply configurable configurable that's it an entire platform will be created for us in the background so i as a developer would always want to get this kind of gift from the service provider and that is offered as platform as a service i don't have to focus on the infrastructure my focus will be on implementation of the business i work on monolithic type of applications i would use something like an app service and i work on large extremely large scale enterprise applications i would use probably some a microservices based architecture <clears throat> applications like amazon netflix all these modern applications are mostly microservices based architecture and to deploy these microservices based architecture we need some orchestrator tools one of the most popular orchestration tool is kubernetes and if i have to take care of implementing kubernetes and administer is going to be a massive task in a cloud platform i would simply use the pass implementation of kubernetes like for example in azure we have got aks in aws we can, we have eks elastic kubernetes service similarly something is there in google and those are ready made platform on which we can deploy our application though we might develop locally we can deploy the applications on these platforms with ease so what i am basically saying is pass gives us ability to make the entire hardware transparent and provision the required hardware and they take care of the complete maintenance we simply as a developer would build our application and deploy on the platform the world is definitely moving from infrastructure as a service offering to plas pass platform as a service offering and the consumers are also very comfortable using pass services than the infrastructure so legacy applications would still continue to use the iaas offering of the cloud service provider modern applications we would prefer using pass drastically the effort of administrators in the organization is going to reduce when they start making use of pass so that's most popular favorite of the developer and you see pass is ultimately built on top of infrastructure but good thing is we don't have to take care of the infrastructure on top of the infrastructure one additional layer is added and that service will take care of the entire infrastructure for us and we only work, work with that particular service even database for that matter is now offered as a service people call it as das database as a service but that's ultimately nothing but one branch of platform as a service what people did is based on the type of service pass the further categorized it security as a service platform as a service caching service 
so they are all nothing but platform at the base then comes software as a service you should not be surprised to know that you are actually a SaaS consumer for many aspects when you are using Gmail you are a SaaS consumer Gmail is a SaaS offering software as a service offering Facebook is a software as a service offering yeah you will say I am not paying for it so how is that they are making money they are making money through the advertisements you are using those social media applications free of cost but they are selling ads through those media and they organizations are making money out of it so what comes under SaaS any ready-made software which I would like to make my consumer use most of the time on a subscription model for example on Gmail if I want to remove the ads I can subscribe to Gmail a monthly fee I pay them and I don't get any advertisements and my limits are also extended same is the case with Microsoft Office 365 or Dynamics 365 or you take Dropbox OneDrive YouTube when I subscribe to YouTube I may not get advertisements and I can watch the entire YouTube video without disturbance so all these things in the world are software as a service offering for which we either use it free but then through advertisement they make money, they make money or we subscribe to that and when we subscribe no advertisement and we pay a monthly bill I don't have to worry about whether it is hosted on AWS or GCP or Azure or wherever it is hosted I damn care I as a consumer have to only have a account with which I will log in and I'll start using that particular service I'm only worried about the data which I am creating my data my personal data and nothing else I don't know whether it is done in Java, done in .NET, done in Windows, done in Linux. Uh -huh. Nothing of this is important to me. I am just a consumer of a ready-made functionality. So the, these kind of things come under SaaS. Applications which are hosted in the cloud service provider infrastructure. And we are just the consumer of these services. SaaS offerings they call it licensed multi-tenant access to software and it functions remotely as a web based service when I say multi-tenant what does it mean there are two words which you are going to see very frequently in software industry multi-tenant software single tenant software if a software instance was deployed on one machine and was given to only one organization users then it is a single tenant application but when the software is deployed and the same software instance we use it for multiple organization users best example Gmail the G Suite services my organization uses it your organization uses it people across the globe use the same instance of Gmail or same instance of Microsoft 365 or Dynamics 365 so these are multi-tenant software but you purchase a software something like accounting package and you exclusively use it for your organization other organizations would not be able to use that instance then that is a single tenant and most of the softwares today are not being offered as desktop application they are offered as web based services which can be hosted remotely and can be accessed from anywhere so from end users point of view the application is located in the cloud 
and is almost accessible through the web browser or sometimes you can also have a mobile e equivalent of the same web browser based application amazon.com amazon.in where you do purchases is a SaaS offering we can have corporate accounts created there and people in my organization can make purchases on behalf of my organization people in other organization can purchase on behalf of the organization so that's a SaaS offering so internet is the medium through which we are going to access the software see most of the softwares which you to use today are all under SaaS so if I compare SaaS, PaaS and IAS the server storage network three things comes under infrastructure as a service offering who is going to make use of this the administrators can be network administrators the people who are responsible for setting up the infrastructure on need basis the IT team of the organization they are the ones who would decide how many virtual machines are needed what should be the size of each virtual machine those are the people who are responsible for setting up infrastructure as a service then the developers they use ready-made services in building their applications so that so that they don't have to look into the intricacies of the infrastructure they just use those services maybe database as a service <coughs> maybe the caching as a service search service I don't have to implement search logic in my application anymore the service providers are going to give us ready-made search service where all my data is going to be indexed and Google kind of functionality search kind Bing kind of functionality is so easy to implement in our application development so that all comes under pass platform as a service and then the end users are the one who would use the SaaS service model they get ready-made software they just need to have a subscription and that subscription is what they can happily use it packaged software so here there is OS and application stack we don't have to take care of it here there is OS and application stack we have to take care of it we don't have to take care of the server storage and network here server storage and network we have to take care of it so as we are moving up the scope of what we have to take care of is reducing that's what is actually called as shared responsibility model when you move to cloud from private on-premise cloud where you are supposed to take care of all these aspects of application hosting and management you have to take care of the storage that means you have to buy the disks you have to take care of the networking of different virtual machines or physical machines which you have created on top of this compute physical hardware you might implement virtualization and let the users create virtual machines with the respective operating system you take care of installation of runtime like dotnet runtime java runtime python runtime and along with the relevant web server which can be IIS web server tomcat web server apache web server nginx web server and all this will be based on the type of application which we have developed those are the needs of the application and then eventually comes the access to our application and the data which our application manages every aspect which has to be taken care of by the people in the organization doesn't have to be same when we move on to cloud in cloud if you are using infrastructure as a service offering compute storage and networking is delegated to the service provider we simply provision virtual machine of course we have to choose the operating system option take care of installing the runtime application and data access yes you have to take care of the virtual machine updates patching ups new versions installation of software required for 
making your application run all that you will have to take care of over here here virtual machine is gifted to us with the relevant operating system we choose the runtime what we want i want java runtime okay click of a button i want python runtime click of a button i want dot net dot net core we choose and directly we deploy our application and ensure we take care of the data and the access to it here the application is built in i as a consumer only would take care of the data and the access to the application the subscription is what i have to purchase and my documents my emails my application data is my responsibility everything else is provided to us by the service provider so we want to definitely move from infrastructure to platform to so software but not possible everything is offered as software as a service for something to become software as a service it has to go through platform as a service implementation for some developers it was pass for others across the globe consumers it became saas but to become pass many times ultimately there is a infrastructure provision and there is a team who are responsible for ensuring it is swiftly done for them it is saas infrastructure gives you the most flexibility that's the reason i told you we can do lift and shift of application we can easily take the application from our machine to the target machine because it is easy to implement infrastructure in iaas lift and shift is the focus in pass productivity of the developer is the primary focus i should be able to write less code and achieve more and saas pay as you go pricing model subscription based model and nothing more than that cloud has advantages no doubt about it but it does come with lot of disadvantages also when we adopt cloud decent internet connectivity is the most important thing which is needed because everything is in cloud so i have to invest on a very good internet connection but is that a concern in any part of the world today no even in small towns and villages connectivity to internet is pretty good today but if you go to a remote location and if you do not have mobile connectivity you will not be able to use the applications which are hosted on the cloud because everything is in cloud nothing is on your device nothing is on your laptop desktop or maybe on your mobile most of it is on the other side so that's something which you have to take care of if not properly managed it can blow the cost you might be surprised to see at the end of the month your credit card bill and you'll see that few thousands are gone why you created resources without proper knowledge and you probably forgot to delete them you don't need that much of compute power but you selected the default settings and the default settings is a high configuration machine which is more expensive when compared to a low configuration machine or low configuration service without managing properly you might end up paying a lot so you definitely need good knowledgeable resources when you want to manage cloud or your services in the cloud restricted or limited control of infrastructure yes because it is in the data center of microsoft data center of amazon data center of google we don't have control on that infrastructure you cannot say hello please don't do maintenance of these machines today i have i have something important the maintenance of these machines should be done tomorrow or day after you can't control saying that but cloud service providers have come up with certain offerings today 
where they can dedicate hardware for you or your organization private hosting in the data center of microsoft is possible now you buy hardware and keep it in the data center of the microsoft rather you pay for the hardware which is already there in the data center of microsoft and you own that hardware in the terms of you control when you want to maintain it and others will not be allowed to share that hardware of course it will be quite expensive but that feasibility has come today risk of vendor lock in choosing a cloud service provider is as good as choosing a spouse rest of your life you are locked in such important decision it is for an organization if i decide to use microsoft azure for my startup i know for rest of my life i am tied up with microsoft azure because i may have used the past services of it and those past services provide some kind of integration into our application through apis tomorrow if i want to substitute the pass service of microsoft with some other service it's not going to be that easy we get strongly coupled it's a marriage it's a marriage between you or your organization and the service provider such important is the decision about cloud service provider option yes trying to move away from that marriage a divorce is going to be very expensive lot of things you'll have to almost redo it and that can take time that can take lot of investment and you may probably lose customers also so organizations what they do is in their early stages they implement applications on all the platforms they start dating all the three at least two and over a period of time they will realize how is the cost how are the services what are the benefits of one over the other and then they finally make a decision of basically the courtship period has become longer now wherein they can decide whether they are good for us or not and then the permanent relationship happens but whenever it happens it is permanent though aws gcp and azure have taken care of all the protocols and concerns which the world has still there will always be a doubt what about my data security and privacy there always going to be a doubt how much ever i trust a bank there is always going to be a doubt of what will happen if the bank closes to put my documents put my important papers or jewelry or cash if i want to put it in the bank locker i would always have a concern i would always probably would want to keep it closer to me so that problem is ever going to be there data security and privacy concern and the worst problem comes in cloud computing is if you are in a area where the data center is not present you may have to host your data in a different region and that can end up putting your data outside your country now in case of data breaches laws of which country will be applied the law of the land where the data and the cloud computing platform is will get implemented or the law of the land where the people the consumers are there is going to get implemented these kind of complexity can also become a problem in adapting public cloud computing platforms in simple language if i explain to you in india aadhar card information is never going to be stored on 
Azure or AWS because these organizations don't belong to the uh, to the citizens of India. The roots are outside the India. So in the event of war, there is always a possibility that these organizations get inclined towards the country which they are from. So the government of India is never going to put private data of the citizens of the country, the military information, the applications pertaining to the military of the country is never going to be put up on the public cloud. They would always have a private cloud. But good thing is Azure AWS in certain countries are providing government specific data centers especially in US and UK. They have service, they are data centers which only government of that country will have access to and they are facilitating the same services which they are in public cloud in those data centers also. But yes, these are the list of concerns which any organization would have before they start accepting public cloud computing platforms. Definitely, it's not something very major, but something to be, concer be concerned about. Azure. So first and most important thing, the requirement would be, you will have to actually create an Azure account. Now, how are you going to create an Azure account? There are multiple ways you can create an Azure account. One, you can create an Azure free trial account and the free trial comes with 30 days, $200 subscription. And in this 30 days and $200, you can actually build almost every service. You can almost work with all aspects of Azure without any limitations or without any restriction. Though there are, but those are like achievable. That's not a big deal for learning purpose. So that you can create a free account. If you are a student, you can use your student ID and create a student free account. Microsoft also provides a Microsoft Learn Sandbox and it is in this particular sandbox you can actually run your PowerShell scripts and perform the actions and definitely I don't recommend sandbox for learning purpose you will not get the real feel of what exactly is Azure. Yeah, so probably the first thing we would like to do is see how we can actually create a free account and then maybe use PowerShell, maybe use Bash, switch to Azure Interactive Mode, navigate to portal, all these things we would like to do through our sandbox. But where can we find all these labs? Somewhere we should be able to have all these labs available. So what you can do is go to the browser. and search for AZ900 labs. Simply search for AZ900 labs and you will see the first one itself AZ900 Microsoft Azure Fundamentals and here you see you have different labs create a virtual machine, create a web app, display an Azure container instance and blah 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 so many labs are there which will be really handy for you people to learn. Now, if at all you are using credit card, you can go to azure.com and here use the option free account and click on start free. This start free is going to let you to use $50, sorry, $200 one month subscription. You have to continue here. You have to complete your login with a Microsoft account. And then 
it will also ask you your personal details most important it will ask you for the credit card details and it will also perform a small transaction maybe one dollar or a one rupee transaction will be performed which again is reversed it is only performed to verify that your credit card is valid and without any worry you can be assured that after one month or even before one month if you have consumed all the hundred dollars your account is automatically disabled and you are not going to get billed extra but yes every time you create a new account you definitely need a new phone number new email id and you need a new credit card the number cannot be reused the same card cannot be reused second time so i have already used all my credit cards for creating the free account and i strongly feel for something like az 900 we not we may not want to use credit card because this 200 dollars we can use it more constructively when we are probably using a role based training when you go for more advanced role based training tomorrow you may want to use it so what i suggest is there is microsoft azure pass.com microsoft azure pass.com that's the website so what i'll do is in in private mode i'll go to microsoft azure pass.com now click on start provide an email id but i'll prefer creating a new account for this particular training a new personal account i would like to create it says recover your account no i don't want to create a new account here sorry i clicked on the wrong link here it is create one and we have to give the details create an account let's say i create deccan soft august 2022 at outlook.com that's it deccan soft august 2022 at outlook.com this is going to create a new microsoft id i set a password for myself and in background it's creating a new account in outlook.com select an animal with wrong head these are always challenging to me this particular thing is done to avoid bots trying to register microsoft doesn't want bots to register onto the account so that is the reason wow select the animal with wrong head why why should i again do it that's not quite right that's what i did these are the most challenging things in life i'm just trying to create a new i have n number of other accounts but i'm just trying to create a new one great at last it succeeded oh back to square one something wrong please solve the puzzle we so we know you're not a robot so how many times should i solve it is it because i am using i'll do one thing maybe because i am using incognito in private window this problem is coming we can directly do it here itself
pick a turtle yes incognito was the pro problem it was not accepting in private or incognito window so i go to microsoft azure pass.com from there itself i created the account confirm very important confirm that you are not logged in with your organization id whatever account you have just now created confirm that and now you need a promo code now the advantage of this particular process is you do not need to have any kind of credit card verification so when i use this promo code you can directly activate your account now to get this promo code you'll have to get in touch with our backend team there is a small nominal fee of i believe 4 or 5 dollar 4 dollars and details you can find in the description or in the chat you have to contact shubham and he will be able to arrange the promo code for you people in case you want to do the labs using the microsoft azure pass so now i log in and it's going to take some time yes you will have to give your phone number it's mandatory give some organization name pan id is optional line 1 is mandatory select the state postal code agree to the agreement and that's it now many people do a mistake after this they are in hurry and they change the window or they close the window now please don't do that let the window pass on to the next screen automatically as long as this is happening you don't have to do anything and don't even try to give your feedback just stay it's okay many times i have seen people trying to give feedback and they mess up i closed it now let it go on in the background of after this is completed it will automatically redirect me to azure portal and in the meantime we can continue with our session so what are the different architectural components what is a region the paired region sovereign regions availability zones data centers resource group subscription management group oh so many things you have to learn over here so if you look at the presence of azure across the globe in different parts of the world you see wherever you have got this blue color dot that is where actually the azure is already there so all these blue color dots we already have the azure data centers those are called as regions so what they did is they divided the world into different geographies and within the geography there are multiple regions like india geography has three regions west india central india south india and they are now coming up with one more actually very soon this slide is little old which will be south central india which will be in hyderabad like that here you see there are new centers coming up mexico central and by the time i am teaching you possibility is there these centers have already come up these data centers have been already built and they are already running there are more than 60 plus regions across the globe now what is the benefit of keeping so many data centers across the globe why so many data centers see if my workload if my application 
is very far off on the internet from the time I submit a request to the time I get the response there is going to be lot of delay and that delay may not be acceptable to people on internet it is not a very good user experience so to avoid that delay or to avoid that latency to ra rather reduce the latency we can host our applications in a region which is closer to our consumers that is why so many regions across the globe are present one reason actually there are multiple reasons but they, that is one of the major reason every region is made up of one or more zones availability zones we call it so wherever you see this white color dot those are the places where we have got availability zones you see white dots so one region has got three availability zones we call it as availability zone one zone two zone three let that's how the names are given and over a period of time microsoft is going to upgrade entire infrastructure in all the regions and they will split into availability zones and that's going to happen over a period of time so yes as you can see the number here more than 60 plus regions already covered representing more than 140 countries from where the azure cloud can be accessed so what are these availability zones now if at all you deploy your application in just one region that means in one data center of that particular region if you deploy your application and if there is a downtime some kind of data center failure might have happened maybe the power supply to that data center got corrupted or I mean spoiled failed rather or let us say there is a flood situation in that particular region and the entire data center had to be shut down so it can be any reason or maybe that data center has some kind of hardware failure let's say the disk got corrupted where your application is getting stored so to avoid downtime what you can do is split your content in the different availability zones the beauty of this different availability zone is though they are in the same region so when I say East US is a region in East US only there will be three availability zones there will be three different locations let us assume three different buildings every building will have independent power supply independent cooling plants independent networking so that if one goes down for whatever reason the other zones should continue to run quite obvious these zones are connected to each other using a high speed fiber optic cable so though they are not exactly in the same place still the communication between these zones availability zones is very fast that means they are physically separated so that if something goes wrong in one place the other two can continue to serve the request so in azure when we create let's say something like a storage account and we choose the option of zone redundancy we create a storage account and we choose the option of zone redundancy in that kind of case our data will be replicated across multiple zones I told you one file will be saved in three different locations and when one goes down there will be automatically failover happening to the other zone you don't even have to do anything automatic failover happens and the content becomes available from the other zones so yes the regions where there is 
good amount of usage microsoft has on priority basis upgraded them to multiple availability zones but at the same time they are still working continuously to make other regions where still we do not have availability zones to have these kind of three zone infrastructure now regions to make sure that the availability is much more higher to ensure that the availability is much higher every region has got a corresponding paired region for example if east us is a region the paired region for east us will be west us if south india is a region central india is the paired region for it and most of the time the paired region is going to be in the same geography except in the case of brazil brazil is in different geography and south central us is in a different geography all the other data centers are in the same geography so if east us is paired with west us it is understood that west us is paired with east us now microsoft has ensured that between these two paired regions always there is minimum distance of 300 miles so that more high availability can be achieved your replication of content can be done from one region to the other region for example again when i talk about storage account i can choose something called as uh, zone redundancy and then better than that is geo redundancy now when i choose this geo redundancy my data will be saved three copies in primary region and three copies in the secondary region and by any chance if the entire region is gone because of some natural calamity or maybe some nuclear bomb in that region itself has destroyed that complete region imagine or a major major blackout happened for whatever reason if the whole region has collapsed my content will still become available from the secondary region and the extremely rarest of the rare chance that both the regions would collapse at the same time maybe the world is coming to an end at that point of time you can think of it like that so yes microsoft has different regions all in different geographies and every region has a corresponding paired region something very important to know if suppose a region has gone down even the worst case both the regions have gone down imagine there is no choice your workload will be down your customers will not see your website at that point of time the team microsoft is always going to work on bringing up one of these two regions on priority basis if they are working on east us at the same time they will not work on west us they will first try to bring up east us then they will try to bring up west us and this is done entirely to reduce the downtime to minimize the downtime because if they are working on these two side side by side probably the other two regions both are down because there are limited number of people at any point of time so strategy is always they'll try to bring up one region over the other there are regions in this regions there can be only one zone or there can be three availability zones all these data centers are public all the data centers which i showed to you are public and if you want to i told you last class the government of the country is now tying up with microsoft 
to create their own data centers which is completely isolated and non government bodies like general public will not have access to these data centers so to meet the security and compliance need of us federal agencies state and local government and their solution providers separate data centers are created in microsoft azure you can see here in the diagram as well these ones you see us government virginia us dod central these are data centers where general public would not have access to here also you have germany northeast sovereign germany central these are data centers where general public would not have access to only government bodies the federals will have access to like that there is also a data center in china which only people in china the organizations in china would have access to microsoft has built that with the collaboration with 2021 wyanet microsoft alone cannot build a data center in china because of the law of that particular land doesn't allow a foreign organization to completely manage the organization so in collaboration by with collaboration with 21 wyanet they have got a separate china data center data stays within china to ensure compliance of the chinese government so there is a beautiful globe which microsoft has provided if i can only show you that globe see you can go to infrastructure map dot microsoft dot com it takes a while for loading this particular globe so you can explore this particular globe so it's loading you'll have to wait and you can see these are the different parts of the world where we have got the data centers so if i take you to my country this is a data center south india and the details of south india are listed here year opened 2015 central india year opened 2015 pune stored rest of india then this is south central india announced region with availability zone it's in hyderabad not yet up it's going to come up that's why it is gray color and then you also see this pop centers these are pop centers basically cdns so content will get delivered to you in this particular region through this pop center so not necessary everywhere you have got data center there are lot of pop centers through which the content in that particular region would get delivered to the users we can also call them as cdn servers actually so you can see the entire journey it's loading basically this is how the data centers you can enter the lobby it's a virtual tour to the data center of microsoft and good to have knowledge nobody is going to ask you these things in exam it's just that it's good to have knowledge that's it so what is the lobby you can enter the lobby this is how the lobby would be a 3d view go to the next screen i am more interested in showing you how the infrastructure would be the mechanical area the server room this is what is my interest this is where the servers are present you can enter the server room these are all racks all these are different racks how the server room is made up of you have a complete video on youtube you can play this later 
so come here through the url infrastructure back 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 infrastructure map.microsoft.com and explore where you stay get closer to that particular region see the details look at the pop pop uh, regions which are there and so on it will be just a good experience and nothing more than that so what do we understand the data centers are in availability zones availability zones are in regions and regions are in geographies which is not mentioned over here regions are paired so that high availability can be achieved and if the content has to be restricted to only one region see there is lot of governance rules which comes into the picture in many places the data you cannot store it in a location different from the location where the consumers are for example anything pertaining to the medical records of the patients requires that you should have the details of the patient present in the same region where the patients are actually entering from it cannot go into a different region so in these kind of scenario if you want to ensure high availability you should choose region with multiple availability zones that's how high availability is achieved so instead of creating a single virtual machine in just one zone we can create multiple virtual machines with same content in multiple zones and that's how high availability can be achieved in the event of one zone going down we have the vms and the data available from other zones and if you want much more higher availability region redundancy is that option advised now coming to the second part what are azure resources see everything in a cloud platform is a service whenever you are working it's always a service infrastructure is a service and there are lot of built in platforms which are offered as service so virtual machine you can see now as a service but for azure it is a resource i'm going to create a resource virtual machine service will be used for provisioning a new virtual machine which will be looked at as one resource so you can think of it like this virtual machine is a resource type and one instance is called as one resource another instance is another resource another instance is another resource so virtual machines can be resource storage accounts for storing data is a resource connecting the virtual machines together is a virtual network a resource a pass hosting service for your web application app services is a resource your sql database comes as a resource and of course the functions are also resources here serverless compute we call it so all these resources in azure are supposed to be grouped grouped on certain criteria for example if i am building one web application i would need the app service or i would need a virtual machine in place of app service along with storage and sql database together then my application can execute my application should be deployed in virtual machine my data should be stored in sql server and my files pertaining to the user or whatever should be stored in the storage account i would try to bring them all together into a single resource group you can see here all the three are in single resource group but is that compulsory no not at all you might have 
web and database in one resource group virtual machines in another resource group storage in another resource group so every resource group can have one or more resources but what is important is compulsory every resource must be tied up with one resource group you cannot have in azure resources without a resource group it is mandatory that you must have a resource tied up with a resource group two very 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 important people get confused when we create a resource group we can give a region to that particular resource group so imagine now i created a resource group in east us region but the virtual machines which i'm going to create in that resource group can be in west us virtual machine is in west us and the resource is in so uh, the resource group is in east us and it is pretty much possible resource group is just a container for the metadata of the resource the actual resource itself can be in any region it need not be in the same region where we have the resource group and rather this is very much practical in many cases especially when we want to apply high availability what is very important is if you have by chance or by mistake created a resource in one resource group you can move the resource from one resource group to another resource group it is pretty much possible not mentioned over here but maybe when you go into advanced topics you will also realize resource group can act as security boundary i can put all my resources in one particular resource group and then give access to the users to the resource group to perform operations on those resources if i delete a resource group automatically all the resources under that resource group will get deleted so resources in the resource group can share common life cycle also it is possible that given a resource group we can know for these resources together how much is the total monthly bill bill always is generated at the level of subscription but we can then segregate it for this resource group resources how much for this resource group how much is how much we have paid for the resources inside them so these are also benefits of the resource group so resource group is a logical container remember it's not a physical container it's a logical container which can tie up all the related resources together so that it can become a common security boundary it can also have common life cycle for all the resources so that when the resource group is deleted all the resources can be deleted and most important point to remember even for the exam the resources and the resource group not necessarily must be in the same region they can be in different region but where are resource group created resource groups are always created under a subscription very 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 important subscription is a billing boundary in a subscription we can have a resource group and inside the resource group we can create resources at the end of every month we are going to get the bill a single bill which will be attached to your credit card amount will be automatically detected deducted from your credit card it is purely on the basis of subscription one subscription can have one credit card of course multiple subscriptions can use the same credit card you can again have subscription as a access control security boundary if i give permission to somebody on the subscription they would be able to perform all the operations on all the resource resources within that particular subscription so like resource group so is subscription but subscription can be a security uh, can be a container for all the resources inside the resource group which are built together billing boundary 
so multiple resources will be created by different organization and to segregate them we use different subscriptions i can have for development activities one subscription for testing activities entirely different subscriptions and different set of users will be granted permission here and for production we'll have it completely different subscription and again a different set of people would have access to this subscription so how you want this subscription to be divided in different departments is again something which the azure architects are supposed to make a decision and above subscription comes management group one level above subscription is a management group see so management group is the topmost level below the management group we can have one or more subscription within the subscription we can have one or more resource group and within the resource group we can have all the resources you cannot have resources directly under management group or directly under subscription compulsory this hierarchy has to be maintained you can go up to six levels of management group management group can be correlated with your departments and sub departments your organizational hierarchy the way it is that's the that's precisely how a management group can be created there will be root management group then then you can have a department a management group and then within department again you can have a subset project wise project wise management group and you can go up to six levels down like that so management groups can be nested management group can have another management group inside it otherwise subscription cannot be inside a subscription a resource group cannot be inside another resource group very important management groups can be nested one management group can be under another management group but that same thing is not applicable for subscriptions and resource group and of course resources are all independent of each other thousand management groups can be supported in single directory you can actually have one azure account created which is nothing but your azure ad tenant which is one single azure ad for your organization and under that thousand management groups can be created based on the size of your organization you can scale up to thousand that's huge advantage is if permissions are granted sir to someone at management group automatically the permissions will be granted to all these things and of course you can move the resources from one management group to another management group if needed you can always do that so let us see now in azure portal how we can create a resource group and then create a virtual machine so you see by now my user got redirected automatically to portal which is nothing but portal.azure.com that's actually the site portal.azure.com i may not be interested in the tour this is the search bar most frequently used one so here i want to create a resource group so i can type resource group or i can expand this and from here choose resource group this is my favorite list of resources you can edit these things you can change them so resource group i click upon and you see there are no resource group at this point of time so create a new resource group you have to choose your subscription by chance if you have multiple subscriptions all of them will be listed here right now in this particular ad account which i created i have only one subscription and under this subscription i am creating a resource group by name let's say demo rg maybe i would want to call it as east rg and i'll keep my region as east us click on next every resource in the resource group or the resource group itself can be given a tag the tags are basically used for governance purpose based on the tags you can accumulate the resources you can search for them so that you know 
okay you can give a tag name like department and the resources created even if they are in different resource group you can search by the tag name and get all the resources together for a given department of course that is optional you can skip that and finally click on create this has created a empty resource group nothing is there in that it is just empty you don't have any resources under this particular resource group so that's what we want to do now creation of a resource and let's start with something like a virtual machine i'll just simply type virtual machine go to virtual machines now click on azure virtual machine there are virtual machines with preset configuration you don't have to select many options they are preset and if you want to use azure and create virtual machine in aws or gcp there is something called as azure arc which can be used and like that vmware virtual machines if you want to create then you can use these options these are all advanced options we simply go for the first one azure virtual machine it's a huge topic by itself may not be interested in dealing with all of them so i create here a demo vm or i would call it as my web server vm in east us region under the same resource group which i created so you have choice you can either create a new resource group from here or you can choose an existing resource group which was created earlier you have a choice here so i'm taking this subscription as your pass sponsorship the resource group virtual machine east us i am not interested in getting into other details maybe i'll prefer something like a windows virtual machine windows server 2022 data center choose appropriate size for this particular virtual machine i go with two core it's well and good enough and you give a username and a password with which we are going to do an rdp to the virtual machine please don't give and forget you'll need this when you want to connect to the virtual machine what all ports i should be able to connect and use that i have to mention over here i want should be able to use rdp and i want to probably work with the web server on that virtual machine web server works on port number 80 and rdp works on port number 3389 that's the port number for rdp so http 80 for the web server to do an remote desktop access to the virtual machine 3389 if it was linux i would have used ssh in place of 3389 because we will do ssh to a linux vm if at all you had a server sec ssl certificate for your website https would be enabled otherwise that is not so http https are for website 22 is for ssh 3389 is for rdp please remember these numbers then you are supposed to give other information like what are the disks which we want for the virtual machine how a virtual network is created when we create a virtual machine you can actually first create a virtual network and in that virtual network you can create a virtual machine but right now when we are creating a virtual machine we are letting the virtual network automatically get created in the background so i may probably change the name here to simply demo east vnet and this is the ip address range for the demo east vnet so one particular vnet can have multiple subnets by default one subnet is created and we leave with the default one and then rest all you can leave but one important setting i would like to give here is auto shutdown auto shutdown i want this particular virtual machine to automatically shut down even if it is running at 9 am my time india time 
at 9 am when my session has ended i want this virtual machine to automatically shut down because i don't need it after that and the moment i shut down virtual machine like this it is going to stop billing and if you want a notification you can actually put your email id here before 15 minutes from the time of shutdown you will get an email and there will be a link in the email if you click on the link you can extend the shutdown time if you don't do anything automatically it will shut down at that particular point of time so and that's it that's it actually you will see that in few seconds maybe a minute or two in the worst case our virtual machine is up and running this is the cost i'm going to pay around 15 rupees that is 15 inr indian currency my subscription is automatically tied up to india currency because the reason which i gave at the time of creating my account was india so my native region <coughs> currency is provided over here so now i actually first it did validation that everything is all okay now i clicked on create and it has started creating a virtual machine you will see that after this one new screen will come that is the point when it has submitted the request to the server now the request has gone to the server all the time it was preparing the request in the browser now it is submitted to the server there is something called as ARM template Azure Resource Manager template which was built on the fly in the browser this ARM template it is submitting all this will be submitted to server and this ARM template has certain parameters whose values are over here Azure Resource Manager that's actually the template name so you can see the overall progress over here in overview you see NSG something called as network security group got created a virtual machine has been given an IP address IP address is a separate resource and that's going to be charged East vnet is created virtual network is created for the virtual machine there will be a network interface card that is created and now it is creating with all these details finally the new virtual machine and it says it's already created just that the virtual machine has to start and once the virtual machine starts you will see there is a button which is going to come up here go to resources that's it over our virtual machine is up and running because we have allowed the port number 3389 at this point of time we can actually do an RDP to that virtual machine you can do a RDP download the RDP file open the file give the username and password which we gave at the time of creating the virtual machine people forget this the funny thing is they give some username and password and by the time they come here they don't know what's the username and password they have given click on yes and shortly we are inside the virtual machine that's it it's an RDP session into that virtual machine the remote virtual machine we are logging in with the identity of the user DSS admin we are in you can actually minimize this or let's say we want to install IIS it's just a raw virtual machine if you want to run your website on top of this virtual machine you'll have to install IIS web server you have to deploy your web application of course when we install IIS web server it comes with the default website 
at this point of time i'll just show you the output from that particular default website so this is server manager we go to add roles and features we'll have to wait it is still loading i used a very low configuration machine i click on add roles and features this will have to change the colors that's the point we know it has enabled that now you see this will work so click on next click on next click on next and here you put a check mark ias web server ias add feature click on next 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 simply next 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 install you can as well do this using powershell if you want and this will take probably a minute and after the minute my virtual machine is going to have the web server software installed how can i reach that the virtual machine if you go to networking section you will see has a public ip address this one So 20.231.110.191. Copy that and put that in the browser. We have already allowed port number 80. The site is not coming up because it's not still installed. IS is still on its job. It's not installed successfully yet. Once IS is installed. that it will start rendering the default website we we'll have to wait and watch I just need few more minutes. I know we have already exceeded the time. I want to show you how easy it is to create a virtual machine in Azure infrastructure and make the web application deployed on top of it available to the people on internet. No time, almost there. That's it. overall it did not take more than 10 minutes from the time i started creating virtual machine to rendering the default website content i did not take more than 10 minutes but i have a virtual machine up and running and is accessible to people across right now if you are watching this live you can actually use that ip and visit this particular website 2231 One one zero one nine one. Of course, after the session is ended, I would deprovision the virtual machine. But if you are watching it live now, you can also reach this particular website from your location by using the IP address twenty two thirty one 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 zero one nine one. So this is how you actually create a virtual machine. We seen virtual machine is created. and the resource group is created so in the last session i have shown you how to create the virtual machines and actually we created two virtual machines i go to the virtual machines section and i have this two virtual machines created for you people now yes at the end of the session we stopped it the first thing i'll do is now start these two virtual machines on the first virtual machine i have also installed iis web server i did not install it on the second virtual machine though now what i would like to do is between these two virtual machines i would like to put a load balancer also remember these two virtual machines i have put in the availability set both the virtual machines belong to an availability set 
the first one has gone in 0 0 combination fault domain and update domain and this has gone into 1 1 combination fault domain update domain so now I would like to say load balancer here load balancers create a load balancer give the name for load balancer I am using it for web server so I will call it as web server load balancer we don't worry about all this we just need to give an IP address also to the load balancer so I will give hyphen IP you can make it as a static IP address and say review and create it will take something failed I need to select the resource group ensure that the region is same where you have created your VNet and VM all the infrastructure right now we are creating belongs to the same region and that's it this will create the load balancer but are virtual machines added to the load balancer no not yet so I want to add virtual machines also to the load balancer which I'll do it here I'm opening multiple tabs so here we will see the progress of load balancer creation you can actually go to the bell icon here on top for notifications and any kind of notification it will display here remember if at all by chance if you have got multiple subscriptions you have to go to directory and subscription and switch to the appropriate subscription and of course appropriate directory also so that comes into picture only if you have multiple subscriptions and multiple active directories don't have to worry otherwise about it so we have the load balancer created the immediate next step in load balancer would be to go to backend pools and add our virtual machines here at this point of time we haven't configured our load balancer for anything advanced everything is basic configuration and hence only virtual machines if they are part of availability set they can be added we are going for basic load balancer configuration there is something called as st uh, standard load balancer also where even if a virtual machine if it is not part of availability set we can add here but right now because we are using the basic configuration basic SKU we call it only load balancers which are basic sorry only virtual machines which are also basics can be added and that's what I have done here so I'm using most of the options as default options at this point of time now in the meantime I go to the second virtual machine there I haven't installed IIS I want to install IIS in the second virtual machine so it's a repetition of steps go to VM overview connect you will see a public IP address using which we are going to connect RDP file will be downloaded connect give the username and password which we gave earlier Sir, what is RDP file? RDP is remote desktop file. That's the file which will open that dialog box you got, right? For connecting to the remote machine. So I'm now looking at actually the remote machine now. So from my desktop, I did a remote desktop login to the virtual machine. And on this virtual aren't, machine, aren't I want to install IIS. Can't we do it with MSPS? Can't we do it with? NSTSC. What is NSTSC? Spell it full. If it is Linux, we use SSH. 
If it is Windows, we do RDP. So either of these two we use. So Windows servers have GUI. That's why we are able to do RDP. Linux servers generally don't have GUI. So we'll have to go for PuTTY and SSH otherwise. So right now I want to add IIS here. So just say next. Choose your web server. The web server role. You can even use PowerShell in case you know PowerShell. You can use PowerShell to install IIS web server. Basically add feature IIS. And that also will take some time. And we should have the web server up and running. So I'll minimize this now. Back to my load balancer. You see the pool is updated to two virtual machines. Then there are some extra steps. We'll have to add health probes. These are the ones which will keep checking if the web server is up and running or not at a regular interval of time. And once the health probes are added, I'm supposed to add load balancing rules. Of course, only when this is completed, we will be able to add. But in the meantime, what I would like to do is go to the VM. And here we will have one folder created called as C colon INET pub www root, which is actually the default website folder. Just to distinguish that the output is coming from server one and server two, I'm putting here the text, let's say server two, some number, that's all. And that's it. The job of this server is done. So we have a choice now actually. Right now we can go to the web server directly. And for this web server we can find out its IP and send a request directly. And we don't want to do that. We want to send the request via load balancer. So, but yes, we have the choice of sending the request to both the web servers directly by knowing their IP. Alternatively, we can send the request to the web server via load balancer. Even a load balancer will have an IP. So let me record the IP address of the load balancer. This is the IP address of the load balancer. So we still need to complete the configuration and once we see the configuration is done in overview it will show us the IP address these are two public load public IP address assigned to the VM and this is assigned to the load balancer. It's taking time. I have to wait. No other choice. I think done. So now go to load balancer rules or oh, still pending. In the meantime, if you have any questions, I'll take that. Uh, one question, sir. For the health probes, um, if you are currently uh, probing the HTTP port. Uh, in feature, if we have some different type of port which we need to probe, uh, that can be done, right? Uh, it's only on HTTP different. probe. This load balancer support TCP and HTTP. Two types of probes are supported by this load balancer. So, I'm checking. Rather, sorry, this is a network layer load balancer. This supports only TCP probing. Oh, okay. We can actually see if there is a drop down and UDP is also there in that possibility is there. 
So good morning, uh, Sandeep. Rajnikanth here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want to summarize this. So it actually starts with we creating the one main virtual machine, and as a backup, you create another virtual machine. Then to ensure that when there's a huge traffic, you have to do that balancing between these two virtual machines. So uh, you also uh, create a virtual what do you load call balancer. It? I'm load creating balancer. a load balancer to distribute the load between two virtual machines. Okay, so do you give load balancing in terms of these two virtual machines, or only you give only one load balancer and connect to one of them so that uh, there is only one load connect. balancer. Load balancer is a separate service, and virtual okay. machines are separate. So now <coughs> the request will go to load balancer, and from load balancer it will go to the VMs. So from internet okay, the request will come here. Okay. And from here it will go here, and it will go here. So, so this is my load balancer. These are virtual machines. Okay. So if as a client, cloud user, customer, we just have to create and leave it. Uh, is there any mechanism in the back end that will uh, you know allocate this request based on the traffic to the rest of the virtual machine? that the load balancer implementation is taking care of it we don't have control over it oh okay 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 thank you so i can add now load balancing rules or still updating yeah another question yeah, uh, this is just an answer. i just i just uh, 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 like when we pd possibility is recant Srikanth Nandan Kavi, you speak. Yeah, can you speak? Yeah. Yeah, when the VMs are added automatically uh, based on CPU percentage, how the uh, new VMs are allocated to? Oh, no, that you have to learn how to use VM scale set. That's a different service. Oh. Somebody else. Uh, hi. Uh, this is Krishna sir. I just wanted to know. I missed yesterday's session, so. I just joined today. Then you so. you better watch the videos of yesterday's session. Oh, okay. Uh, this is Abhar. I have one question. Can you a little bit explain the role of the health probe here? How it interacts with the load balancer or the virtual load machine? balancer uses health probes to at a regular interval of time keep checking if they are up and running or not by sending data to the sockets. and if the web server responds it is treated as healthy and if the web server does not respond the web server is treated as unhealthy so what web what load balancer does is through health probes whenever it finds that a particular web server is not healthy it will stop sending traffic to that web server it will shift all the traffic to the other web server that's what actually the health probe is doing health probe checking the health of the participate participants which are here virtual machines thank you hello sir so uh, for both now i'm saying public ip address as web server uh, load balancer ip web right. server that so if you now switch to vm in vm when you go to load balance when you try to see the ip address it will now change to the ip address of load balancer for the reason that now these web servers are accessible via load balancer so the portal is showing you like that but you can go to networking and under under networking you will find something called as network interface card and from there you can find out the ip address so this is the ip address of my vm2 okay likewise i'll have an ip address for vm1 thank you so this is the could you please elaborate the uh, load balancer uh, protocols uh, there are only two protocols or are three protocols there are seven osi layers load balancer uses the layer 4 and then we have one more application gateway which is at layer 7 and load balancer not are not there at other layers 
HTTP and HTTPS come at layer 7. Those okay, are application so layer protocols. So you can uh, install the certificates as well in the load balancer? No. You can do it in the application gateway, not here. Okay. So let's yeah. now see how I can add the load balancing rule. You just give some rule, web server rule, load balancer front end ports and just say okay. Just leave all the options default for now and just say okay and that's it. It's a pretty vast topic again as usual. Hardly 2-3% of the actual topic I am showing you. Basically, I am only showing you that the concept of load balancer exists. That's all I want to show, showcase at this point of time. How it is internally working, what is public load balancer, what is private load balancer, the frequency of probes, how NAT rules comes into the picture, network allocation table job is also done by load balancer. So these are all pretty advanced things which we cover in Azure administration or Azure infrastructure courses. So it will take some time and once this rule is completed we are done with the configuration. We can actually go to the IP configuration of the load balancer and start sending traffic to this particular IP now. It's because the rules have been created it's all good. Send the request and you should find the response. Right now it's coming from server 1. One of you can type in your browser 52, 242, 85, 47 and you may probably get the output from server 2. We have to create enough load on the server then only it will do the switch over. Yeah, you see sometime. Saw that? Sometimes I am getting server 2 if I do it very fast but some of you doing it uh, so this IP is load balancer IP. this IP is definitely load balancer IP so as I can show you here this is first is IP of web server 1 second is IP of web server 2 and this is IP of web server 3 so we will map our domain name to load balancer IP not the web server IP some of you should confirm that you are getting two oh, it's gone again it was there and gone I got two I got two yes, yes. so that's what is the so, load balancer topic and that topic ends there yes sir what? one last question Sundi. uh uh, who actually defines this IP address which is already yeah, there public the... IP address are automatically created we don't have to do that uh, it's probably the cloud itself cloud I mean public IP addresses we cannot control they are whatever is the free available IP address that will be assigned private IP addresses we can control though but we are not doing it now uh -huh. okay thank you so that's Sunday. it about load balancer guys we'll close this topic here and we should proceed to the next Defining container services. See, nowadays actually Docker is very popular. So developers create Docker images. And these Docker images are supposed to be uploaded into a registry. Docker themselves provide one registry which is called as Docker Hub. And then Microsoft provides another registry which is referred here as Docker Container Registry. So if you are a developer or if you are a DevOps engineer, you'll have to somehow ensure that your Docker images reach into Docker registry, which can be managed by Docker Hub, which can be managed by Azure. If it is Azure, it is called as Azure Container Registry. And then once we have the container registry, from the container registry, we can select an image and using that image we can create a container instance. 
so basically azure container instance is a lightweight virtual machine the purpose of this container is to have features of virtual machine but it will not have an operating system of its own so let us think of something like this there is huge amount of compute power which is managed by some physical machine or virtual machine whatever and on top of that virtual machine only multiple containers will be created so container instance unlike vm comes under the pass offering you have to simply upload the image into the container registry and use that for creating the container instance if you have only one container in your application you can definitely directly make use of azure container instance but if suppose the developers have used microservices based architecture wherein each microservice is supposed to be deployed as a separate container and you may probably have tens and hundreds of microservices in your complete application so if you want to manage all those microservices right from their instantiation to the complete life cycle management sometimes in certain cases recreation if they are dead because of some problems security discovery and many more such features if you want to handle we need some kind of orchestration services azure actually provides two types of orchestration services one is azure kubernetes service which is more popular nowadays and there is also azure service fabric aks azure kubernetes service is actually built on top of the kubernetes uh, which is actually an open source contribution majorly by google kubernetes was initially given to the world by google now lot of vendors are managing that and it has become pretty popular in microservices based architecture application development so now i would like to very quickly show you how you can actually create a container instance in azure so go back to the azure portal and search for container instances you see a container registries is also there but we just go for container instances create a container instance create a select a resource group give a name here let's say some demo container you can choose as i said a image from azure container registry if you have or docker hub but right now we don't have anything we simply use a container which is already there in linux an image which is already there a linux based image you can choose nginx if you want a simple hello world you want whatever any one doesn't really matter and just say review and create and you will see that that container is going to be instantiated and managed by this container instance again it is also going to have an ip address now what is important is to have this container instance you do not need anything like a virtual network you don't need a virtual network you don't need a virtual machine because this is by itself a pass service so it's independent by itself and completely it is managed by microsoft in background they take care of maintaining all these things on which physical hardware or on which which physical machine or virtual machine the containers are created it's none of our business all that infrastructure is completely managed by microsoft in background and that's it with this our container instance is ready and we start using it like we used a default website for this also once the container is instantiated i can take you to the ip and show the default website which is generated yes no doubt it's a pretty advanced topic where 
a developer should know how to actually create an image from the source code which they write and image should have layers and then deploy that using some docker commands into the azure container registry and blah 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 so these are the container this is the ip you can copy and paste here will get the default output that's it this is the default output the container instance so just understand that vm is one compute container is another compute which can run your applications now com coming to data see whenever we have Final data question. Yeah. With with respect to container, we can say that container is with respect to Docker file only, or with microservice as well. That's a big topic. We'll keep it away. You just know that there is a container, and containers are created through images, and there is a procedure to create image, which would require you to use some software called as Docker. Okay. If we are using microservice, do we need to create Still container? Still we need to use Docker only and create containers. Microservices are deployed through Docker. Docker so is used for creating containers. The application which is running inside a container is a microservice. The application which is running inside the container will be called as a microservice. So, Sandeep, uh, uh, the creation of content is a mandatory or uh, it's, we can take it as an optional because we also have a, a virtual machine as an option. That's what, what I'm showing you. Kind of See, the whole purpose of these sessions is only to show you what all various options are available. Okay, compute power. Yeah. That's all. And based on these options, one at the advanced level will take decision. Should they go for VM? Should they go for container? Should they go for Azure function? Like that, there are multiple mm -hmm. options which are available. Our app services is one more. So I'm just showing you that these are options available. We're not digging into exactly when to use these. What are the benefits of mm -hmm. each over the other? That's all, I mean, out of this particular context. I mean, at this level, we don't need that knowledge. Got it, got it. Thank you, Sunil. No, that's not required. That's a pretty complicated topic. No, at least I mean, single line, what is the use of Kubernetes? Kubernetes uh, is an orchestration server, which is for responsible, which is responsible for hosting hundreds of containers at a time. At a time, you can have multiple containers managed by Kubernetes. Okay, got it. So, for now, I said this already, that Kubernetes is actually an orchestration service. Now, what is orchestration? What are the features of orchestration? Now, I, I have boundaries. I cannot go beyond these boundaries in this particular course. Okay. So, let's move on. What is structured data, semi-structured data, and unstructured data? See, whenever we want to work with data, we have options of probably working with flat files, or you might work with certain files like XML files, JSON files, HTML files. You might have files which will contain images, word files pdf files and many times you will also work with files which are probably having data stored in a specific format which we call it as structured data so in structured data we are going to create tables sql tables are going to be created each and every table is supposed to have multiple columns and multiple records that means there will be rows and columns in a table if you take one row it defines a complete entity so if I want to store information about all employees I'll create an employee table and for each employee I'll, I'll create one record 
employee 1 all the data pertaining to that will be one record employee 2 all the data pertaining to that will be another record and so on so that type of data we call it as structured data because it has proper structure of rows and columns so there will be a lot of relationships also which are created between tables in large applications between multiple tables we will have relationship for example an employee will definitely belong to some department so department is one table employee is another table and there is a relationship created between employee and department second type of data we call it as semi structured data so most of the time nowadays the xml files the json files the html files these are structured but they are not completely structured they are partially structured so that comes under semi structured data if at all you ever heard of no sql database so most of the time no sql database is considered as semi structured data and then we have got unstructured these are your simple mp4 files mp3 files pdf files bmp file png file jpg file there is absolutely no structure at all in this kind of files they have specific format which only that particular application which has saved would understand so every application in cloud has to deal with some kind of data which can be structured data or semi structured data or unstructured data so for this what are the services available so we have got disks and files disk is something which i can attach to a vm i can create a resource called as disk and attach that as a data disk to a vm so that vm can have applications which are storing files on the disk yes purely for unstructured data and then we have got files there is a service called as storage service in azure we have got a storage service storage service actually provides four sub services in a storage service you can store blobs which are referred as binary large objects so in a storage service we have to create container and inside the container we can store blobs a storage service can store files the basic difference between blobs and files is blobs are generally used in modern applications they are faster and they are also cheaper files are mostly used for legacy applications so if i have a pretty old application it, and if i do not want to make any changes then i go for files and then we have got tables which are basically for partially structured data and also there is a support for queue so two applications if they want to communicate with each other and if the communication has to be asynchronous like the way we two communicate with email right when you are not there i can send you an email and whenever you get time you can check the mail like that there can be two applications which want to communicate with each other some messages but both of them may not be running at the same time so in those kind of cases they make use of queues a message will be posted by one application into the queue and the other application whenever it comes up will retrieve the message from the queue so how do we actually work with this storage service that's what we have to actually see now so i remi repeat this point if you want to deal with unstructured data or partially structured data you are going to work with a storage service and if you want to work with structured data you are actually supposed to make use of sql database service so i go back to portal here i take you to storage accounts there are a lot of existing storage accounts but i'll create a new one
some name I gave and we just say review and create. So in a couple of minutes the storage account is going to be ready. Now in this storage account I am going to upload a image or a PDF file anything we can upload. For that first step would be to create a container. After we create a container inside the container we are supposed to upload a file which is referred as blob and once it is uploaded there we can give access to those files to anyone. But you have to keep in mind the containers can be public, the containers can be private. Only with public container anybody can access the blob but with private there is a lengthy procedure which has to be followed. So we have the resource created let's go to that. So here you see containers option is there. You can also find the same thing here. I add a container. I'll just call it as demo container or let's call it as my images and I'll change it to public. Any of these two can be used. Both are public though there is a slight difference between them but yes. A container is created. Now go to the container and you can upload a file here. some file let's say tree.jpg that's it now that the file is already there what we are going to get is a URL for this particular file so click this is the URL of the file copy and paste it here so if at all you have questions like where can I store my PDFs? Where can I store my MP4? Where can I store my any type of file so that I can retrieve this file later? Yes, the solution to this particular problem is use a storage account. And in storage account, where do we store files? More specifically, we have to store it in containers. And the files which are stored in containers are referred as blobs. That's one of the database data, data solutions, binary data, binary data, unstructured or partially structured data. Database services. Now, in SQL, uh, the sorry, in Azure, we have two options. One is Azure Cosmos DB, which is purely for NoSQL. No SQL type of database and other is Azure SQL database and Azure SQL database is a relational database something like SQL server rather Azure SQL database is a ready-made pass service which in background uses SQL server infrastructure but we are not going to man manage that SQL server Microsoft will manage the complete SQL server for us we just need to mention what all tables we want to create, what all stored procedures we want to create, what all indexes we want to create, all our schema we will create, how internally the schema is created, how it is managed in the flat files by the backend database, how the backup is taken. No, we are not interested in any of those things because it is again a pass service rather Cosmos DB is also a pass service. Now the beautiful advantage of Cosmos DB is it is said to be globally distributed database service. That means you can have your data let us say in India one of the data center and the same data can be also replicated in probably US data center. So any kind of changes I make to the database locally in no time or I would say little very little time it is going to get updated parallelly in US also. So if there is an application 
which is reading data in US. Let's say you people are customers and you are supposed to know details about the products which I am selling. So I will update my product in India database. The product information will also get updated in maybe less than 2-3 seconds in US database. So US database will have one application in, hosted in US. India database will be managed by let's say another application which is hosted in India so that we give the best experience to our customers. So people in India are using a India server which is using an India database and a replica of it is by is used by people in USA through a USA server. So this kind of architecture can be created in Cosmos DB. A highly scalable service, extraordinary throughput you are going to get, huge volume of data you can deal with. See the basic advantage of no SQL is three V's. Velocity, volume, and variety velocity volume and variety there is always a high variety of data I mean there is a lot of types of data you have key value pairs you have got graph database you will have a lot of variety of data we deal with in that category you have got huge volume just imagine Facebook how every time you write some content and save it and the whole world is writing what kind of database Facebook is getting generated and similarly the velocity all three at very high speed the data is generated huge volume of data is generated and a lot of varieties are to be managed Cosmos DB is one of the fantastic services and in competition when compared to Google or uh, Amazon Cosmos DB in its category is considered to be the cheapest. SQL database I already spoke and then we have got this migration as your database migration. What is this for? See this is again one more service which is responsible for migrating your on-premise data to Azure database. Definitely today you may not have cloud implementation but you want to move to cloud. But at the same time, you don't want to have any downtime for your database. You don't want to have any loss of, uh, I mean, loss of data when the applications are running. And swiftly, easily, you should be able to migrate your on-premise data to Azure. Or from one location to another location, like that. So that is the place where there is something called as Azure Database Migration Service. So let us is, is it not part of your networking? Hmm? Is it not part of your networking uh, when you talk about database migration from on-premise to the cloud? It's, it's not a networking service, right? Definitely it is not a networking service. It's a separate service. Because I was thinking that it's because it has something to do with the connectivity, so I was thinking on those lines. No. Connectivity is anyhow needed. Once the connectivity is achieved, then only obviously we can migrate the data. Okay. So let us see now how we can actually create a SQL database service. So create yes, SQL Andy. database service. Hold on. I choose again the same resource group. Give a name to a database. I'm calling it as demo DB. For every database we create, we need one server. Of course, this is a logical server. I am giving some name there. And to log on to that server, we need some username and password. Like we need username and password for VM. We will need username and password for this particular server also. And you choose the location. And again, because this is a pass service, I do not need virtual networking for this. I can just choose whichever location I want and I can create the SQL database service independent of my virtual network. And then 
you are very important especially when you are practicing make sure that you go to the configure there are a lot of pricing information listed here you can start with as simple as 350 rupees less than 350 rupees per month and you can go up to around 12 lakhs i think per month maybe more also they keep enhancing every time around 12 lakhs 82,000 per month billing just see the variation as per your requirement how you can go you can handle up to 4 TB of data with 80 virtual cores huge configuration that is so be careful when you are practicing you switch to basic and keep it minimum apply otherwise your free credits will get exhausted review and create so you'll see now in no time you don't need any database administrator you don't need any physical machines to be created you don't need to buy the license you don't need to do anything and you are able to simply create the database and you only pay as you go for it so looks like I did a small mistake I did not select the right pricing though I went there but I'll show you even after the database is created the pricing can be changed at any point of time you don't have to stick to the pricing which was opted for at the time of creation the beautiful thing is even if you change the pricing or the pricing tier you are not going to have any downtime for your database how is that managed in background we don't need to know but yes there will not be any downtime for your database even if you are changing the price of it that's the beauty of this SQL database service and also it will provide us with some feature where we can connect to the database and operate either from the portal itself or we can use something like management studio on our machine and use that for connecting to the database so what is important for you at this point of time is SQL database is a ready-made service which is available in Azure which you can simply provision for managing your structured data structured data where you can create tables views stored procedures indexes and all this stuff yeah any questions hi Sandeep uh, this is Balaji can you hear me yeah question is if say for example a company is having a database like Oracle and if they are interested to go for Azure do they have an option to use Oracle on Azure or they should move to SQL Server no no they can actually create a VM what would they do in on-premise they would create a VM and install uh -huh. Oracle on that same thing they can do uh -huh. here also or rather okay. when they choose a VM there are ready-made mm -hmm. options which are probably built in with Oracle okay you just choose the right image and that will have Oracle in it so okay. I go to configure now see my database is up and running I go to configure yeah I did Thank select you. basic so I'm good with it so basic is only the default we are good with it otherwise I wanted to show you we can change here and apply oh, it looks like no it was not basic I remember just before I clicked on apply it showed me a different pricing tier no it's basic so we are good so now what I want to do is first go to set firewall by default the database is completely protected and we are not allowed to access from anywhere there are a lot of rules here but for now I'll just use this option add client IP that means this is actually my IP address so right now I'm allowing the IP address from which I should be able to connect 
my IP address specifically I am saving it here. Once I do this from my machine I can use SQL Server Management Studio and connect to this database. Even if you know the username and password which I gave you will not be able to connect to this database because your IP will be different. Though we can give start range to end range, a bigger range can be given. Right now start and end is same, which is my IP address. So now there is something called here Explorer, Query Editor. Go to Query Editor, provide the username and password, click on OK and we are in. Now we can write our queries. That's it. No data. But if data is there, that will be presented to you. So this is how we have actually created an SQL database service. Something and just also I showed you how we can query the database. Please. Just open the connection strings. It has the connection string. You want to see the connection string? Yes. Go to overview tab and here you will find the connection string. So this is the connection string which the developers will use for connecting. So now like this Azure provides a marketplace. Now I can actually develop an application using Azure services and make that service available to you. You can use the Azure marketplace and start using that service on your Azure subscription. So more than 10,000 products are already listed in Azure marketplace. Huge number of services are there. Just go to marketplace and search for what you what do you want. They are all categorized. Say for example, I go to compute and somebody was asking for Oracle on Linux, Oracle Database Standard Edition. It will filter it. Choose this and create. The image is bring your own license image. That means you already procured the license from Oracle. That's what is the assumption it is making. So the licensing cost of Oracle is not included in this. And like this, every service can be provisioned. These are now steps for creating Oracle only. A VM actually. Steps for creating VM. A VM which has ready-made Oracle in it. So like this, Azure provides you a marketplace which has lots of images Images by Microsoft Azure, by Microsoft. Images by even third party, the service providers, independent software vendors they call it. So you can register with Microsoft as an independent software vendor, meet their guidelines in developing the application and add them to the Azure infrastructure so that people can make use of those services in background. So we have already seen till now certain compute environments like how to create a virtual machine and we have also created uh, certain past services, the storage account, the SQL database and now we want to see in this particular session how we can make use of the serverless computing. The first question is what is serverless computing? Serverless definitely does not mean 
these applications do not need any server do not need any cpu or do not need any memory no it definitely does not mean that the concept serverless computing here basically means that on demand the program is going to be assigned the required memory and the processor this is whenever the program executes or is triggered to be executed at that point of time some infrastructure will be assigned to the program basically your memory and processor and then the program is going to execute so yes azure functions falls in that category where the developer is supposed to write a function maybe in c sharp maybe in javascript and so many other languages are supported there so if you are a developer and if you want to write code which execute as serverless compute this is the best thing to do as your function say for example in continuation to yesterday's session i showed you how a hardware device can send a signal to iot hub now what we can do is as soon as a message comes into iot hub immediately we can trigger an azure function so if hundreds and thousands of messages are posted into iot hub so many executions of our execu azure functions will happen and all these would remain completely independent of each other so that's the beauty of something like azure function so yes azure function is code running your service the function itself is a service and not the underlying platform or infrastructure so there is no permanent infrastructure blocked that means there is no permanent costing function executes it will cost does not execute no costing precisely consumption model it is called as consumption model only when you consume you are paying otherwise you are not paying at all anything so is the case with azure logic apps logic apps are basically for building workflows i can take an example like as soon as a message is posted into a storage account basically a queue or let's say an event hub some event occurred it can be any kind of event i would like to immediately do some data processing and send some email also at the same time probably do some twitter post and write something on my facebook facebook account so discrete systems without writing even a single line of code can be all integrated by a designer workflow creation created in logic app if at all you have heard of azure power automate or uh, earlier it was called as flow microsoft flow precisely that is what is logic app all about so you don't write any code but through certain designer you do drag and drop and do some basic configuration with the help of connectors it will connect to the source or destination whatever fetch the data or update the data and flow the data to the next step so say you come and post a inquiry on my website i can write a logic app in such a way that as soon as the record is inserted into the database table the logic app should be triggered and when the logic app is triggered it should take the information about you and let us say put it in my crm system as a new inquiry at the same time the information about you can be sent by either sms or by email to the sales team and at the same time i can probably send to you an email with whatever course details you might have asked for an automated email can be generated so we can implement logic app for these kind of situations and what is the beauty we don't have to write even a single line of code similarly event grid is there event grid is also responsible for intelligently managing 
lot of events which occur in various services. Basically, it is again a publish subscribe model which is form followed here. There will be one sub publisher and for one event by one publisher, there can be multiple subscribers. So yes, I can have an event occurred which can lead to invocation of logic app and maybe at the same time Azure function. So like that, I can have one to many that's what is event grid is all about it's a routing service routing service that uses publish subscribe model for uniform event consumption same event should be consumed by multiple receivers so let us see now how we can start working with an azure function first so i would like to create an azure function and immediately see how to trigger it with a HTTP call. So I go to the portal. For creating an Azure function, we have to actually create a function app. The requirement is, first we should create a function app. And after we create a function app, inside the function app, we will add a function. So create a new resource, function app. Give a name choose the resource group I am choosing some demo RG that AZ900 resource group I actually deleted yesterday so that all the resources will be deleted so let me recreate it put here some name now, when you want to host a function, do you want to use a Docker container or code? Even that facility is available here. We'll leave it with the default. Let's say we want to have a .NET Core project. I do most of my demos in East US. And that's it. Let's create a function. Once the function app is created, the next thing I would like to do is to the function app, I would like to add a function. It should be listed here. Function app is your base for execution of a function. Obviously, right? If I am saying function app is the base and then we have to add a function, we can't do direct. That's the default meaning of it. The function app name uh, supposed to be unique. Any name doesn't really matter. Yeah, function app will become the base name throughout the portal I mean not only portal throughout the Azure account you cannot have two function app with same name because that also becomes my base URL my DSS function app dot Azure websites dot net so if I have created a function app with this name now nobody else can create a function app with this name 
So now I go to the functions and add a function here. Now we have the ability to add a function in the portal itself or if you are a developer you can also write your function in Visual Studio and deploy that into a function app. You can do that. You can see here so many triggers are available. Various reasons why the function app can execute. I am interested in a simple one HTTP trigger. Give some name, say for example, watch first, say hello, and the function app is ready. You can actually see the code here, and there is some default implementation. I would just leave it as it is, I don't want to touch the default implementation. And the default implementation gives hello and the name followed by some text. Now I need to invoke this function. So to invoke this function, I get function URL. Just copy this. And now you can open a browser and execute the function. Now this particular function expects a query string parameter called as name. So I'm going to give the URL and add one extra parameter that is name. Let's say I put my name. So I'll get here, hello, my name which I've sent and some text. So like this, right now I'm invoking the function by typing the URL, but definitely some developer can write code to do a HTTP get or HTTP post request. Programmatically they can do it. Somebody can give this as a hyperlink on a particular page. So if you have a facility where you can post a HTTP request, you are able to execute a function inside the function app. And only when the function executes, the function app instance will be created. And that is where actually your processor and memory will be allocated. Otherwise, no nothing will be allocated to the function app. So this is a simple example of Azure functions. So there are two more services which are part of Azure, Azure infrastructure, which are referred as DevOps. So what is this Azure DevOps services? See, as a developer, I would write my code and I would put it in a version control system. Maybe GitHub, maybe Bitbucket, or maybe Azure repos. And then from the version control system, I would like my code to be picked up by something like a CI pipeline, continuous integration pipeline. And then it should go to CD pipeline. And from there, it should get deployed into various environments which can be dev environment, testing environment, QA environment, maybe UAT environment, pre-production and then production like that multiple environments might be there based on your organization requirement for an application to be 100% guaranteed that when it goes into production it is not going to fail. So a lot of Azure services provide built-in support for all these things. Azure DevOps is actually a set of services. Of course, we don't operate through Azure portal. We have a separate portal for working with Azure DevOps, where we get facility for managing our source code in the form of Azure repos, which is basically a Git repository. We have got Azure boards. Azure boards are your Kanban boards, where you can actually design where you can actually dump all your work items, which can be tasks, which can be bugs, which can be user stories, features. I mean, there is a way we do that in a very systematic way. So complete planning of a project can go on the Kanban board. 
and the Kanban board can also track the status of the task whether it is ongoing or whether it is in queue or whether it is completed or whether it is in a bug state or is it resolved all that tracking also you can do on a Kanban board. Azure DevOps also give you facility where you can do lot of automated testing. You can do load testing. You can simply send let's say 100 user traffic to your website at a time. If you want you can do that or maybe you can do some kind of test cases you can write and record whenever what the test cases was checked by the uh, I mean some manual testing can be done but the documentation of manual testing can be done in the Azure DevOps. So basically Azure DevOps is the tool or a set of tools used by the DevOps engineers which is actually a combination of development and operations team. Certain activities which are common to both dev and operations are taken care of by the Azure DevOps. Azure also gives you Azure Dev Test Labs. Basically some environment you can create actually in Azure. And this environment will ensure us to control cost. You can actually create a virtual machine and put some control on the cost of the virtual machine. But of course those are all test environments they cannot be used for the production. So these are two services which are again part of Azure. Azure DevOps for which a separate portal is provided altogether and Azure Dev Test Labs is actually a service provided in Azure through which we can create resources in a very controlled manner and also the cost is controlled in that DevOps Labs. Let's now discuss about the Azure App Service, something my favorite at, at least. We use it for deploying our web application. So let us say I am a .NET developer. I build my web applications. I build my mobile applications. I build RESTful APIs. So somewhere I have to deploy all these things so that the consumers can use it, the clients can use it. Obviously, I'll need a web server for it. So instead of I creating a virtual machine and then creating a web server software on it and then deploying our website along with all the other dependencies like the runtime because it is .NET, I would need .NET framework or .NET runtime. Instead of we doing all these things, we can tell Azure App Service, you take care of all this for us and we will simply deploy our applications. Yes, it supports multiple languages, Java, .NET, Python, Ruby, multiple languages are supported. You can scale quite easily. I want multiple instances running. The load has increased. I can just go and change one number and immediately the app service will multiply its instances. I don't have to create a load balancer manually. I don't, I don't have to add app services to the load balancer manually. Nothing. Not only, auto, uh, not only manual scaling, even automated scaling can be configured in app services. If the amount of traffic which is coming is beyond a particular limit, automatically the load should be split on multiple instances of app service. Or let's say if the CPU percentage is beyond some number threshold, automatically one extra app service should be added and the load should get divided. Such kind of automated configuration can be done in app service. With few clicks, you can enable security. Wherein a user is supposed to first authenticate and then only he will be able to access the website. And everything can be done through the portal itself without writing even a single line of code. And of course, fantastic integration with the favorite tools of developers, visualstudio.net. So, how do we create an app service? And how we can actually run the application? So, I go back to the browser, same portal. 
create a resource choose the option web app create a web app you can see here node.js python php java ruby dotnet core asp.net so many languages are supported windows linux docker non docker so give some name again this name is see here ending with azure websites.net only so give some name dss az900 demo So my URL is going to be dss az 900 demo dot azure websites dot net. Of course, we can do custom domain mapping. We can do SSL integration. You have the choice of either pushing your code. If you are a developer, you can deploy your code here, or else you can simply take a Docker container which is already there in your registry. So I am choosing your Docker container. The moment I choose your Docker container. You see one tab got extra added here. It's not there with code and it's there now. When it is Docker, I just need to choose what is the platform on which my Docker container is going to get created, Linux or Windows. I'll leave it as Linux. As usual, choose the region. For every app service to execute, it needs some infrastructure. And that infrastructure is borrowed on the basis of app service plan there, there are a lot of plans here and i can click on this change size and see here we can start actually with a free plan and go up to premium plans basically this is where the features supported by the app service will be decided what all features are supported right from basic starting with free basic standard premium so many options are available i'll just leave that as it is i'm not touching it and then go to the next tab you if you already have azure container registry in which your images are deployed you can just choose from that or if you have an image in docker hub you can take it from there but right now i'll go with simple quick start ngx linux we have selected so for linux Eng nginx nginx is the default web server used on linux and we will go with that and click on review and create and you'll see that in no time the app service is up and running you don't need to do any remote desktop login you don't need to install anything on that server some error has occurred Linux workers are not available in resource group okay These are restrictions which the, on the subscriptions which we are using. The validation is done. Now the resource will get created. And once it is ready, even you can actually try that URL. Everywhere in the world that URL will be accessible. Of course, right now it is Azure, oh, again failed. Mm -hmm. What is the reason? Website with given name already exists. So looks like somebody is practicing together with me as I'm teaching. And that person also used the same name.
so I go to app service I just want to confirm once that it's not conflicting with my own app service instance no anyways I told you that should be unique so I'll give you a one two three it has actually validated right now it is free but if you create before I click on create your name will take the precedence and it will create the app service and you can actually see here uh, I already have some app services running even the function app comes under the category of app service only actually so you can go to any of these you'll have the URL nginx server same thing, same steps I have put for this. So if you want, you can also try this URL. And it works. And just to give you a gist, I don't want to go into extreme depth. See, these are all options. You can do scaling, which is horizontal scaling, manual, auto, vertical scaling. You can increase the configuration, decrease the configuration, custom domains, SSL support, security, You can have concept of deployment slots. So many features. So that is the reason this has now become favorite of most of the developers. I can use Visual Studio. Just right click on the Visual Studio. And I mean right click on the project and say publish. The whole site will get published in few minutes. And I can test how my site would look like when it is hosted on internet without any extraordinary efforts basic things only we are doing that's it so that's the beauty of app service app service in which web app is hosted so we have looked at supplemental services and solutions which we have used for different purposes multiple hosting environments we have seen till now like this only different Azure management tools are available now what are these different Azure management tools see these are the tools using which we can actually control our Azure services right now I'm showing you everything is happening through Azure portal whatever we have seen is all through Azure portal but same things we can also do using Azure PowerShell commandlets so if you have even basic knowledge of PowerShell there is a PowerShell API provided which is most of the time generally used by the administrators for executing the command. I can create an app service using PowerShell. I can create an SQL database using PowerShell. Rather every service which we have created so far. Everything which we want to do on Azure. Guaranteed we can do it using Azure PowerShell. Probably certain features are not supported on portal because of the GUI limitation but through PowerShell guaranteed that can be achieved so PowerShell has been there since long time on Windows especially for administrators but at the same time on Linux people don't did not ever use PowerShell today of course PowerShell is available on Linux and Macintosh also but in the past people on Linux were used to using CLI commands shell commands so those things are now managed by Azure CLI, Azure Command Line Interface. 
so like we can do things using powershell we can also do things using cli and almost the same things can be done using cli also so you come from windows background you may prefer powershell you come from linux background you may prefer azure cli it's your choice you can use azure cloud shell actually in the portal only you have the option of going to cloud shell and here in the cloud shell you will get the prompt where your powershell commands can be executed it will do the configuration not only powershell commands even cli commands can be executed from the cloud shell it's initializing because i'm doing it for the first time type easy to use azure cli so this is powershell the context under which all my commands will execute you can change from powershell to bash where all the azure cli commands can be executed is it commands can be executed all these are commands you also have a azure mobile app in case you want to manage your azure infrastructure they have also provided it a mobile app and already i told you everything in azure can be also controlled through rest api and for most of the rest api not all of them again for most of the rest api there are c sharp class libraries java class libraries so i don't have to actually do a low level rest api program also i can simply make use of the c sharp class library create the instances of the classes and call their methods and most of it is done for us so that's the beauty of the rest api in azure there is a azure advisor this will definitely help us to improve our services which are deployed in azure the resources which we have created are they created in the right way or not are they ensuring that high availability is taken care of security is taken care of performance if at all can be improved if any cost uh, cost benefits can be given all these recommendations will be given by azure advisor so azure advisor is a service which is simply analyzing all the resources which we have created and is giving us certain built in recommendations for example i create a virtual machine and if i do not put it in the availability set azure advisor will tell me to create a virtual machine which will be in availability set so that in case of failure it is taken care of like that when i create a virtual machine i do not put firewall security would give me some recommendation about the firewall based on the kind of workload which is installed in the vm some kind of recommendation on its size will come for the performance and if there is any provision of saving cost even that recommendation would be given to us it will tell you how much cost we are going to incur right now but how much we can save also it will be giving us for if we implement this recommendations you have to just open the advisor and follow the recommendations and not necessary you must follow they are only recommendation they are not compulsions but following them will definitely keep us in a better shape so that now that we know we can create virtual machines using arm template using azure cli very quickly let us understand how we can do this
all these are the commands you have to execute in order so creating a virtual machine requires you to first create a resource group i'm not doing this i'm just showing you so this is the command which can be used for creating a resource group this is the command which can be used for creating a storage account where we would like to keep our image then certain networking resources have to be created some network security groups this is our next topic we are going to learn what is nsg and all that stuff then we have to create network interface card and finally comes the actual creation of virtual machine this is the main command which will create the virtual machine new azure rm vm so all these commands you can actually copy and paste in the cloud shell here you can copy and paste and make changes based on your requirement for example certain things are supposed to be unique for uh, for example storage account this name is supposed to be unique so if storage account name is already used by someone else we cannot use the same storage account name so you have to change this likewise if there is a virtual network no virtual network doesn't need to be changed that's fine that's all i think storage account name is the one which is supposed to be unique in this whole exercise we're not doing this quite advanced level but what i'm trying to show you is you can create a virtual machine using powershell like this like this only you can get cli you'll get cli commands these are cli commands az commands and we'll have the virtual machine created like this there is one more way which is called as arm 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 not given arm templates can also be used we'll cover probably in later later chapters how you can use arm template for creation of the virtual machine so i definitely what want you to practice these exercises at this point of time in case you have time i gave this url to you earlier also i'm putting it again on the chat so whenever you get an opportunity please go through this exercises small and simple ones for example if you want to create a vm with powershell they give you the sample you can copy and paste in case you are interested just do this do this and do this your vm will get created with all default options what i showed you is at the advanced level but this is going to work with all default options so please practice this these are the recommendations you will see after the vm is created you have to only go to the advisor just open the advisor blade and you will be able to see this so i will surely let you to practice not only this particular exercise all the exercises we have completed so far everything you should do it till here so that brings us to the end of module 2 and next we have to cover two other important modules security and pricing are the two major modules which we have to cover after this hello guys and welcome you once again to this series of az 900 azure fundamentals training so we have actually already covered the first two modules this is the third module in the series if you have missed my previous session i would request you to look at the description where you can find 
the link to the first and second module also so by chance if you are landing on module 3 i would request you to first go to module 1 look at that module 2 look at that and then come to module 3 so that you can have a proper continuity so what is this module 3 all about the core solutions we are talking about the core solutions in which we are going to have a very brief discussion on iot synapse ai ml very very brief after that we'll get into the management tools like how we can manage azure using portal powershell cli important tools are there like azure advisor monitor health service and so on but let's begin with the solutions the azure solutions which we have which will make our job easy are iot basically in iot we have got two things iot hub and iot central so what is iot hub what is iot central for what is azure synapse hd insight databricks what is machine learning cognitive services what are these bot services then we have to also discuss here the serverless computing solutions which is like azure functions and logic app then what is the importance of azure devops what is the role of github github actions dev test labs and so on but let's first begin with internet of things iot now what is this all iot about it's pretty common nowadays that we hear some devices capturing data now this device can be a camera or it can be some kind of sensor the sensor which detects what is the temperature out there or probably a sensor which detects the level of water in the overhead tank so there are devices which will capture data and this data they have to dump it some place so that an operation can be performed on that particular data imagine now i want to build a system where i have an overhead tank and the overhead tank should automatically get switched on when a water level goes beyond a particular limit below the particular level and obviously the motor should get switched on and then the motor should automatically get switched off when the water level goes to the i mean when the tank is full and again the level goes beyond a particular level i mean uh, height so how are we going to do this yeah there will be devices which will detect water whether it has touched that uh, level or not and then they will send signal this signal can be captured by an application and the application can then further send a signal to the motor for switch on and switch off so basically internet of things things are given now address the devices are now given some address some identification some kind of ip address based on which operations can be performed maybe i am having a mobile and i switch on my mobile uh, through my mobile i'll switch on the bulb in my room or maybe ac in my room so when i start from my office i want the room temperature to be controlled when i reach home i would just use that and control the temperature ac switch on switch off we can do so like this iot is all about controlling devices as well as taking input from the devices so we are talking about giving instruction to the device and taking instruction from the device basically it is a bi-directional communication but somewhere all the data has to be accumulated the signal which the device takes because of the environment in which it is has to be dumped at some other look some place that can be your iot hub so iot hub is a managed service which is of course part of azure cloud and that is the centralized messaging system all the messages from the devices will be dumped into that particular centralized messaging system from where probably the application can take it or another device can take the information and process it further yes i'm going to show a small demo of it of how the device can send a signal to iot hub but what is iot central now if you look at iot central it's again 
built on top of IoT hub. It's like multiple devices dashboard it is. IoT hub will have a device, multiple device, but a dashboard of multiple devices you can find in a IoT central. Now through this IoT central, you can monitor the device, you can manage the device, both the things you can do. You can manage in the sense, you can push some kind of software update to the device through IoT central. So it basically provides a UI which is easy to connect to the new devices and watch as they begin sending telemetry data or some kind of error messages into the system. So IoT central has a UI for managing multiple devices and these devices are controlled through IoT hub. So IoT central is built on top of IoT hub. So how do we actually use IoT hub? Now for this what I would do is take you to the control Azure portal again as usual and here type IoT hub go to the IoT hub create an IoT hub here a new hub has to be created into this hub of course you specify a resource group the region where you want the hub some name for the hub then you can leave the networking topic as it is go to management choose the pricing tier maybe standard a multiple pricing tier s1 is good enough number of s1 iot hub units basically for performance scalability throughput you need to set all this do a review and create it will take approximately 10 minutes 5 to 10 minutes it is going to take and you are going to have an iot hub which will be something like this i've already created the hub for demo purpose now into this iot hub the first thing we will have to do is add a device so go to iot devices and create a new device maybe you can give some name something like my device id or something based on the type of device you have to give the name actually speaking my camera device or my sensor device and so on the device when added here click on save will have a primary key and a secondary key auto automatically generated basically for this particular device we are going to have a connection string so you see i have already added a device here to save time so i go to device id and we will see here there is a primary key secondary key primary connection string secondary connection string enabled for enable connection to hub so what is this exact exactly now we have to actually run a small program in a device that means the device should have some operating system and in that operating system there should be ability to execute a program so those kind of devices we have to select here one such type of device is your raspberry pi raspberry pi is a hardware i'm going to a raspberry pi emulate simulator but otherwise raspberry pi is supposed to be a device like this which you can probably connect to your camera these are the different uh, pins on which we actually connect our hardware so maybe let us say an led is connected to the pins here so like that different different pins have different meaning there we are not getting into the details of programming raspberry pi but yeah, this is a sample program which comes with the emulator and this sample program is actually responsible for reading the signals. This program when run is going to read some signal and send it to the hub. But how does this program get connected to the hub? Somewhere this program has to get connected to the hub. 
you go to the device and capture the connection string copy the connection string come back here and here you have to paste the connection string so device is let's say my overhead tank which will have some sensor the sensor is connected to raspberry pi and raspberry pi is running this particular program this connection string i took and i placed here led signal in four times i don't want to get into explaining this particular program but at a high level it is sending the message it is sending the message to the hub developers will have to write this kind of code if you are going deeper into iot you have to definitely learn writing this complete piece of code now just say run the moment you say run the program is executing important thing to note here is sending message a message has been sent but where is the message sent the message is sent to the iot hub right two messages are basically sent you can send multiple see 8 7 8 9 10 11 to multiple messages in the loop are being sent unless i stop the messages keep will keep sending that's how the looping and all that beyond your scope at this point of time but yes you might have also seen the led glowing now how do we ensure that the messages have come here ideally speaking a java developer or a python developer or a dot net developer is going to stream this message from iot hub into their application and they would know this is the message which will come in json format they are going to write the code and process the application i mean process the logic that logic can be sending the signal to probably another device which again can be done via iot hub so iot hub is like a broker in between your device and the software application device has sent the instruction to the hub software application has taken the instruction from the hub software instruct software can give the instruction to the hub hub can send the instruction to the device so to confirm that iot hub really received the input you can actually go to the overview and see some kind of graph you see a graph has come messages used this is the quota of course the free account or this one account there is only one device some signal has come yeah i cannot show you the data here within the browser itself but yeah developers would be able to process all this and take it further so this is how you know that iot device and iot hub are connected through a connection string iot device is configured with something like a raspberry pi raspberry pi is the operating system which controls your device say for example a water level when it reaches a particular height i want motor to switch on so as soon as the lower sensor is touched that sensor will send the instruction to iot hub iot hub will be processed by a application which will send again the instruction to iot hub to switch on the motor so one device is receiving the signal which is water level and the other device is representing the motor two devices like that series of devices we can add actually speaking hundreds and thousands of devices are added to the hub and huge volume of data is captured and that volume of data all will get processed through the iot hub in background just a minute i power supply i have to take care
which are supported in Azure, the big data and analytics solution. See, what is happening is over a period of time, every organization is capturing huge amount of data. Suppose you are a developing, imagine a e-commerce solution for your business. You would want to know how many people have visited your website. From where did they visit the website? How many pages they have visited? On each page, how much time did they spend? What are the products they have browsed? How many products out of which they browsed, they purchased it? You want to now process all this data. All the data is captured. Okay, captured and maybe saved in your database. But now you want to process this data so that some kind of intelligence can be generated out of that data and you can do a push marketing to your customers. Probably most of you might have experienced when you go to Amazon and browse a particular uh, product, the information about that product will keep coming to you by email on a regular interval, unless probably you buy that product. How it is happening? And so many people across the globe, across the world are browsing so many different products. Yes, Amazon is capturing all this data, dumping it first into SQL Server, something like your SQL database. From SQL database, they will use some kind of ETL tools, which will be transforming that data into a special format and saved into something like data warehouse. Like SQL database is a service, SQL data warehouse was also a service in cloud which eventually is now referred as Azure Synapse. Now what Microsoft did is Azure Synapse, they made it as a centralized solution for doing multiple things related to data in Azure cloud. You can do transformation of data. You can do some kind of analysis on that data. You can restructure the data. Many things you can do in Azure Synapse. So that's why we say it is a cloud based enterprise data warehouse solution. Prior to Azure Synapse, we had HD inside Hadoop. Hadoop is actually an open source contribution, an open source product, which can again manage huge volume of data for us. Data which can probably go into terabytes, that kind of data we want to process. So we have Azure HD Insight. So yes, Hadoop is a open source tool. So analytics solution on Hadoop, if you want to process, you have to use the HD Insight service, which is in cloud. Similarly, if somebody has some kind of experience with Apache Spark, which is also again a data analytics solution, you'll have to make use of Databricks. In short, these are three common services which are majorly used for dealing with large volume of data, huge volume of data and doing some kind of analysis. Whatever data analysis we do here, we eventually view that using something like Power BI. So Power BI is a presentation tool which will connect to these services and extract the data from them and present it to us in some kind of graphical format. Yes, I would request you to definitely go into these services individually in detail from documentation or online in case you are interested. Likewise, if suppose you want to do some kind of machine learning. Now, what is machine learning? We learn from a pattern. We understand a pattern and from the pattern some kind of learning is going to happen. We feed in into the machine learning services so much data that machines will start predicting what is the outcome for this kind of input. For example, year by year, if you feed in the temperature of each day, probably machine learning can tell you next year what would be the temperature of the day at that particular point of time. You, you are basically training the system by giving some past data. So yes, Azure Machine Learning is again a cloud-based service where you can develop, train and deploy machine learning models. Of course, these models have to be 
developed by data scientists. Data scientists will develop these models and we view them or we use them in machine learning services, ML services in Azure. Then we have got cognitive services. Now what are these cognitive services? If I show a photograph, based on the photograph, it should detect what exactly is the photo about. Is it a computer? Is it a mic? Is it a shoe? Is it a person? And not only that, further information about that device also it should be able to extract. So if I take a photograph of my laptop and give it to the cognitive service, from the photograph it should be even able to predict that it is a Dell laptop or a HP laptop, what exactly is the size of it, that much information we can extract from the cognitive service for uh, images. Cognitive services are for voice also. For example, I can feed into the system voice of different people. So when I speak, automatically it will identify whether it is my voice or it is not. So cognitive services are basically for speech, for voice, then we have it for even um, OCR, optical character recognition, given image, from the image automatically it will extract the text and convert that into the text format. Image can be converted into text format. So these kind of things we can achieve with the help of cognitive services in Azure. Azure bot services. Nowadays, if you are a person who browse internet very frequently, you might be seeing chat service provided by a lot of websites. You key in the question and automatically the reply will come. And there need not be a person sitting on the other end. So one of the very common implementation of bot is ordering a pizza at home. You just say which pizza you want. You first choose a pizza. After that, the bot service will send you, okay, from this please choose which pizza you want. You select a particular type of pizza and then it will ask you, what is the address? Maybe it will ask more questions. So based on your input, the bot has been already trained to provide some kind of response. So it is an intelligent service which is supposed to be trained by our questions and the res responses and it will record all that so that in real life, the responses to the request can be done without any human interaction. So that is again a built-in service which is available in Azure, Azure Bot service. So these are all different different solutions to be used in different type of situations. Now what is this serverless computing? We might have heard of this word serverless computing quite often. So Azure functions and Azure logic app are two very popular computing solutions. Now what is this Azure Functions all about? See, if you have ever done programming in your life, you know that you are supposed to write a series of instructions in one function. Maybe if you have done C programming, you write main. And what do you write in main? Some statements. Now what are these statements going to do? When executed in sequence, they are going to perform a task. So what we are going to do now is, in Azure, we are going to use an Azure function. That means we are going to write code which can be in Java, C Sharp, Python, multiple languages are supported. We write as a function and run it as a background service. This particular function is supposed to be triggered based on certain events. Now what can be event? An event can be a new file has been uploaded into Azure Blob storage account. Or a message has been posted into a queue of a storage account. Or probably you can even use something called as event hub, little advanced service, so that as soon as you change the size of the virtual machine, automatically a message is posted into event grid which will trigger an Azure function. In short, an Azure function is a piece of code which is going to get triggered based on certain event. One of the common event is HTTP trigger. 
what is it i will give a url in the browser and when i say go automatically in background an azure function will get executed through that url so azure function is a piece of code which is residing in azure infrastructure and when it is residing in azure infrastructure it has no charge because it is going to acquire the infrastructure that means it is going to acquire the ram and the processor only on demand that is when an event occurs for which it has been returned so i write an azure function which has to trigger as soon as a message is posted into the queue suppose a message is never posted into the queue the function will never execute and we are not going to incur any charge it is not like your azure app service azure app service will have some app service plan and app service plan whether you use or not that website receives a request or does not receive a request in all circumstances there is going to be some base charge azure functions are serverless compute so who writes an azure function definitely a developer will have to write it what is that an azure function does it is a task which executes in background and that background task can be anything so that the foreground doesn't have to be impacted by the task i'll take a live example imagine i have a registration form and in the registration form we are supposed to enter first name middle name last name address blah 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 and also one provision is for photograph a user is supposed to provide his photograph and upload it now what is important is i want some intelligence in my code which will detect if this photograph is of that person only or not or if he is uploading a photograph of some celebrity maybe amitabh bachchan so i fill up the form and i submit a photograph of amitabh bachchan no i don't want my system which i am developing to detect i mean i don't want to save these kind of things so what i am going to do the foreground application will upload the photograph to the web based application maybe the web based application is an app service web app this application will post a message into a storage queue and will store the photograph into the block container very important understand this the photograph has been uploaded by browser to the web server on web server there is a program in execution the program will store the image the photograph into a block container and the url of the block container is stored let us say into a sql database and the same time a message is posted into the queue that a new photograph has been posted immediately this will trigger an azure function in background azure function in background will take the message maybe that will have the url of the photograph read from the blob storage pass it to the cognitive service cognitive service identifies that as a image of some celebrity and not yours and that response i will record it into the database and when the user and then the user will be forced to refresh the page is going to be automatically refreshed let us the moment the page automatically refreshes the user will be reported with an error saying that this protocol doesn't belong to you and you have to upload a new photograph or maybe the function what do will do what maybe take the large image and create thumbnail out of it or maybe the function will take the large image and put watermark on it and save it back into the storage so my website has done some kind of processing on, on the image but i don't want that processing to be done in the main application i want that to be done in the background and that's what i have achieved using azure function too much for a beginner to understand all this in short use azure functions for executing a background task which will be triggered based on some event an event can be many based on the situation good so azure function is one option similar to azure function is a logic app logic app is also a serverless compute solution that means here also there is no dedicated 
fixed amount of memory and RAM allocated. On need basis, it is going to be used by the Logic App and according to that, the charges will be there. But what is Logic App? Zero coding application. Azure function is purely a coding application. Developer will have to write. Logic App doesn't have, doesn't have a requirement of code at all. You can simply create a workflow, something like a flowchart you can create with different steps. Output of one step becomes the input of second step. Output of second step will become input of the third step. Of course, if third step needs, it can take input from the first step also. So every step is performing a task which can take input from all its earlier steps. One simple example I can do a logic app which I also demonstrate in my regular training. I have an SQL database table which have got many records and these records have to be fetched maybe on everyday basis and based on certain condition I would like to send email to all the people who are there in this particular record. Sending email I can do using Gmail. Fetching data I can do from SQL database for which connectors are provided. So we have got connectors. Using these connectors, I'll create a business process workflow so that one connector will fetch data from SQL server and put it in the logic app in memory. Second connector, which is used by the second task, will send email taking the data from the previous step output. Something like that. So yes, if you want to automate and orchestrate tasks, business process and create workflows, integrating different, different types of services, basically discrete applications if you want to integrate, yes, you can have Logic App. One of Logic App example can be tweets, automatically filtering negative tweets. I want to get the list of all tweets and figure out what all negative tweets are there and probably alert to the owner that these are the negative tweets. Negativity can be figured out with some negative words which can be a list pre-populated. Or you can, as soon as a document is put up in SharePoint, I would like to probably send an email to the document owner that a document has been uploaded. Or a simple example can be, you have an inquiry form on the web page. A user comes and post, post an inquiry form. Automatically, we want the sales team to get notified that a new inquiry has been posted. And at the same time, I want a confirmation message to the inquiry sent in reverse, in response. Okay, we have accepted your inquiry. We started processing it and somebody from my team is going to get back to you soon. Or maybe based on the data which is there in the inquiry form, we first decide should the salesperson A, salesperson B, salesperson C should be sent a notification. Notification can be email notification, can be an SMS notification. Not only that, Logic App goes even to the extent of having approvals needed. Manual intervention where a approval mail will be sent to the manager. Imagine a leave application has been put up by an employee. Immediately a mail will go to the manager where he will have to approve or reject. As soon as he will approve or reject, immediately a response will go to the team member that his, mail, uh, his leave has been approved or rejected. So these kind of workflows with zero coding, what is beauty is zero coding, we can do it with the logic app. So both are similar tasks. One is highly customizable because developers will do that. That is Azure function. And the other is we do it with some built-in connectors which are available for different types of tasks. So only those things for which the tasks connectors are available, we can achieve. Complicated logic will become quite difficult if you have to directly do it through logic app. Too much complicated logic. So when too much complicated logic comes into the picture, then we are supposed to go for Azure functions. So yes, 
I would like to quickly demonstrate to you how we can build an Azure function which is a HTTP triggered function. So go to the portal. Let's say we go to Azure functions. Basically, we have to create a function app first. Create a function app. We don't have a function app right now. We should create a new one. I'm selecting my resource group. How do you want the function app? You can choose that. Let's say I want it in .NET. You can choose the version 3.1, the latest, which is actually. Choose your location. And as your function has a requirement of storage account. This is basically needed because the definition of the function has to be stored somewhere. So I have an existing storage account. I'll use that only. Choose Linux or Windows operating system for your function. It's up to you. .NET is now Linux compatible too. And this is where you have to choose the consumption serverless pricing tier. But yes, there are certain limitations of consumption serverless pricing tier. If you want to overcome these limitations, you can definitely go for the app service plan or a premium plan of app service. So that's it. Rest of it, we can leave it default. This is going to create now an Azure function app. But the function app is a container for multiple Azure functions. The billing is going to ha happen at the function app level. The scaling, how many instances are needed, is also built in. You don't have to do that. The vertical scaling, the horizontal scaling, both are built in into Azure function. We as developer have nothing to do in that. So Azure function is going to not individually scale, but the function app is going to scale. Keep this point in mind. Overall, the whole function app, which is the host of your Azure function, will scale. That means two instances, three instances, ten instances. Those will be decided by the function app. Now let's go to functions. Right now there are no functions. I would like to add a function. And the beauty is we can do everything from portal itself. You don't even need to write code on your local machine in something like Visual Studio. You can do that if you want and real time probably we'll do that only. Oh, looks like they have removed the provision of writing code in the portal. Looks like they have removed the option. Earlier we used to write the function in the portal itself, but now we have to write the code in our Visual Studio Code editor on our local machine and then we have to upload it. So in Studio you will have to create a new project. I don't want to get into those details. That's too tough. Programming will get into. Through portal it would have been easy demo. So create a new project in Studio. In case you are a developer you might want to do that. There is a template called as function. A skeleton will be generated. And once you have the skeleton, you can even run the function locally on your local machine. After testing thoroughly, you can deploy the function. And the function would get added here. So the feature which they had support for writing the function within the portal itself looks like recently they might have removed it.
but yeah this is where you can write the function so i think we are decently good enough on this topic because programming is not part of this particular project scope and the function which we are going to write can be http triggered function so that's what is all about serverless compute now the devops solution develop your application with devops and github see it's all about automation nowadays automation plays a very very important role a project is built a project is deployed maybe first you are going to do deployment into a development server when everything is found right in development server you might want to move that into the qa server where testers are going to do the testing of the application when everything is found right in qa we would want to move that complete application into production we want to automate this whole process so to automate this whole process we are going to require a ci and cd pipeline that ci pipeline cd pipeline we call it as continuous integration continuous deployment that ci pipeline cd pipeline is built using azure devops so what is azure devops it is basically dev and ops collaboration dev stands for development ops stands for operations every organization has a set of developers who are going to build the application in their local environment and once the build has happened they have to deploy the application which has to be managed by a different set of people we call them as operations team the operations team is actually responsible for procuring the required hardware which in context of cloud can be virtual machines can be app services can be azure functions setting up the databases taking care of their scaling up and down earlier prior to devops there was a big wall which was separating both of these people developers will develop the application and they feel everything is right and then they say my job is done now it's the job of operations beyond the wall on the other side the operations get the output of the developer which they have to deploy and suddenly the bomb blast now who is supposed to be blamed should developer be blamed or the operations guy has to be blamed is it not developed right or is it not deployed right this is a big concern so what the modern development strategy strategy does is it will bring all the people on one table let them be your developers your testers your operations team people who are probably asking for development the stakeholders the team leads the project manager everybody comes and then do does a collaboration so definitely we need some kind of collaboration tool where the items to be developed has to be documented where a timeline has to be created where the test results have to be captured where the deployment should be automated azure devops is that kind of tool which is definitely not related to azure it's a separate portal azure devops is a completely independent portal you go into that portal and create pipelines which will connect your development code to the infrastructure in which they are hosted the infrastructure can be virtual machine app service function app kubernetes services any of those things which we have learned in the past what is github github is a source code repository see i am developing source code but i may not be alone developing it you might be doing development together with many other co developers so somewhere all this code has to be merged together i write few lines of code in one file my other developer writes few lines of code in another file like that somebody else will write some other piece of code in another file 
eventually all these have to be clubbed together and then the whole code has to be built together at the same time there can be bugs we need to manage those bugs and based on the bugs which are listed tasks have to be assigned to the developers these kind of things all can be done in github so github is a version control management system why version control today i write some code and i commit it to github tomorrow i make changes to that code and i de decide no 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 this code is not perfect my maybe yesterday's code was better so from github we can pull that yesterday's code so versioning is happening for every piece of commit which we are making into github and we can go back in time and recover that code which is perfectly working so version control is taken care of source code management is taken care of bugs and tax ma uh, task management is taken care of through github github also provides github actions for azure which is again something like devops only which will help us to automate software workflow to build test and deploy from within github that means you are not using azure devops now from github itself you would be able to deploy your code into azure services that's what is a separate category built github actions github dev test labs basically it is very easy to create environments where some kind of testing can be performed with certain limitations and when testing is all done we can destroy the complete environment very quickly so we are not wasting resources and we have complete control on the cost we can say only these sizes of virtual machines are allowed in this particular environment and only this much cost they can reach up to beyond that automatically the environment will get disabled <coughs> so these kind of setup can be created using dev test labs in azure wow so now that we know what all solutions are provided by azure different different context different solutions are provided let us understand the different management tools how can we manage azure yes we have already seen many places how azure portal can be used but at the same time you should know you can also manage azure using powershell as using azure cli using cloud shell mobile app for the portal we also have a azure mobile app so all these things can be used for managing azure in our day to day activity so yes this is the portal you have seen many times nothing new and in the portal you can go to this section cloud shell from within cloud shell you can execute powershell commands or you can execute the cli commands in general powershell was used by windows administrator and cli bash we call it was used by linux administrators that's how the trend has been always so taking time to load if you don't want to use this cloud shell you can definitely install the powershell modules and the cli modules on your local desktop and through that also you can connect and perform the operation so to execute the powershell commands here is where you can actually execute your commands now what is that we would like to do through the powershell or azure cli if you remember i told you there are arm templates which are there which will be executed those arm templates i can directly execute from here itself so 
what I would like to do is go to a URL. I've already copied that URL earlier. Microsoft has given a gallery of ARM templates, huge gallery, big gallery of ARM templates built in is there. In that gallery, deploy a simple Windows virtual machine is one ARM template. So this I would like to execute now. How will I do this? For this, we have to execute a command giving this particular URL, which is the URL of the JSON file. Browse on GitHub. Azure deploy.json. This is one file I need. This is an ARM template. You don't need to get into the details of this. It's a JSON document. And uh, here we also see a parameters.json file. These are the values for the parameters. So what I'm going to do is these two files I will first download into my local machine. How will I do that? Simple option would be look at them in raw format, copy and save it in some local notepad instance. So I'll call it as save. In my D colon itself, I'll write VM parameters dot JSON. And likewise, I go back to the GitHub. Look at the main template file. raw text and save this as vm dot json so one is vm dot json the other is vm parameters dot json these two files i'll upload here from my local machine I will upload them into the cloud shell. So in D colon, I have put vm.json. Likewise, I'll upload now from D colon vm parameters.json. And now we have to execute a command new az resource group deployment new az resource group deployment is the task i need some resource group so actually speaking let's even create a resource group through powershell first so new az resource group give a name for the resource group i'll give it as um, powershell rg and we have to give a location for the resource group let's say east us That's it. Name and location for the resource group. So what earlier I showed you creating a resource group to portal from here UI, I now created through PowerShell. So let's verify, did we get the resource group? So here we have resource groups. We'll get the list of all resource groups. PowerShell RG should be one of the resource group in this. 
not yet reflected. It will take time to reflect, but definitely it has to come here. Power cell R. In this particular resource group, right now there is nothing, it's blank. There are no resources. So I am going to run that template through a PowerShell command. New AZ resource group deployment. You don't have to remember all these commands guys. Just understand that these things can be done. That's it. Resource group deployment. Spelling mistake. Resource group deployment. Press tab. Type the partial uh, command and press tab. If it comes full, it is correct. First, I have to give resource group name. Resource group name. What is the resource group name? We have created this one PowerShell RG. Then we have to specify the template URI. Now what is the template URI? I uploaded the file which is vm.json and then we have to give parameter URI which is vm parameters.json. I am not very sure about parameter parameters let's try if it gives error we know that it's incorrect a parameter could not be found that matches parameter uri good even i don't remember the exact syntax it's parameter uri parameter url template file template parameter file vm parameters dot json that's it the template VM is not valid according to the validation procedure, the tracking ID, blah, 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 invalid domain name label. So here there is some domain name label used, which is invalid. I have to make editing to that. Public IP name. Some username, some password. Here you have to somehow ensure this is unique. Save it. But then I have to upload it again because I made changes to my local file. I have to upload it again into the cloud shell. We did not make changes to the template file, so no need to worry about it. So 
So now this will take some time and on completion you will see that resources are getting created here one by one. What are those resources? We are not so keen, we are not so much interested in that. Just wanted to show you this is how PowerShell commands can be executed. Similarly, if you have Azure CLI commands, then you have to switch to bash and from there you have to execute. So this will take time. I will let it go on in the background, but that is the idea. Through PowerShell, we will be able to execute. Through CLI, we will be able to create virtual machine. Through PowerShell, we are able to create virtual machine. I've already shown you through portal, you can create the virtual machine. Of course, the PowerShell command and CLI commands, instead of executing on your local host, you can execute in cloud shell. Microsoft has given a mobile application of Azure portal. You can install it on your mobile device and from there also you can connect it. All these are different options. Yeah, if you are a C-sharp programmer, Java programmer, you can use REST API. All this we have covered in the beginning. All these are going to ultimately send instruction to ARM. That's why we have seen ARM template being used. This is what just now I have demonstrated to you. Yes, you can actually install PowerShell locally. Create a resource group. I don't want to go more into details. This will take a lot of time. But yes, you can install PowerShell locally. Then I have shown you how through PowerShell resource group can be executed. I mean, resource group can be created. Virtual machine can be created. Now, when all these things are created, we need certain advisors. See, we may probably not make our virtual machine secure. We may probably not use virtual machine to its capacity. We may probably have created only one virtual machine and that can have problem with high availability. So we need some kind of, and it's not one virtual machine. I may create 500 virtual machines in my Azure subscription. Now I can't keep tracking each and every virtual machine every time. So Microsoft gives us a built-in service at no cost called as Azure Advisor. In background, Azure Advisor is doing an automatic analysis of all the resources which you have created. And from, those, from that particular analysis, it will create a report and give it to us. Like there should be at least two virtual machines created with a load balancer for the sake of high availability. That kind of recommendation will come here. I have not implemented firewalls. I have not implemented NSG rules. Basically, I have not protected the traffic inbound outbound from a virtual machine and many things similar to that security RAM. So it will tell me you can reduce the size of this virtual machine and save cost. So these kind of recommendations based on the best practices are given to the user of Azure so that the cost can be saved, security can be increased, I mean security can be made strong, performance of your application can be uh, improved, policies can be implemented in the organization, these benefits security, I mean Azure advisor gives us. Likewise, there is a monitoring service. Now what is this monitoring service? Every service which is hosted needs to be monitored. For example, I have created a virtual machine. I want to see now how much RAM of the virtual machine is used. How much uh, capacity of the processor is used. 
and on reaching a particular level of ram or processor for example as soon as 80% of cpu is used immediately i want an alert to be sent to me so that i can act i can act and probably either increase the processor capacity or i scale horizontally by adding one more virtual machine so we need to do this kind of monitoring monitoring of availability and performance of the application two factors ensuring that the virtual machine is ready and running and it is optimum performance both we would like to take care of so what is happening is all these resources which are in azure are constantly generating logs log data is generated and we can view those logs in our portal itself for example i can take you to portal and show you let's say the vm itself if suppose i use the vm regularly i am going to find see powershell this is the resource group in which all the resources got created including this simple vm and if that vm was in use if there is some workload you can go to azure monitor there are monitoring services and look at the metrics what metrics you want to look at maybe the cpu used or memory in use or how many read write operations are happening all these are different metrics percentage cpu which is simple to everyone so right now you see there is no load you can probably go back in time in last 24 hours last 30 minutes up to 30 days you can see the performance and as you are storing all this data we are not going to be charged for this particular analysis here the graph will be there the cpu usage so if i know my cpu usage is very close to 100 i can take an action because beyond 100 it might crash certain application so i to take an action we need to create alerts those alerts also can be created a new alert can be created here and in the alert we will say this person should be sent sms this person should be sent email like this alerts have to be configured and of course they are all charged alerts are not free alerts are all charged whenever an average percentage cpu is greater than i can define the number at a high level i'm showing you all these guys we don't want to dig into the minute details i just want you to know that yes there is a monitoring service and monitoring service can help us in capturing the data in the logs and these log data can be used for alerts based on which a person can take an action there is an application insight which basically captures the telemetry information from where is the traffic originating how much user is execute how many say is the same user submitting multiple request where is the bottleneck in our application if there are errors where is the error in the application lot of this kind of information will be captured by application insight log analytics is another very powerful service where huge volume of data can be dumped in for a longer period of time i showed you monitor can do it only for 30 days but what if i want 6 months data yes you can capture all the data and dump it into log analytics probably from 100 virtual machines or 1000 virtual machines and in log analytics there is a provision to write queries we can write statements which can fetch the data based on certain condition and also we can see that in the graph you have seen alerts already i showed you it can be sms alert it can be email alert it can be invoking a azure function launching a logic app all these things can be done 
some kind of automation also can be performed azure gives you a provision where you can create dashboard and on the dashboard various metric graphs can be added so here only you see suppose this metric you are seeing now imagine this metric you can put it on the dashboard pin it to dashboard you can choose whether it is a shared dashboard or a private dashboard so you don't have to go to each service and see on the dashboard itself all the important services and their graphs can be presented and one person can be probably monitoring the dashboard only maybe a larger screen can be used where the dashboard is monitored so that will give you complete status of all the services at one place so very important service as your monitor which is used internally as your data centers are managed by microsoft across the globe but possibility is there that there are some issues in those data centers because of some reason the data center has gone down or probably is going to be uh, having some kind of maintenance on a planned date and time these kind of things if you want to see you can find in azure service health if there was any impact to any of the service which you have provisioned maybe you created a storage account in west us and that storage account disks have crashed you can go to azure service health and there it will show you you see availability issue for the storage account this is the service and for 3 hours there was a problem with it so microsoft being very is being very transparent in showing you any kind of services which are going into some kind of downtime or getting impacted because of some activity in their data center service health is the service which will give us that information when is the issue going to be resolved even that information will be present provides personalized view of the health of azure services and the regions being used regarding outrages planned maintenance other health advisories all this will be available to you in service health you have already seen arm template which is basically a json file many times i have shown to you it's not a program it's not a c sharp program or vb program or a java program that's why it is called as declarative syntax advantage of arm template is if you write an arm template for creation of let us say 10 resources and when you execute the arm template for the first time maybe five resources got created but the other five could not get created because of some problem what you have to do is in the same arm template in those five resources where there is problem make changes and re-execute the whole template as it is. The resources which were already created will remain untouched and the new resources will get created. That is the beauty of ARM template. Basically, it will do incremental deployment. Yeah, you have a choice. You can say all the existing resources should be deleted and everything should be freshly created. That control you can have if you want to. But by default, it does incremental deployment. And not only that, the beauty of ARM template is for the existing resources, if you change some property through ARM template, that property also will get uh, reflected in the portal. For example, if you are using app service and if the app service is using S1 pricing tier, you want to now change it to S2. In the ARM template, you change S1 to S2, re-execute, the pricing will automatically, the pricing tier will automatically change. So these kind of benefits ARM template gives to the developers, to the operations team when executed. So instead of executing 
task for each resource which is done in the past now a single template is submitted where the manager will capture and execute it built in validations are there and what more arm templates we have seen are controlled through parameter files so same environment same template i can use it in multiple environments i can use it in dev environment with certain parameters same template i can use it in qa environment with different set of parameters <clears throat> or the same template can be used in production environment again with a different set of parameters so different parameters same template can be used for multiple environment creation so yes that's the beauty of arm template you don't have to write programming commands you don't have to write sequential instructions in powershell for creating individual resources collectively you can do it all together so yes with this we come to the end of module 3 relatively little complex but yes we have seen the core azure services you don't have to get into the details of these services just know when to use which one what is arm what are the different monitoring tools and that's it again as usual guys a strong advice for you to go to azure a to z.com hello guys good evening and today we are going to look at the module 4 in az900 as your fundamental course security and mind you security is such an important topic that microsoft has a dedicated certification for this particular uh, only security aspects yes because we now have our workload not in our data center all our applications now are deployed in cloud definitely security is going to play a very important role so what all microsoft does to ensure that our workloads our data our applications all these things are going to become secure is what we have to see in this particular session of course at a pretty high level we are going to cover all these things so what are the module outline in this particular module we are going to cover what is a security center and the resource hygiene later we will understand what is a key vault and dedicated host of course after this we are going to work with the network security defense in depth nsg and firewalls ddos protection these are the topics we are going to look at yes in security tools and features first we will begin with azure security center basically how security center will ensure the policy compliance the security alerts the security score resource hygiene about sentinel key vault dedicated host one by one we have to cover all these topics see what is that we are going to do in azure in azure we are creating resources the resources can be virtual machines can be sql database can be a storage account there are different types of resources we are going to create in azure and these resources all need to be secured now what exactly we mean by this secured basically we have to protect them from malwares we have to protect them from unauthorized access some kind of hacker trying to get into it probably those things are going to happen only when there is kind of vulnerability in our infrastructure or in our pass services so security center is a built in service into microsoft azure and is for monitoring services what services can be virtual machine can be uh, app service database storage so is for monitoring services 
that provides threat protection across both Azure and on-premise data center. That means your virtual machines can be in your on-premise or they need not even be virtual machine. They can be physical servers. Not only that, Azure Security Center even ensures that if your workload is in AWS or GCP virtual machines, Azure Security Center also takes care of those virtual machines. So yes, Azure virtual machines, non-Azure virtual machines and on-premise data centers virtual machines all are taken care of by Azure Security Center. So yes, there are three things which Azure Security Center is going to help us with. Strengthen security posture. What exactly is security posture? See, all these devices, all these services which are created in our environment, we need to ensure that are properly configured and they are not deviating from a recommendation which is provided by Microsoft for ensuring that they are secure. One simple example if I take, if you have an Azure Active Directory, there should be at least two administrators which are global administrators. But at the same time, there should not be five and ten global administrators. So these kind of things are going to be considered when Microsoft Azure Security Center is going to assess your security posture of the complete subscription. So yes, there will be some kind of assessment done in background, which is built in. You don't even have to do anything. And as a result of that assessment, we are going to get some security recommendations. For example, if a virtual machine is created, the virtual machine disk should be encrypted. That's a security recommendation. If a virtual machine is existing without NSG, Network Security Group, that means there is no control on inbound onboard traffic, a recommendation will be provided to you. So these kind of assessments are going to be done by security center and given to us as a recommendation. Not only that, it will automatically protect from the threats. That means it is going to automatically detect any kind of malware attack and stop them. And not only stop, it can also raise a security alert through which we would know, okay, something like this is happening and immediately we can probably take the next action. So yes, it can detect and block malware as well. Analyze and identify potential attacks. Just-in-time access to the port. Now what is this just-in-time? It's a little complicated subject. Basically what it in short means is, suppose you have a virtual machine. Now you want to do an RDP to that virtual machine. So for doing an RDP to that virtual machine, we need to open the port number 3389 if it is Windows box. And if you want to use SSH, SSH login on a Linux box, we have to open the port number 22. Now instead of keeping this port 22 and 3389 permanently open, we can configure in such a way that on demand, when we need to do a remote desktop or SSH session to that virtual machine, that point of time only, we open those ports and these ports also automatically gets closed after a particular while, maybe two hours, three hours, automatically they would get closed. So instead of keeping the virtual machine vulnerable from internet attacks completely throughout its lifetime, only for a short period of time we are keeping it open. So these kind of things we achieve using just in time access control for ports. Security Center also helps us in implementation of policies. So how are those policies implemented? So what exactly the policy first? Every organization has certain governing instructions. I mean, there are certain uh, basic rules which have to be implemented. So there are six there are policies which are created for this. Actually, this particular topic we are going to cover much more in detail in the next chapter. 
governance but yes there are policies which are created in azure these policies are well implemented and ensure that compliance is taken care of can be done through azure security center you can have some kind of uh, uh, what i would say that uh, agent software you can have an agent software installed on virtual machines with the help of policy and that agent which is running on that virtual machine will continuously analyze that virtual machine and will submit the data which can be saved in another service in azure called as log analysis so we want as soon as a new virtual machine is created automatically that agent software should be installed on it these kind of things can be achieved using policy compliance yes continuous assessment can be done wherein a new deployed resource ensure that they are configured properly exactly the same thing which i said as soon as a new virtual machine is created through a policy some agent software is installed on that machine certain additional utilities are installed on that machine these kind of things can be taken care of through security center tailored recommendation recommendation based on existing workloads and instructions on how to implement them threat protection uh, i explained earlier in the slide you can have some alerts raised as soon as a vulnerability is detected or some kind of hacking is happening on your virtual machine immediately an alert is raised these kind of things can be done so now just to give you a gist of i mean theory will not make you more confident than probably a demonstration so now go to azure security center this is azure security center so first thing we will have to do is enable azure security center on the account you see this is actually a dashboard of the security center these are all different services which can be protected SQL database, storage account, container registries, Kubernetes service, virtual machines, app services. All these are different services. Now you can go to recommendations, and over here you might want to see some recommendations. Not many here because this particular subscription doesn't have resources. Let me switch. i believe so i go to security center go to recommendations and you'll see a series of recommendations all these are recommendations so it has done an assessment of different resources total 26 resources assessment it has done of which it has declared 8 as healthy for 8 it is not applicable grayed out and 10 are declared as unhealthy now in this unhealthy these are the things to be taken care of so enable mfa mfa actually stands for multi factor authentication mfa should be enabled on accounts with owner per permission on your subscription owner is considered to be the highest role anybody can have in a subscription so if i give owner role to someone they can do everything with my subscription create any resource delete a resource grant permission to others everything can be done so that is a little risky role if you just give it to somebody whom you who is not reliable or if somebody hacks it and gets the permission of that particular user likewise you're not supposed to have 
MFA should be enabled on accounts with right permissions on your subscription. For example, you are not supposed to have more than two or three owners on a given subscription. So these are all recommendations which are provided. Like this it can go on. All these are recommendations which are provided. And based on implementation of these recommendations, something very important, you are going to get a score. And overall, there will be a secure score which will be indicated here. So right now the score is just 10 of the 56 points, which is pretty low. Total maximum points which we can achieve is 56. But what we have got is 10. And this 10 has been accumulated by implementing those security recommendations and we can further increase the score by implementing these recommendations. See because of this we got the scores. Some blue color ones all this together have contributed to total score right now which is 10 which is only 70% of the 56. Start implementing one by one all this and you will see the score is getting increased. Your aim should be to get a score as close as possible to this 56. And 56 is what? Total number of resources. 10 is how many resources are unhealthy. So basically it's a ratio. It's a ratio between healthy to overall, I mean, un, uh, yeah, healthy to the overall resources. So score is calculated. Then you can see security alerts if any. All these are security alerts with the severity are indicated to us. And these security alerts can come as email to us if configured properly. You can see the list of all devices or services which are being monitored in the inventory section. And here only you can add non-Azure server resource. For example, you can add on-premise virtual machine or you can add a AWS machine. So these are all different pieces which a security administrator, there is a role in Azure called as security administrator, which is going to look at and ensure that everything is perfect. Here only you see there is a security policy stuff which I was talking about. The security policy has to be implemented on a particular subscription. So on this subscription, this is the security policy which is applied. These are all regulatory standards. These are all standards which are taken care of. You can add your own custom standards also. So by default, Azure is going to give us pre security center service but then you can upgrade to implementation of azure defender so azure defender when you enable i have enabled actually azure defender on this particular subscription for your demo and this is valid for 30 days free trial after 30 days unless i make it paid service it will get disabled so the default implementation which is free only takes care of the security policies implementation. But if you want to take care of the workload, if you want to take care of the alerts and if you want all the advanced features to be implemented, then you have to enable Azure Defender in your security center. So there are few services which are free, there are few which are paid that is not relevant to you at this point of time but yes azure security center is like a service which is integrated into your subscription by default giving you the detailed information about the possible vulnerabilities which exist in your set of services also will prompt you and not only that it will also mitigate the problems in certain cases through the policies implementation so this is all about Azure Security Center. Then there is a service called as Azure Sentinel. Now what is this Azure Sentinel? 
basically it can take care of collect detect investigate respond four parts very straight collect collects data across all users devices applications and infrastructure it will collect all the data as your sentinel is a service again this will collect all the data first and then detect from the data which it has collected it's going to detect threats and minimize any false positives using some kind of analytics so there is some machine learning which is automatically happening internally which will help it to detect any kind of false positives then investigate threats and hunt for uh, suspicious activities and finally if there is a suspicious activity it is going to respond by invoking some kind of workflow which can be a logic app automatically it will launch a workflow a logic app workflow can be launched so yes it is again a very important service which the security administrator is going to use for ensuring that your subscription posture is pretty well maintained with good score yes it can even connect to various other services like office 365 as your active director these are all services external services these are so sentinel will be used for connecting to those external services and performing or passing data about whatever it has uh, collected it can pass that data to those services to perform further actions then we have got another important service which is as your key vault see it is very simple why would i have a bank locker when i can preserve the jewelry and documents maybe at my home also why would i put it in the bank locker simple bank locker is more trustworthy it has implemented certain protocols so that it's not easy for somebody to simply break the locker and steal the things within it so like that only in azure we have got a key vault service we call it as azure key vault service and this azure key vault service is responsible for hosting three things one is secret another is key and third is certificate three things it is going to host secrets keys and certificates now what is a secret any kind of secure information for example from my application i want to connect to database i would need connection string so connection string i can store it as a secret in key vault or i want to access files in my storage account for which we need access key so access key can be a secret in a key vault in short any kind of key value pair any kind of name and value pair which we want to store it securely and on demand fetch it from it and use it in our application those kind of things are referred here as secrets so a secret can be stored in key vault second is keys now these keys are generally used for encryption and decryption of data i want to probably send data from one location to another location i would want to encrypt the data and then send it so that on wire so somebody should not be able to hack it or i want to persist the data in the file system or i want to persist the data let's say in azure storage and i don't want anybody to simply read the content of that file on my local file system or in storage so there also we can make use of the azure keys so key is basically for encryption and decryption purpose third is certificate what is certificate for basically for one's identity so if i want to perform an action i can identify myself as it's me with the help of a certificate the certificates can be self signed certificate certificate can be a 
signed certificate, authority signed certificate who are more trusted. So somebody will endorse me that I am Sandeep Soni and I will carry that certificate and come to you because it is endorsed by a person who, whom you also trust. Yes, you will take that certificate and give me the access to the resources. So keys, secrets and certificates is what we are going to put in as your key vault. The key vault is secured by hardware security modules, HSM modules they are called. They make the breaking of key vault more difficult, rather impossible. Storing secrets, keys and certificates are almost impossible when they are stored in key vault because it is protected by hardware security module, HSM modules we call it. So yeah, very quickly we can actually look at how to create a key vault and put a secret in the key vault. Go to Azure key vault. Create a key vault service. It's going to take some time also, but that's fine. You have a standard pricing tier and premium pricing tier. Premium pricing tier are the ones which are supported by HSM. Whereas standard pricing tier doesn't have that HSM support. It's cheaper. There is a protection of soft delete and purging and the most important is the access policy here we have to add the users who will be able to perform these operations on the keys all these are different operations which can be performed on keys these are the operations which can be performed on secrets and these are the operations which can be performed on certificates key vault at times can be even used for encryption of a disk of virtual machine so in that case you have to put a check mark here like that for for logging into as your virtual machine you might use a key vault you might want to use a key vault in creation of certain resources through ARM template so in that kind of cases we have to enable these options otherwise not required and in the recent times key vault also supported Azure role based access control. It was also not something which was supported in the past only now Key Vault has support for role based access control. What is this we are going to cover in our next chapter. So now that we have Key Vault and blah 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 story just do review, review and create it will take some time and the Key Vault would be ready. And in that Key Vault I will show you we can add a secret but of course I cannot demonstrate retrieving secret to you because for that you need to write code it can be C sharp code it can be Java code you have to write code and retrieve the secrets from the key vault it's going to take time so let's move to the next topic dedicated hosts now what are these dedicated hosts see we know that virtual machines are created in the infrastructure of Microsoft data center and that infrastructure is shared by all you create your virtual machines in that infrastructure I will also create the virtual machines in that same infrastructure but now we have a provision to create dedicated host in Azure where the hardware itself in physical form will be dedicated to your organization or your subscription I can say. What is the advantage? Virtual machines created by you in that dedicated host will not exist together with other virtual machines. It's like dedicated hardware. It's like a private room given to you. Instead of the public, it is a private room which is given to you and only your virtual machines would exist on that particular hardware. What are the benefits? Yes, hardware isolation is the first major benefit. My hardware 
because it is completely isolated from your hardware i can perform the maintenance as per my requirement microsoft does actually plan maintenance of the hardware on a regular basis but microsoft will define the timeline when they are going to do the maintenance in their infrastructure and in general we have to abide by it but when we have a dedicated host we can control the maintenance we can say okay microsoft i am okay to do maintenance at so and so date and time please go ahead and do it we can control that that is the basic advantage of the dedicated hardware for us and not only that you can even use with azure hybrid benefit now is this azure hybrid benefit you might have already purchased certain licenses maybe for windows or maybe for sql server you might have already purchased certain licenses for your on premise on premise for uh, physical machines in your own data center you have got a licensed sql server which is quite expensive and you want to use that license in cloud also there also this benefit is going to be useful dedicated host is going to be useful so yes a dedicated host is a host which is a physical machine or physical server which is used in data center of microsoft and is only dedicated for one organization so let us see by now probably the key vault should be ready yep the key vault is also ready and here we can see there is an option keys can be added secrets can be added certificates can be generated or even you can upload certificate so i go to secrets and i add a small secret maybe sql connection string and the string can be server is equal to my server semicolon username is equal to something password is equal to something you can't even read you can definitely do this you can specify when should this particular uh, secret become available before this date it would not be available to the developers also and when should this secret expire you can control that you can set the activation date and expiration date both can be set up you can then say create so now a secret is created security sql connection string is created and every secret which is created is given a version now i can't edit an existing secret so if i want to change the value what shall i do simply generate a new version you can change the value and give a different value for the same name you can because i have got permission i am actually the owner of this particular key vault right now i can go to the secret and i can view the value here i can view the value which is the current value every secret key is given a secret and key is given a url this url is what we are going to provide to the developer this is the url of the secret wherein this is the version of the secret this is the name of the secret secrets like that keys will be there and you can then put the name of the key and the version of the key also so reminding you key vault is like that bank locker where when keys secrets and certificates are placed it's considered to be highly secure and lot of services in azure will directly connect to the key vault and read the data we just need to upload it and we are done so that's the beauty for example i can create a key here and this key i can say encryption key for vm i can simply create it and then say that 
the virtual machine is supposed to use this particular key for encrypting the data on its disk and we don't have to do any programming simply configure the virtual machine connecting to the key vault and that's it we are done so these kind of benefits we are going to get because of key vault and dedicated host also ensures you get dedicated hardware where your virtual machines can be created which are going to give you the benefit of hardware isolation controlled maintenance and the benefit of hybrid licenses which you may have in your organization network connectivity okay we have seen earlier only that a virtual machine is created and is in network with other virtual machines which are created and for all these things there is a vnet created virtual network so how are these resources in the virtual network secured how is our virtual machine secured what is the role of nsg firewall what exactly is this bdos stands for what is exactly the purpose of it let's understand this more in depth so first is all about defense in depth ultimately aim of every hacker remember aim of every hacker is to reach the data which is managed managed by your application because everything is in data if my application is recording user details maybe that user details would have some credit card number maybe there will be some kind of password or some kind of secured information that information is what a hacker is actually interested in what we have to do is implement security at multiple layers at each layer there is a security implementation going to happen that means a layered approach is supposed to be used for securing your computer basically your data in that computer how is this going to be implemented at each layer there are different options available at physical security yeah your data center security that is there will be people who are protecting your data center and they would not allow anybody to randomly get into the data center basically it is a physical security rest all is digital security any kind of attack which happens on one layer is isolated from the subsequent layer a hacker will have to hack each layer to reach till here which is going to be made more and more difficult by different security implementations so azure provides us shared security model now what is this shared security model certain things have to be taken care of by microsoft and certain things we take care of see if you are having a on premise data center you are supposed to take care of all the aspects whether it is data center security network security host which is a virtual machine security operating system level security network control basically what should be allowed what should be denied the application username and password security identity and directory infrastructure access management who can do what if user is a he can do these things user is b he can do these things the urls which are accessible to the user and not accessible to the user and of course ultimately the data all the implementations are supposed to be taken care of customer in on premise data center but if you are using azure and if you have used some infrastructure as a service for example virtual machine the implementation of security layer for the physical data center network and host is taken care of by microsoft and rest all you will have to take care of you have to ensure that the operating system password is not leaked you have to ensure that somebody has not got access to your application or its url or its 
identity for of the user you have to take care of all these things in case of pass network control application identity and directory infrastructure is taken care of by v and microsoft it's a collaboration actually that's why it is shared security model operating system is also secured completely by microsoft whereas in saas up to application microsoft takes care of above application who has which identity for example if i want to use office 365 sandeep soni at techensoft.com will be my user id and what is the password of course the application has to take care of these things so these are different ways this all yellow color this is actually the benefit which microsoft is giving to the cloud consumers so let us see few things nsg network security group what exactly is this actually we have done this topic if you remember for a virtual machine we are supposed to use a port number 3389 and this port i actually opened in nsg which was attached to a virtual machine let me show you this i'll take you to the virtual machine which we created earlier and in the virtual machine you will find networking all these are different rules which are created in nsg which is associated with this virtual machine nsg stands for network security group what it says is if a request comes from any location and if it is for any destination if it is for port number 3389 which is port number of rdp allow access likewise if a request comes into the virtual machine destination let's say in this case is virtual machine from anywhere and if the request is for port number 80 allow access within vnet a request originating in vnet and also going to another resource within vnet allow access from load balancer allow access everything else deny access so right now if my virtual machine has a software which runs on let's say port number 25 ftp software file transfer protocol which is basically used for uploading files downloading files you have a software installed on the virtual machine which runs on port number 25 will i be able to use it no i will not be able to use that virtual machine because the port number 25 is not open i'll practically demonstrate this to you i have actually stopped the virtual machine let me start it it will take a minute to start the virtual machine once the virtual machine is started i go to its public ip address this is the public ip address of that virtual machine we'll see actually once started the status will change to running and then it will be assigned a public ip address now this is the public ip address copy this put it in the browser and you see i am able to visit the web server which was installed on that virtual machine why because the request was sent by default on port number 80 now what i'll do i'll delete this rule http rule i'm deleting it off simply delete it the moment i delete this rule you now notice that i have to wait i have to wait couple of minutes before this rule gets applied and after the rule is applied you will not be able to browse this website it will be blocked maybe i can try on it can be coming from cache also certain times it's still working it takes couple of minutes that's what i have noted earlier so we just wait a minute or two and after that go to this website and figure out that we are not able to access it why we are not able to access it because we are not providing port number 
right now we are able to do rdp to this virtual machine because of this port number which is part of nsg rules these are all inbound rules like that outbound rules are also there and you notice in outbound rules any to internet is there that means from a virtual machine we are able to access internet by default all virtual machines in azure infrastructure can connect to internet if you don't want you can't delete this rule you have to create a new rule with i just show you any source destination is internet and port number is anything and simply use the word deny so when you do this you get a new rule added here which overrides this and that i have said is deny so now you will notice in short time yep the new rule is added see any protocol internet from this virtual machine internet will not be accessible anymore now let's come back here and try to refresh by now it should be okay open a new browser that's better because caching will be there otherwise and that's it i'm not getting the page why because port number 80 has been deleted in the set of allow it is not there so default it will go to the last tool which is deny so precisely this is this is what is the purpose of nsg set inbound and outbound rules to filter by source and destination ip address port number and protocol source ip destination ip source port destination port and protocol these things are used for denying or allowing access add multiple rules that's what i have shown to you azure applies default baseline security rules to new nsg Bas basic rules are there by default we can add extra rules override default rules with new high priority rules that's what i showed you how you can override by creating new rules nsg works with only ip address but what if i want to block the traffic from my virtual machine based on domain name let's say the virtual machine should be able to access google.com microsoft.com but should not be allowed to access facebook.com or should not be allowed to access twitter.com so those kind of rules if you want to implement you have to bring azure firewall into the picture azure firewall is a service which is very similar to nsg that means based on the origin ip destination ip port number we can allow and deny besides precisely whatever i have shown to you earlier same thing you can do here additionally what we can do restrictions can be put up on a virtual machine outbound traffic based on domain name that is one extra feature which can be enabled here it has built in high availability that means what firewall service will never fail even if one service fails microsoft will ensure that automatically a clone of it gets created and the traffic will go through that clone resiliency is a built in feature we don't have to implement anywhere we don't have to take care of the resiliency of the firewall unrestricted cloud scalability imagine your server is getting huge amount of traffic initially it might be getting 1000 users but now imagine suddenly 1 lakh users are coming to your server at a time you don't have to worry about it scalability is built in into azure firewall automatically it will scale the required amount of resources so that no user is going to simply get a error response because the large number of users are existing and moreover everything which is happening in firewall allow deny request is all logged in azure monitoring service so we have seen earlier azure monitor we can use azure monitor to view the complete log of the traffic which has gone through the firewall so azure firewall is one very important service then there is one more service called as application gateway application gateway also provides to an extent 
the feature of Azure Firewall, but more importantly, it is implemented at layer 7. If you somehow know OSI layers, 7 layers, the layer 7 is what is application gateway. Most important aspect of it is web application firewall, WAF. This web application firewall gives protection to our websites from maybe something called as SQL injection. Somebody trying to break your database using uh, vulnerable queries. Those can be blocked by WAF. CQRS request can be blocked by WAF. I mean, in short, application layer protection can be given through the application gateway which internally has a built-in web application firewall which is dedicated to only web-based applications. Keep in mind, this is for pure web-based application. Whereas this firewall can be for not necessarily only web-based, it can be any kind of protocol which can be supported there. DDoS, Distributed Denial of Service Protection. What is this actually? Denial of service. What does it mean? From one machine, I am generating so much traffic onto a web server that all requests are going from my machine and other requests are getting uh, timed out. Let's say I am a bot. I will generate so many requests and make the server busy that the original request will literally get terminated or they will never reach the server or they would simply time off. When these kind of things happen from multiple locations, I run bots at different places in the world and from different places across the world. I am sending traffic to the same server. I can make the server so busy that genuine request on it will get blocked. So these kind of attacks are called as DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service. Azure virtual networks have built in ability to block such kind of attacks. You don't have to do anything rather the basic version of DDoS is absolutely free. Automatically it will detect that the traffic is not coming from a genuine user but from a bot. Attacker is a bot and it will block that traffic. Only what is genuine, this blue color is genuine, that will go in, rest all will be blocked. As your backbone has been pre-programmed to do all that stuff for us. So sanitize unwanted network traffic before it impacts server availability. Server availability means ensuring that the server is available to our request all the time, high availability. Basic tier is automatically enabled, but you can enable standard service tier, which is cost. You have to pay for it. For mitigating uh, mitigation capabilities that are tuned to protect virtual network resources. Some extra benefits you are going to get in the standard service. And also the reporting is far better in standard service. You can know from where did the attack actually origin from. Such kind of information you are going to get in standard service. But most of the time the basic service would be sufficient if you are not having it too much complicated workload or web server. So DDoS attacks are implemented. So yes. Combining network security solution, NSG, with Azure Firewall. We do combination of all these things. The perimeter security, the physical security is taken care by DDoS protection and Azure Firewall. NSG takes care of at this layer, network layer. NSG is at this place. Networking layer only permits traffic to pass between network resources with NSG, inbound and outbound. So network layer comes NSG, remember this. Perimeter layer has DDoS protection and firewall. Identity access is implemented by something called as Azure AD. Azure Active Directory is used for 
identity and access management. Physical security is the security guards which will ensure that the data center is secured. So at different layers it is implemented. I already finished this, creating a network security group. Inbound port number, allow RDP, instead I showed you HTTP. So we are almost done with this. I don't have to demonstrate this once again. I have also completed actually how we can do outbound security port rule to deny internet access. This also I completed for you people. So this is how security at a very high level is implemented in Azure. And that brings us to the end of a module where we have learned about security center, key vault, dedicated host, defense in depth, basically multiple layers, how the security is implemented through different services and DDoS protection. Hi guys, back again. This time we are going to discuss module 5 of AZ900 Azure Fundamentals. So in this particular module we are going to cover identity, governance, privacy and compliance. So yeah, what exactly is the agenda? Overall we are going to discuss here Azure Identity Services. Basically we will understand what is authentication and authorization and mostly things will revolve around Azure AD. Followed by that the governance features basically we are going to discuss about how permissions can be granted to the users, how the resources can be locked and provided with tax, how we can create policies for a particular organization and reuse most of these policies, resources, RBAC with the help of blueprint and so on. And finally the privacy statements. So first, what exactly are the identity services? For this we have to understand at a very high level the difference between the two keywords authentication and authorization. Now what is authentication? See if I tell you I am Sandeep Soni, you will ask me prove it. Now how do I prove it? Probably I take a ID card issued by some government authority which can be my Aadhaar card, which can be my passport, which can be my driving license and that is going to carry my photograph along with my name and of course endorsement by a government organization. So the process of identifying what someone himself or herself claims to be is called as authentication. I prove to you that I am Sandeep is what is authentication and what is authorization then based on the identity which has been given to me now let us say that I have proved to you I am Sandeep the immediate next question comes is what is that I can do with that identity and what is that I cannot do with that identity in context of Azure yes what are the different services which I can access and where I do not have access that is controlled by authorization so very important keywords authentication and authorization authentication is the process of identifying what someone claims himself or herself to be and authorization is the act of allowing or denying based on a identity of a particular person what services they can access what data they can access and on that data what are the different operations they can perform all that comes under authentication authorization now many a times there are some very important services now these important services we want to be doubly sure are being performed by the right person only see very good chance that when I log into a particular website I provide my username and password and somehow the password got leaked and when the password is leaked we do not want to allow somebody who got the password to be able to access those important services they are critical services and we don't want somebody to simply get access to it unauthorized access to it so how can I protect it 
that is when we go for actually multi factor authentication we also call it as mfa multi factor authentication now what is the advantage of multi factor authentication now in addition to the username and password one has to also provide the identity in the form of probably a otp which they are going to get on their mobile or probably they can have a mobile app installed on which they have to pass uh, they have to provide a confirmation that they are the person who was actually logging in so yes multi factor authentication provides additional security additional to what the username and password to your identity by requiring two or more elements for authentication so the something you know something you possess something you are these three things are what is confirmed by multi factor authentication so this is how important security services should be protected now who is going to provide this authentication and authorization and who is going to take care of this uh, multi factor authentication features in azure we have got azure ad azure active directory we call it it's an identity and access management service what is the meaning of identity here azure ad is going to provide an identity to the user and after providing identity to the, to the user azure ad also can be used to provide access to certain resources of course ad can also implement be, uh, ad can also implement multi factor authentication if in if enabled in it so yes every organization when they are going to create an azure account they have to first start with creating an azure tenant and in that particular tenant they are going to add all the users of their organization basically employees of the organization a user list will be created along with their basic details basically profile details we can say and the developers in the organization can build applications so that all the applications which are built are going to use the identity which is provided by azure ad let us say i want to use office 365 i want to use dynamics 365 i want to use microsoft teams for all these applications we don't want to have a separate username and password management all these things can be implemented with the help of azure ad identity which is given to the user so azure ad is a place where the users and their profiles will be created azure ad is the place where a user or employee of an organization will go log in with their username and password and of course sometimes it may require multi factor authentication and then based on that identity we are then going to provide access to the applications and same identity can be used across multiple applications we don't have to separately log in with the same identity into different application and that feature is called as single sign on you log in one time and with that particular login you try to access all the resources that's what is single sign on then we have got application management yes as i said multiple applications are going to be created and configured for azure ad these applications can be b2b applications now what are these b2b applications business to business basically we are building applications and these applications can be used only by users within my organization or in certain cases some users of another organization so organization organization business business that's why it is business to business yes azure ad actually gives us a facility where definitely users of my organization can exist in that and i can also invite users of another organization as guest into my ad that means there is one more ad tenant where the identity of the user exist but in my ad he is going to exist as a guest he has got his own home he will stay in his own home but he can definitely also be a guest in my home 
and once a user is added to my ad along with my other users this particular user also can be granted permissions like any other user within the same organization so this kind of model is called as business to business whereas in many cases we want to provide access to our applications to users who may not be members of our organization nor i want to explicitly add them to my azure ad i don't want to invite them explicitly and add them to my azure ad i should be able to provide access to any user if they have some kind of login like probably facebook login if they have a facebook account if they have a google account if they have a twitter account they should be able to log in with that identity and the respective service provider is then going to provide the information about that user to my azure ad so this kind of service is referred as b2c business to consumer so anybody in this world who has a social media account maybe facebook twitter google linkedin github anybody in this world who has an account in any of these things we can give access to those users for the applications which are hosted in our azure portal that is what is business to consumer identity service yes you can also do device management using azure ad i can make my device maybe my mobile or maybe my laptop desktop join an azure ad tenant so through that azure ad tenant now the control can happen on this particular device so by chance let us say if i lose my device azure ad can lock my account so that on the device nobody else can log in and then steal my data so device management also can be done with the help of azure ad and like that there are so many other features which one would want to use in their application development and these features in context of authentication and authorization are all taken care of azure ad one of the very 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 important and most powerful service and i would say this is one of the service which has actually made azure so popular so easy for corporates to adopt azure in their organization why almost every organization has on premise active directory that means the users of their organization are already there in the uh, on premise active directory now what microsoft did is intelligently they have provided a facility where all the on premise identities can be synced into azure ad so if a user exists in on premise the same username and password can be also added to azure ad with some tool so if there are 10000 users in your organization with some tool itself this 10000 users can be added into azure ad and now what is the benefit all the employees of the organization can use the same username and password to log on and access their applications locally as well as the applications which are in cloud local applications they would use windows ad on premise ad and for cloud based applications they can make use of azure ad that is also one way of looking at single sign on employees productivity will improve because they don't have to remember different username and password for their applications which are in cloud or in on premise so so many beautiful other features are provided by azure ad which actually makes the whole system very robust very strong and yes i repeat this point i can definitely say azure ad is one of the reason why the applications have become why azure cloud has become so popular and easily adopted by various organizations let's see now conditional access now i already told you mfa multi factor authentication now in mfa what is the problem when mfa is enabled it is not a free service it is a charged service so if there are 10000 users and if there are hundreds of applications and if mfa is enabled for 10 10000 users and hundreds of applications just multiply and see how many times the mfa request will be sent and every time a mfa request is, is sent maybe a mobile call or an ftp or a mobile app verification multiple options are there 
there is a charge going to happen so we don't want mfa to be enabled automatically for all the applications and all the users only certain important applications or important activities when a user is performing at that point of time alone i would like to have mfa that is multi factor authentication enabled for the user otherwise he should be able to log in with a single username and password and this feature is implemented with the help of conditional access conditional access the name itself has meaning actually based on some condition we are going to provide access to the user of course based on certain condition which can be from where did the user log in of course i am talking about after a user has logged in after his identity has been confirmed to be valid username and password then we are going to check hey did he log in from this ip location this range of ips if he has logged in from this range of ips maybe those ips are trusted and you do not want to enable multi factor authentication but if those ips are not trusted you may want to ask user to do a multi factor authentication likewise if he is logging in from trusted devices or if he is logging in to only certain applications not for all applications we want him to log in to certain applications and only for those applications we want to enable multi factor authentication sometimes even risk detection can in a, can prompt for multi factor authentication now what do you mean by risk detection say for example right now i am using my login and password from india but what if somebody is also using the same username and password but logging in from usa how can there be two users with same username and password from different location azure is going to identify these kind of uh, activities automatically because in background it is doing lot of machine learning it is checking your pattern of login from where are you logging in regularly from which city you are logging in which location you are logging in and if any kind of risk is identified immediately it will enable multi factor authentication of course all this has to be done through a conditional access so you can see here a user and location a device an application and a real time risk can be the criteria basically called as conditions for prompting for multi factor authentication or sometimes simply allow without asking for multi factor authentication and also it can be if it is very critical for example there is a possibility of somebody trying to log in from an anonymous ip they are trying to hide their ip and try log in into the system that means there is some problem so in those kind of cases i may simply block that access i may not even allow access to the user but otherwise we may configure for a multi factor authentication make it sure that you are doubly sure that this is the right person who is trying to log in because i would have sent an otp to his mobile and only if he is carrying his mobile and entered otp he would be further allowed to access the applications so conditional access is used by azure active directory to bring signals together to make a decision and enforce organizational policies organizational policies can be allow access to the application without any further requirement or deny access straight or allow but reconfirm the identity of the user through multi factor authentication so yes this is what is multi factor authentication now we have to understand here how can we assign identity to a user and basically we have to see a role has to be given to a user and based on that role he should be allowed to perform an action into azure so go to azure portal as usual let me take you to first azure ad azure active directory 
and azure active directory here has an option users these are all different users who are existing you can see many are guest who are actual users from other organization invited as members i mean invited as guest into this ad and many are members who are direct employees of my organization so pretty big list i can now actually use this particular identity and give permissions to the user on a particular resource so let us say if i have some virtual machine let me check if there is any virtual machine there should be yeah there is a virtual machine i go to the virtual machine and here we see there is access control iam go to identity and access management iam stands for identity and access management now i am going to assign a role to a user on this particular virtual machine how do we assign go to add role assignment simply select a role here there are multiple roles the most powerful role is owner of course this particular training doesn't require you to go into lot of details about different types of roles just know that something like this can be done i give permission to myself sandeep soni at deccansoft.com that's my identity and i say save so i am made owner of this particular virtual machine now being a owner of the virtual machine i would then be able to give permission to others and at the same time i can manage the complete virtual machine now what do i mean by managing the complete virtual machine i can probably start a virtual machine stop a virtual machine drop a virtual machine also if needed change the size of the virtual machine everything i can do in addition to giving permission to other users when i log in with that identity where the permissions are granted mind you i have logged in with a different identity now it's a you can see that sandeep sonia deccansoft.net but then permissions are granted to another identity sandeep sonia deccansoft.com that's a different identity which is only invited as guest now when these kind of permissions are granted very important azure is logging all these things there's a log which is created who has done what and that you can see in activity log so right now it is not there but shortly it will start appearing after some time and this activity log instead of checking at the you can see activity log ideally at the subscription level still not reflecting but yes over a period of time after 5 minutes or something it will start listing any activity which has been performed for example i go and delete a virtual machine imagine i delete only who has deleted we should know right simply i virtual machine if deleted nobody can take uh, i mean nobody can avoid the responsibility somebody has to take the responsibility of deleting the virtual machine all these activities of resources and their operations are logged in an activity log which is managed by azure subscription here it will start appearing over a period of time you see create role assignment this role assignment happened on the virtual machine you can see what was the role assignment done create role assignment was done actually it's not fully refreshed but yes it will after some time likewise if you wait for a couple of more minutes you'll also see that there is one more action added here which is virtual machine deleted so yes users are managed by azure ad identity is managed by azure ad and based on that identity other resources in azure are given access to that's why we say it is identity and access management service not yet reflecting but yeah it takes approximately 2 to 3 minutes you know see now deallocated virtual machine it has come this particular user has deallocated the virtual machine this particular user has actually assigned permission to another user who is the other user all that information will be here
role assignment has been authorized. Caller. Shared with so and so user. So this is how role based access is given to the various resources. Now let's move on to Azure governance, governing Azure services. Yes, the first one I have just now covered actually role based access control. For a user, we give permission based on the role. Now you have seen the permission I created was actually on a resource virtual machine but where is resource inside a resource group where is resource group inside a subscription at the highest level we have got actually speaking management group we'll discuss more about management groups in the coming session but Earlier also I have discussed, at top we have got management group, root management group will be there and below that there can be multiple management groups, you can have up to 6 levels of management groups and within any management group we can have Azure subscription and within a subscription we can have resource group and within a resource group we can have resources, that's the hierarchy. There are 3 types of security principles. All the time I was talking about user logging in. But if there are hundreds of user, I may not be able to afford giving permission to each user. It might be a very time consuming task. So what is the alternative? I am going to group users. Maybe a set of users based on their activity or based on their responsibility. I may give a common group name to them. Maybe I will call them as all managers so all those people who play the role of manager i'll put it under the group called as managers like that i may have hr so based on what job they do based on what activities they do we can group them and that's what is user group so users will fall under individual identity then a group if I bind them to permissions can be directly given to group and if a permission is given to group automatically permission is granted to all the users in that particular group likewise there is something also called as service principle it's beyond your scope right now to understand service principle but in short even the applications can be given identity a user can be given identity, an application, a program which is in execution can be given an identity and a group can be given an identity. When an identity is given to all of them, any one of them or all of them, you can grant permissions. Basically, you can assign roles at the subscription level or at the resource group level or at the resource level. If you grant permission at the subscription level, you should know that automatically all the resource groups and their resources are accessible to that user with that role basically if i make sandeep sony at deccansoft.com as an owner of subscription he automatically becomes the owner of all the resource groups and all the resources which are there in that particular subscription but chances are i don't want to control all the resource groups via sandeep sony at deccansoft.com in that case i may make him either as owner or contributor role in the resource group but when I give him permission at the resource group level he only has access to the resources under it but not the resources in another resource group so yes it is called as fine grained access management you are able to go and give permission only for one particular resource as I just now demonstrated for VM or you can give permission at the resource group level or at the subscription level actually speaking not shown in the diagram but you can give permissions even at the management group level if a management group is given permission to a given user automatically all the subscriptions and their respective resource group and resources will be granted permission for whom it can be either user or an application or a user group 
very 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 important and this feature is called as role based access control role we are giving a role to a particular security principle for accessing the resources at different level see many times we create resources and there is very good possibility that i may delete a resource by mistake and deleted resources it is very difficult to re recover them there are very few services in which after deletion we can recover most of the services we cannot recover once they are deleted and at the same time i want to have certain services which are locked which are actually not accessible to all users so what shall we deal what shall we do with those all services basically we have to create something called as locks over here you can protect your azure resources from accidental deletion or modification accidental deletion or modification how by creating a lock there are two types of lock read only lock and cannot delete lock very important remember cannot delete lock takes care of read only also so if i create a lock which is read only i can read the resources but i cannot make changes to the resources if i explain you in simple language if a virtual machine is locked i cannot change size of the virtual machine i cannot start a virtual machine i cannot stop a virtual machine whatever is the current state i can know but i cannot make changes to it that's what is read only lock and definitely we cannot delete also but sometimes we want to make updates to the virtual machine we should be able to make changes to the size of the virtual machine start the virtual machine stop the virtual machine add the disk to the virtual machine and so many other things we want to do but we don't want somebody to by mistake delete in that kind of case we have to go for delete lock so only delete is not allowed but read is allowed and update is allowed so a resource in the resource group can be locked and hence automatically or i mean suppose you implement the lock at the resource group level automatically all the resources in that resource group will get locked but remember this is not something to do with permissions locking has nothing to do with permission so let me take you now back to the portal i'll take you see in subscription we have a provision for locking you can search here lock resource locks so if i add a read only lock any name based on the context you can give if i add a read only lock at the subscription level i have now made all the resource group and all the resources as read only i can't now go to the virtual machine and probably stop the virtual machine or start the virtual machine these kind of operations will not succeed you see it is stopped it has failed because the virtual machine is locked though i did not lock the virtual machine actually i locked the subscription itself but if you don't do the lock at the subscription level like i go to the subscription i go to the lock and i delete the lock no more lock now i can actually then go to the resource group search for resource group my virtual machine is created in this particular resource group at the resource group level i can implement lock let's say i add now a delete lock that means what any resource which is there in this particular resource group i will not be able to delete but it will not mind me check making changes to that particular resource so let's say we go to a resource maybe a virtual machine right now it is stopped i can start the virtual machine you see it will start like that if you take any other resource in this particular resource group for say for example we have got some app service or some cdn service imagine any service you can take actually and try to say delete you will see that it's not 
deleting why because there is a delete lock implemented something very important you have to remember read only lock does not allow you to update and does not allow you to delete whereas delete lock will not allow you to only update but will allow you to sorry delete lock will not allow you to delete but it will allow you to update the resource very important acts see we are creating so many resources and these resources are created for probably different departments in the organization probably for different customers we are creating these resources different teams we are creating these resources billing of all these things is going to happen at the subscription level so at the end of the month i get a bill where detailed description will be given these resources are there and this is the cost and blah 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 story but the problem is how should i know how much was the billing for department a and how much was billing for the resources used by department b i want some kind of segregation so what we will do generally in that kind of cases for every resource we are going to attach some tax what is a tax key value pair anything it can be any key any value no restriction key is a string value is also a string so tax are key value pairs one or more which we can attach to a particular resource and that is generally treated as metadata some extra data data about data is called as metadata this tax can be used for grouping resources other than resource group these tax can be used for segregation of billing i can say okay department marketing how much resources were consumed and how much is the total cost of all of them from the bill we can do that kind of filtration so that's what is the purpose of tax so how do you create a tag this particular walk through requires us to create a policy which is actually a topic which we will discuss next and based on the policy we can put a restriction that this particular resource which is created compulsory should have a tag but anyways that i'll take later right now let me just show you every resource every resource has this tag and here you can give some name let's say department i'll call it as maybe d1 apply you can give multiple key value pairs i go to some other resource still applying another place i'll use the same key and maybe same value maybe different value so i go to now another resource which can be maybe virtual machine or virtual network every resource resource group subscription everywhere remember we have got tax likewise i may go and give maybe sql server database is there for sql server database same key and a different value we give imagine now multiple tags you might have used multiple key value pairs same key different values you might have used and if you want to see the grouping you can type here tax and very easily you will be able to see for department with d1 value these are the two resources the third, third one is not yet applied that's why it's not appearing but yes you will see department with d2 also now you see there are no resources not yet refreshed but yes very soon it will come department with d1 these are the two resources department with d2 after some time you will see here sql server it will take few seconds more for that to apply so sql server did we mention the tag d2 yes so click here so we go to tags d2 now you see sql server also has come so like this even in your billing separate i mean you can group by 
tax all the resources and know the total cost. That's precisely the benefit of tax. So I am not creating policy which is actually a next topic. Let us first understand a policy. What is this policy? See permissions are granted to user on different resources. Some users are granted permission, some users are not granted permission. But we want certain policies to be followed in every organization. Basically certain standards should be followed, certain compliances rules should be followed. Regulatory compliances have to be followed, which can be related to security, which can be related to cost. Some guidelines have to be provided. For example, I don't want anybody to create a virtual machine in a region other than India. East, sorry, West India, Central India, South India, a region can be selected, but something else should not be allowed. Or an example can be create a resource compulsory there should be a tag attached to that particular resource compulsory without a tag if you create a resource we should get an error this can be compliance rule this can be policy of an organization so there are actually two things one is policy and the other is initiative definition policy definition initiative definition policy is individual policy for example Tag is re required for every resource. That is individual policy. Virtual machine is supposed to have a um, location as these countries only. That's a individual policy. But many times, hundreds of policies will be there which we would like to assign to a resource. So rather than doing one at a time, what we will do is we will create an initiative definition. So in short, initiative definition is a collection of policies which together can be assigned to a particular subscription or management group or even for that matter resource group. Policies can be applied either at subscription level, management group level and in certain cases you might even go and say only for the resources of this particular resource group we want the policies to be applied. What resources can be storage resource, security resources, I mean sorry, networking resources, compute resources. These policies are also used by the security center. Security center, if you remember, I told you, is going to provide us with lot of recommendations. And also it is going to provide us with lot of alerts. The recommendations are actually supposed to be used for improving the security score of a given organization. The more security score, the better security implementation is. But how is that recommendation provided? How are the alerts going to be raised? Security center uses a default policy for that. There is a big list of policies all grouped together in an initiative definition the default initiative definition which gets at attached to your subscription or maybe to your management group and that will ensure that the security, security center at a periodic basis will see are the resources in compliance or not. If they are not in compliance with the policy, immediately it will raise an alert which has to be taken care of. So how do you see these policies? How do we implement these policies? Go to portal and here you have to search for policy this time. Go to policy and in policy you will see there are lot of policy definitions. These are all initiatives. All these are different initiatives built in and followed by that these are all individual policies. Initiatives are collection of policies and policy definitions are individuals. So uh, Azure Cosmos DB allowed location. If you apply this, if you assign this, right now it is not assigned. Just because the policies are existing, it does not mean they are all implemented. No. We have to activate it. We have to assign it. The policies have to be assigned. So say for example, 
I would like to assign a policy which is related to tagging. Compulsory a resource should be tagged. So require a tag on resource. There is a policy called as require a tag on resource. I go here and I say assign. I'll give the scope as my subscription itself. If I want optionally restricted to only a resource group, the resource group alone. So in this particular management group, there is a management group. In that management group, in that subscription, only for the resource group resources, we are saying this particular policy should be applied. In case we want to exempt certain resources, we can do that. I'm not interested and just say enabled and say review and create. So I created one policy here which makes me compulsory, which makes it compulsory for us to create a resource with tag. Remember there is also a remediation. Remediation is basically if that particular policy is violated, automatically something should be done so that the policy validation succeeds. For example, automatically a tag should be created for the resource. Of course, that is not applicable in this particular uh, policy, but at the advanced level, if you go, remediation can be done where a identity will be given using that identity, automatically the policy will be uh, the policy will be validated and if it failing, something will be done to ensure that the policy succeeds, the validation succeeds. I am not doing that in this example. So I will just say review and create. Okay, the validation has failed. We have to also specify the tag name. Let us say department only. This is the tag name which is supposed to be provided. Do a review and create. Something might have gone wrong. Exclusion, blah, blah, blah. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Non-compliance message. Please add a tag by name department. Now say create. Fantastic. Policy assignment has succeeded. Like this, you might want to do one more assignment. Maybe something like a VM allowed in a given location. Allowed locations. Configure backup. Audit resource location. Configure backup. Let's say allowed locations. I would say assign and the only location I would like to assign again I can choose a subscription I'm not filtering with resource group this time and I can give here the allowed location so I'll say India is the allowed location in India the resources can be created Central India, South India, West India, something Geo India West they are creating, not sure what is this. I am also seeing for the first time. I only hope that is not Reliance Geo, not sure about it. Create. So two policies are created and you can see them over here. The many policies, don't worry about all of them. I created many for different purposes. Some are compliant, some are not compliant. So policy assignment. These are, this is the assignment I created. This is the ass assignment I created. This particular thing at the resource uh, subscription level and this is at the resource group level. Now next what? 
this policy is it being see now what i'll do let's say we create a storage account i try to create a new storage account i give here east us and just say review and create do a create ideally speaking it should fail the validation should fail we'll get the template window yep and here i should get an error saying that the policy violation has happened you see deployment failed why did the deployment failed please add a tag by name department okay this case department tag is missing so i can give a department tag but then also it would still fail because the location validation will fail so i try to create a new resource dss demo storage one two three keep it as east us give a tag call it as department give some name review and create it's performing validations policy validations are not covered here in the next step only they will be checked when the template is submitted for resource creation to the server when the arm template on the next window that time the policy validations will be done again it has failed why this has failed so i have not given the friendly name but raw error will be here was disallowed by the policy allowed locations because only india data centers are allowed other data centers are not allowed so like this every organization has got certain compliance things and they can all be implemented using policies and of course initiatives again i'm repeating policy is individual initiative is a collection of policies whether it is policy or initiative you have to assign them only then they are reflected very important otherwise they are not reflected so we created a policy tested allowed location policy of course after we are done we are supposed to delete it otherwise we will have problems at later stages so i go to assignment and from here i can delete so next time it will not be checked otherwise you will have confusion cannot delete the resource tag why because lock is there so i go to the subscription and maybe at the subscription level i have given resource locks delete lock is there that's why i'm not able to delete now i can go back to policy and delete the policy so initiatives are there policies are there all these are assigned these are all security center policies actually little advance for you to understand at this point of time blueprint wow see you know that using arm templates we can create resources using rbac we can grant permissions to the users or groups or applications using policies we can ensure compliance and i want to do this for all the subscriptions which are created in my organization 
I want by default some roles to be assigned to the users. Automatically, I create a new subscription and on that new subscription, automatically roles should be assigned. Automatically policies should be assigned. Using ARM template, automatically certain resource groups and resources should be created. And this we can achieve using Azure Blueprint. So Azure Blueprint makes it possible for development teams to rapidly build and stand up new environments. So as soon as a new environment is set up, all these things should magically happen. That's it. Okay, these are the important users. These permissions should be given. These are the important policies. They should be applied. These are the important resources. They should be immediately created. Immediately the whole environment will be set up for you. Development teams can quickly build trust through organizational compliance. How are compliance implemented? Through policies. So you should not have any subscription where policy is not there. Through organizational compliance with a set of built-in components which can be net, such as networking, virtual machine, anything in order to speed up the delivery and of course the development. Why? Everything is automated, automatically going to happen. That's what is actually uh, Azure Blueprint is all about. Yes, beyond the scope of this session for giving a demo. But remember, a blueprint, when created, we configure certain role assignments, we configure certain policy assignments, we configure certain ARM templates, and we configure creation of resource group. As soon as a new environment has to be set up, if you assign the blueprint to a subscription, automatically all these things will be done. And most important is what? A policy assignment done through a blueprint or a role assignment done through a blueprint cannot be deleted. I mean, you can configure like that. It's optional feature, but you can configure. These roles cannot be deleted. These resources cannot be deleted. These policy assignments cannot be deleted. Compulsory, these resource group must be created and cannot be deleted. We can do locking through blueprint. That's precisely a blueprint feature. So now what we have is cloud adoption framework. Basically, a set of standard guidelines which are provided by Microsoft or their partners and customers. Basically, we call them as best practices which have to be followed by an organization so that they can adapt Azure Cloud for their organizational purposes. So it all begins with creating a strategy of what exactly is the purpose of moving to cloud and what are the expected outcomes. Based on this strategy, a planning has to be done. Then you have to check, is your organization ready for cloud as adoption? Migrate your services from on-premise to cloud Azure. Maybe certain applications might need changes. Basically, you have to innovate them so that the benefits of cloud we can take. We should set up the governing rules for day-to-day -day operations and of course, continuous management of the resources in cloud and of course, the hybrid on-premise. So there are best standard practices which are given, tools, guidelines and narratives for strategies and outcomes are provided by Microsoft in the form of cloud adoption framework. Privacy, compliance and data protection standards. What exactly are this? See, if you are working with an organization or an application, there are definitely some standards which have to be followed. So, how are these standards are taken care of? How do we win the confidence of the end user saying that by putting their applications in cloud, we are not deviating from the compliance and data protection and privacy issues. 
because my customers data about their users is now going to become part of azure cloud earlier it was very simple i would create a on premise data center everything will be in my control and definitely it is easy for me to implement privacy compliance and data protection and convince my customer saying that everything is intact but now what am i doing i am moving my customers data users information into azure data center managed by microsoft so how do i convince him that everything is taken care of these things are what we have to understand through data compliance issues so security privacy compliance what are these three things security the two types of security always remember one is digital security and the other is physical security and we have already discussed much in detail earlier in the previous chapter how security is implemented in azure cloud how security center comes into the picture for giving you various recommendations and at the same time providing various alerts if there is a deviation from standard policies so microsoft helps to protect against known unknown cyber threats also there is a huge amount of machine learning happening with various usages and if somebody is trying to hack your site they would identify that this is a uh, untrusted request and they would probably block it so if you remember ddos attacks will be blocked we have firewalls nsgs all those things ensure that the cyber threats are mitigated blocked what is privacy microsoft says that we are committed to ensuring the privacy of the organization through contractual agreement and by providing user control and transparency yes they give us lot of documentation which will help us to believe that the data is not going to be leaked from their data center to either competitors or in any other way one of the ways they implement this is ensuring that the data at rest in their data center is encrypted imagine i use as your storage account and that storage account has to save data into the data center of microsoft microsoft will encrypt all that data and keep it there so even by chance if somebody steals it they cannot make out anything out of it because it's all encrypted only when you retrieve the service will decrypt and give you the data provided it is done through a legitimate way in illegitimate access will not be given so microsoft has documented all these things in contractual agreement and transparently they give us all this information that none of our data is going to be used by them in for whatever purpose compliance with respect to local laws and regulations and provide comprehensive coverage of compliance offerings see there can be certain compliance issues like for example we might want to have our hipaa compliant now what is this hipaa compliant it's all about health related data hipaa basically we have a slide on it so microsoft provides most comprehensive set of compliance offerings including certifications and attestations of the cloud service provider so they say okay these standards we are implementing in our data center so hipaa compliance is one which is mostly used by the hospital industry patients information should not be leaked it should be given access to only limited people like doctors otherwise it should not be simply leaked to anyone so that was that's what comes under hipaa compliance so sensitive data in different context are taken care of by different compliance which are like cgis is one compliance csa star certification i mean i when i don't want to get into these compliances in different different context there are different different compliances and microsoft has implemented these compliances in their data center and they support us with enough documentation saying that yes 
our data when it is in their data center is quite compliant so with this they issue a policy statement privacy statement so privacy statement provides openness and honesty about how microsoft handles user data collected from its product and services they will clearly tell you how the microsoft is going to process the data what data they are going to process and what is the purpose of the data all that will be properly documented and given to us so yes there is a detailed privacy statement which is given to us for data handling how microsoft is handling data on our behalf likewise there are certain things online service terms licensing terms define the terms and conditions for products and online services you purchase through microsoft volume license programs data protection addendum dpa sets of obligations with respect to don't get too much deep into it it's pretty high level how the licenses are given to the organizations basically volume licenses hundreds of licenses we buy together in such case how it is taken care of data protection how it is done all that is given to us in the form of various documents and these things are given to us through a trust center there is a trust center there is a website actually which microsoft has given the trust center website gives in depth expert information curated list of recommended resources arranged by topic role specific information for business managers administrators engineers proper documents are given lot of pdfs are available which will help us in getting all this information just to take you through a small demo it's the compliance offering home page See, these are all different compliances, global compliances. If it is U.S. government, different different region-specific compliances. So you can go to something randomly, ISO compliance. How is it ISO compliant? All the documentation is given here. what all cloud services come under this will be there somewhere different white papers about this there are audit reports somebody has already microsoft got their infrastructure audited so you have proper audit reports azure dynamics 365 online services you can probably go into one of these complete information is there it will ask me to sign in so huge amount of documentation microsoft has supported us to ensure that they give confidence to us saying that yes this is secure this is your privacy is secured all audit reports are here different different reports how each service is implemented so certification of registration microsoft corporation iso 20 something certified blah 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 all these are different services which are in azure or government or germany compliance is confirmed some auditing firm has acknowledged all this their validity period is given to us authorized by so this is basically your trust center 
what you have seen is a trust center service trust.microsoft.com this is trust center like that we have got another portal which is service trust different audit reports i mean it's too much content for a beginner to understand all these things generally the executives of the organization who are there is a team actually which will take care that the customer compliance things are all properly implemented and followed so that's what i showed you trust center service trust portal like that there is a compliance manager also all the documentation microsoft offers comprehensive set, set of compliance offerings to help your organization comply with national regional and industry specific requirement the god collection of data whether it is global data centers where our resources are created or data centers which are specific to us government industry specific data center regional data centers all these things are taken care of azure swarm sovereign sovereign regions basically a data center which is dedicated to my as your government i mean us government so us federal services only can access this data centers we cannot access likewise in china they have a data center which they are operating with the help of 21 via net we are not authorized to access the resources which are there in the china data center only from china these resources can be accessed outside china they cannot be accessed so that convince I mean that uh, confidence Microsoft has given to China government. Then only they were allowed to open the data center in China, and that too, in coordination with a local body. Twenty One Wirenet is an organization which manages Microsoft data centers in China. So you have got U.S. government services. You have got China like that for Germany also. They have provided now a data center. So different data centers across the globe. all under public category or us government or germany or china data center so yes with this we have come to the end of module 5
billing is separate for each subscription. Subscription also acts as access control boundary because you can have different set of users for each subscription and their permissions can be completely different. So yes, remember one basic point here. A single Azure account can manage multiple subscription. So to create a subscription, as I told you, you should go to the portal. Very quickly, I'll show you. I may not want to explore a lot, but yeah, go to Azure portal. Log in to your account, like I am logging in with my account. And once I am logged in with the account, go to subscriptions. And here you will have add subscription. So it will now ask you to choose one among multiple subscription options which are available. Free trial subscription, pay as you go subscription, subscription for Azure students and then the many other types. So this interface was slightly different earlier, now they have changed it. But you can just choose one of these subscriptions and activate it. Earlier it was listed like this. So that is, what is this free subscription all about? Now free subscription gives you $200 credits for 30 days to explore all services of Azure. Some of you probably have already activated it and you are using it. But yes, when you create this particular account, you are supposed to provide your credit card details and you are supposed to provide your phone number with a registered email id once you have activated your subscription with these three you cannot reuse the same for creating one more free trial account free trial account is binded to your email id phone number and credit card so you cannot reuse that subsequently especially credit card and email id but the same subscription after 30 days, you can still make use of certain services for 12 months free of charge. You have to go to the documentation and see the list of all free services. Yeah, they are very basic services actually. But at the same time, there are 25 plus services which sounds very good to hear. But again, at a very basic level, 25 plus free services are available. You can use throughout, there is no restriction at all, there is no timeline. So there is pay as you go subscription, where you can actually start using all the services from day one, but you are supposed to be billed for the services you are using for the time you are using. Microsoft also does enterprise agreement with large organizations where they take the upfront commitment of some amount of dollars and give them discounts. There is a student level subscription which is creative, creatable now. If you are a student of some college or university, you can create your subscription. It comes at a very cheaper price compared to pay as you go. Yes, one account can have multiple subscriptions. That point also you should keep in mind. Now, sometimes it so happens that there are so many subscriptions which the organizations have, it becomes difficult for them to start managing them. So what Microsoft did now is they started supporting management group concept. So at the highest level, we have got a management group a management group can again have a sub-management group and that can again have a sub-management group. That means management group itself is hierarchical. So based on your organization structure, you can take full organization management group at top and then probably you divide that into different verticals 
and then in each vertical you probably have different departments and within the department you have got different groups working like that you first create a management group structure and at the leaf of the management group you will put your subscriptions so yes between management group the top root and the subscription there will be at least six levels there can be maximum six levels and then you can have a subscription remember that overall you can have around 10,000 management groups in a single Azure Active Directory very very important so of course every management group will have only one parent needless to say that a management group cannot have two parents and what is the benefit at the management group level you can create manage access that means permissions can be granted there policies can be created and of course that becomes a compliance point for all the subscriptions within that particular management group so very small subscription how the hierarchy is the free account subscription how the billing let's see that managing cost the microsoft has to be pretty transparent in how exactly are you going to get billed for the services and the products which you are going to make use of how is it going to cost you that is supposed to be quite transparent so such things we'll have to see now so you can be an enterprise as an organization you can buy the subscription generally the enterprise customers are responsible for buying enterprise agreement with azure which they have to negotiate with microsoft and get good amount of discount quite obvious they have to make upfront payment and that's mostly done annually so that's enterprise sector and that's actually the major uh, contributor to the microsoft in terms of revenue model through enterprise the, they earn maximum then there are some resellers also who will sell Microsoft services to their customers. There are Microsoft partners, which is like a big, big, big set. Microsoft partners basically are responsible for making their customers educated about the services offered by Azure and they get a small percentage on the revenue, which is sold through partners. They get a small percentage. And then of course the individuals also can make use of the Azure cloud. For individuals also there are services available. So there are different types of consumers of Azure. Enterprise can be a consumer, resellers, partners and personal. Now what is the factor which affects cost? basically three things type of resource is it a virtual machine is it a app service then the rates are going to be different for each type of customer the enterprise will have different cost web direct will have different cost if you are using pay as you go, there is a different cost. And where is the infrastructure used from? For example, India, they will have different cost. US, there is a different cost. Canada, there is a different cost. South Africa, there is a different cost. There is a slight variation in the cost. Basically, that's the point I'm trying to make. So, yes, let us say we have a virtual machine. Now the virtual machine cost will be based on what? The number of 
minutes the virtual machine rather seconds the virtual machine compute power has been used but in addition to the virtual machine remember there is a ip address so how many minutes or hours your ip address was used with the virtual machine how much data is gone inside how much data has gone outside the data center of microsoft that is cost if you are using a disk a managed disk is created that is having a separate cost blobs type of disk have a different type of cost even if you write there is cost read there is cost delete there is cost so that's how the cost is divided in different factors so you have to definitely understand what is the service you are using and what all attributes of that particular service are covering the cost and accordingly you have to manage that most of the time what i have noted is ingress which is getting data inside the data center is free for most of the services but when the data comes out of the data center of microsoft it's not free that's going to be charged but again there are two types of charges one is amount of data which is going in or going out and number of times you are writing and reading even that is separately charged so these factors have to be very clear to you people data moving in and out of azure data centers some inbound data transfers are free such as data going into azure data centers for outbound data transfer such as data going out of azure data center pricing is zone based and these zones are not the zones which we were discussing geographies and zones no in general west us east us west europe others like that zones are there and in these zones the prices are different now how to know what is the price microsoft has given a azure calculator you can actually go to azure pricing calculator and there select a particular service and know the cost of it so you can actually go to the pricing calculator simply go to google.com and search pricing calculator and you can directly find the first link itself and here in the pricing calculator choose the service first say for example i choose virtual machine i choose storage account for my project i need these two imagine so both are listed here at the bottom so first let us see azure virtual machine first choose your region all the regions are here and as you change the region you can see there is a change in price happening here i am changing the region here it's 140 also in south korea and 192 in switzerland 180 154 so the price is changing basically most of the time it's my observation maybe it is incomplete east us is the cheapest data center that's what i have noted based on the operating system the cost varies windows is any time expensive than linux what type of data tier instance the size how many virtual machines you want how many hours you are going to run all that you see a pay as you go one year reserved you pay up front for one year they give you 40% discount they you pay up front for 3 years they give you 62% discount than the pay as you go offering so if you know that your site is going to be up and running throughout why not have a longer commitment and get a bigger discount these are this comes on the reserved instance pricing like that only you see here the storage cost is there for write operation there is cost for read operation there is cost for data 
of course you see a data retrieval data write it depends on this factor also let me change here to something data retrieval cost is not showing up good retrieval cost is there so all these parameters matter there is lrs grs ragrs replication cost basically so if you are going to a level of architect the pricing can be one of the factors in deciding whether you want to use that service or not of course features will be the first priority if i need a particular feature i will not consider pricing but if i find same features in multiple services definitely i would want to consider the service based on other parameters and pricing can be one of those parameters so there is a pricing calculator which can really help you to calculate the cost of overall set of services which you are going to use based on so many factors like duration and the features which you want to make use of so total on premise cost total azure cost how the breakup happens you see what they are basically showcasing to you is when you move from on premise to azure how are you going to save what will be the saving so if you are going for azure 7% is compute 0% data center you don't have to put data center at all but here the major cost is you managing the data center so basically total cost of ownership is what probably you can go through tco basically is a calculator which generates cost comparison report for on premise environment so what it will do is it will take from you lot of inputs and after taking all the inputs from you and doing some assessment it will generate a report saying that if you migrate to cloud this is how your overall costing is going to be so yes the architects will be responsible for using such reports also to estimate the feasibility of moving from on premise to azure this is just a graph but not a perfect graph because this graph will change from organization to organization individual to individual quite of obviously if i am talking about let us say a startup why the hell i will get into all these things i will not even procure a data center i'll directly blindly go for something like cloud computing environments of azure aws or google and i'll probably compare these three but if i already have a data center i have already incurred the capital cost so how much it is affordable for me to migrate so that estimate if you want to do you can make use of the total cost of ownership calculator so that like azure calculator they have given the cost of ownership calculator also so we have how do you minimize cost performance perform cost analysis use azure pricing and tco calculators continuously monitor use services like azure advisor which will keep a background assessment of your services and will present to you the ways you can actually save your amount the simple example i told you many times we for we delete the virtual machine but we don't delete the storage we don't delete the uh, ip 
so azure calculator will give us an advice hello you are not using these services you can actually delete them and by deleting them you are going to save some cost so by implementing the recommendations of azure advisor set the spending limit certain uh, subscriptions not all you have the option of setting the limits so whenever the limit is reached automatically the subscription will get disabled like free trial gets disabled after 200 i use visual studio enterprise subscription that gets disabled after i use it for around 150 dollars so like that there are limits which can be set on certain subscription which when reached automatically the subscription gets disabled but you will not be overbilled so wherever possible use those kind of subscriptions also use azure reservations and azure hybrid benefits now what is this hybrid benefits say for example you have got a virtual machine now virtual machine needs windows but there is a possibility that you already have a windows license for your on premise Microsoft is giving you the facility where the Windows license purchased by you on on-premise, you can use it in Azure and save cost. Always try to see if your region is the cheapest. If your region is not cheap, is there a nearby low cost region, which is not going to impact the latency, but can reduce your cost. And is there a possibility of using your resources? from that region rather than in the costlier region that also can be one way of evaluation keep an eye on offers which microsoft keeps issuing azure customers and subscription offers will be there you keep an eye on it for example there are times where microsoft will give you a virtual machine particular size at a very low price when compared to the routine or other virtual machines with low configuration a higher sized virtual machine will be cheaper in cost when compared to a lower cost uh, uh, lower lower sized virtual machine so keep an eye on it and of course you should apply tax and use them to distribute the cost among the owners of the resources or services people have used within the organization within the given subscription so probably this can this process if you implement systematically there is a chance that you can reduce the costing of the overall subscription microsoft gives you cost management you can actually use this feature for example i can go to the portal And in Azure portal under subscription, you can go to cost analysis and it will tell you if you are here today by end of the month, how much it will cost you. Such kind of graphs will be provided to you. So this is how I have been using my subscription. Suddenly I created certain things here, certain things I have created here, then I have deleted few things here. So maybe at the end of the month, this is the cost which I'm going to incur. So these kind of facilities are given to us. Which services costed how much? Till now. So detailed analysis of the cost can be done for the period. So this is how cost management budgeting, you can even create alerts. You can say that my budget is let's say 10,000 rupees and I want an alert to be automatically generated when I have reached 50%, when I have reached 75%, when I have reached 90% of my budget. I can configure alerts. So that is what is the budgeting and alerting. They work together only actually.
when you create budgets you can add alerts on top of the budgets and of course the advisory recommendations also you have to keep in mind always so in this module you have learned how to purchase as your products and services which factors affect your cost basically the resource type the service and its features and most important the location also how to do calculation of cost and what are the different ways to minimize your cost definitely no product is complete without proper support we can never expect anything to work perfectly so there are microsoft support options so what are those various support options we can use paid and free so support plan options every azure subscription includes free access to billing and subscription if you have any problem related to billing or your subscription activated deactivated whatever that support is absolutely free always any support related to azure products like if you want to know is this feature available not available documentation of services if you say the documentation is incomplete or this is not given to me that kind of question if you want to ask so all this support is absolutely free so when you go for support you can divide the support as basic developer standard professional direct based on this the charge is different the cost is different if you take a basic support yeah that's available to all microsoft azure accounts developer support is available to trial and non production environments only like visual studio enterprise subscription is supposed to be a non production environment subscription a free trial account subscription so business hours access to support engineers via email is given but when you go for something like pay as you go subscription that would be a standard subscription you already have production workloads suddenly the production has gone down the server has gone down you cannot say that microsoft cannot tell me okay you are out of the business hours i am not going to give you support no these are 24 by 7 access to support engineers via email and phone so remember that is one of the major reason why people should not use free trial subscriptions non production environments for production workloads they should not do that if they do this is the problem they will not get support in non working hours support will be provided only in working hours and that too via email only yeah they are pretty prompt in replying here also in working hours but it is like high priority sla is given you cannot have downtime then definitely you will have to go for standard now there are business critical dependencies 24 by 7 access to support engineers via phone and email this is the most expensive actually so based on your workloads based on what agreement you have with your customer you have to choose one of these supports yes there is always an alternative channel you can use msdl azure forum there are forum sites you can go and post your query there and the public will reply stack overflow is also very popular nowadays where we can post our question and most of the time i see people replying to the question on stack overflow in 5 minutes less than 5 minutes you will get the reply it appears as if people are only interested in replying to stack overflow why because such a big community is now already working on stack overflow supporting each other so as your general feedback server faults all these are supports twitter is get microsoft gives a twitter handle which is there on which you can post your queries or if you have any concern there also they reply so multiple channels are available there is a knowledge center actually 
you can just go to the knowledge center put your query and most of the time the solution is already there somebody in the past have asked that question they already documented and you can just read that it's all free you don't have to pay anything for this so am i built separately for local disk storage these kind of questions are already there you can actually go to portal just to give you go here to support you have to category you have to choose the category these are all various options available you see as i said but if you want to create a request do that azure services what is the type of issue some are free technical is not free you have to choose the subscription i told you which service has the problem which resource all this if you provide and create next they will try to give you solution here itself but you can always say no and you can continue to go for more because it's a paid support it's asking me to choose the support plan only when i choose the support plan my credit card which is attached will be billed automatically for every ticket which i am going to raise the multiple support plans available basic developer 100 1000 per month 29 per month the response time will be very good in this critical business impact less than 1 hour they will do onboarding services service reviews azure advisory consultant all these are extra services guidance so just explore what suits you best based on the kind of sla which you have signed with the customer these things are supposed to be taken care of so available support plans channels to get azure support capabilities of knowledge center we created a support request we did not complete though what is this sla service level agreement so what is service level agreement what are the different types of sla is what we need to see here basically sla defines how much time my service is going to remain up and running what is the percentage of time it may go down so quite obvious better sla implies better commitment so sla's document the specific terms that define azure performance standards SLA defines Microsoft commitment to an Azure product or service. Individual SLAs are available for each product and service. This is not like a overall Microsoft said, "Oh, Azure is always available 99.99%." No. Based on service, the SLA agreements are different. 
and in that service also the options which you choose will let you define different SLAs. So higher availability, higher SLA. This is what if you remember in the first session I have discussed. Anytime if you have multiple virtual machines in availability set, that gives a better SLA. But if you have virtual machines in multiple regions, they give you more better SLA. So SLA is going to define how much is the allowed downtime per month and per year. SLA also gives you what will happen if the service or product fails to meet the designated availability commitment. So there is an SLA in Cosmos DB that your read operations should complete in so many milliseconds if you have selected so and so throughput. But for any chance if it doesn't meet, you are given the, I mean the service, is, service charge is waived off for you. How much is waived off? That depends on again how much downtime was there, how much, so many other factors. But there are documented stuff in the SLA. What happens if the service or product fails to meet the designated availability commitment? Means what? Are you given 50% discount on your billing? Or are you given 100%? Are you given 20%? Or you are not given discount? I mean thus these kind of things are there in the SLA. So you see here, if a service says that 99.99% is the SLA, basically this is called as 4 rise. 4.32 minutes downtime per month is acceptable and overall per year 52.56 minutes. Rest all is considered as uptime. So guarantee your service is supposed to be up for rest of the complete month but in a month any time for 4.32 minutes it can be down that's what is 9.99 never ever you will ever get 100% SLA for anything so 39 is 43.2 minutes 39.5 I mean 99.95 is 21.46 or 21.6 minutes so there is a calculator of course. How they calculate uh, the SLA, there is a calculator which is used. So you have to probably target for this. But targeting for this will get you more cost. This will be comparatively cheaper cost. Not only those things, many parameters will be there. And that varies from service to service. We cannot fix it. Like in case of virtual machine we discussed. Yes, yes. But not, virtual machine is only one type of service. If you are doing, say for example, GRS for your storage account. That will give this SLA. LRS will give this SLA. So that way you have to define I, I will not get into the details of how it is different, but yes, for now just understand that this particular numbers are going to be based on our options which we have selected at the time of provisioning the service. SLA basically means downtime only, uptime versus downtime. If 50% SLA is given, 50% your service will be down, 50% it will be up. Yeah. So if an app service, this is something which you should, you should understand and not get confused. Suppose app service gives 99.95% SLA. And if the app service is talking to SQL database. And if database is giving 99.99% SLA, overall SLA of both is going to reduce to 99.94%. What they do is they multiply this and this and then they get the factor. So 
so you have to improve 99.95 to a better value to get a comprehensive SLA value got it it's I mean every service has got its own SLA but definitely in your application you are going to use multiple services So like this you will have to take care of the calculation. Composite SLA is multiplication of this SLA and this SLA. This is the SLA which Microsoft commits to you on a web app making use of SQL database. Now this can be improved by creating fallback options. That means instead of creating just one web app, you create one more web app probably in a different region and load balance them using something called as traffic manager. So there the SLA of this set will increase and when that increases multiply it by this also will increase. Basically alternate paths have to be given. If this fails what next that has to be controlled. So customers should determine what SLA is needed for their application. Know your workload requirement and usage pattern. These are all basically pat practices designed for resiliency and availability. Basically resiliency is mirroring. You have to mirror your data, mirror your application. Establish availability metrics. How much time it will take to recover. Mean time between failures. These are all terms at this point of time for you. So recovery time objective, RPO we call it. Recovery point objective, recovery time objective, two are there. Within five minutes my service will be up and running. Within 24 hours it will be up and running. That is recovery time objective. Recovery point objective is I can lose probably five minutes of data. I can lose up to one hour of data that is recovery point objective. So these you have to find out based on the service which you are using. They will give you based on the features and the uh, service tiers which you select. They will give you this is the RTO and this is the RPO. They will give you the numbers. You have to factor that. Resiliency strategies like LRS, ZRS, these are all resiliency strategies. Build in availability requirements. If suppose the virtual machine is down in one region, how, how much time it will take for you to run the various automation scripts to replicate the complete services running on this data in this region into another region. So like that. So all these things you'll have to calculate when you're doing a SLA. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. If the SLA is not met, how much compensation is going to happen is documented. If the service fails to meet the guarantee, a percentage of monthly service fee can be credited to you. So that depends on how much time is the extra. Suppose you were guaranteed, let's say 99.99 percentage. If the service is down for more than 4.32 minutes maybe for 10 minutes it is down maybe for 30 minutes it is down maybe for one hour it is down maybe for one day it is down based on that how much extra than this it is down some amount will be credited to your account that's what is the SLA. Uh, unplanned unplanned Planned also, I believe. Yeah, sorry, planned and unplanned both. Planned and unplanned both. SLAs are always given for the downtime. 
immaterial of whether it is planned or unplanned. So there are few more small topics. I would still want to take a session and discuss those topics and wind up not much. But overall I will explain to you how you can actually proceed after this. That's the session we'll take next.